Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk to call on business. Government business order of the day number one. Native Title Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The Committee is considering the Native Title Legislation Amendment Bill 2020. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Wish Wilson, are you seeking the call? If no one's seeking the call, I intend to Senator Thorpe, you're seeking the call? Yes. Sorry. It's okay. <coughs> so, Rach, this is questions, right? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a, a few f more follow up questions for the Minister. Minister, the National Native Title Council noted in their submission to the committee inquiry into this bill that they do not, I repeat, do not support Commonwealth intervention in native title proceedings as set out in Schedule 5 because the bill seeks to clarify the role of the Commonwealth Minister in native title proceedings. Under this bill, would the Commonwealth be a party to any agreement if it has intervened? Minister. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. The clarification that's made in the bill for the Commonwealth Minister to have a role in agreeing to consent determinations is necessary because there's currently an inconsistency about whether or not the Commonwealth Minister is or isn't a re relevant party to consent determinations over the whole of an area or part of an area, and that their consent is required to determinations under both circumstances. So there is currently an inconsistency relating to the role of the Commonwealth Minister as intervener in the provisions giving the federal court the power to make the orders in relation to the whole of a claimed area compared to orders in relation to part of a claimed area. So this is appropriate as the Commonwealth Minister will only intervene, and I think this is getting to the crux of your question, in a native title proceeding where there is a significant matter of law to be determined and there is a need for the Commonwealth as administrators of the Native Title Act to assist the court. So it's not anticipated that the Commonwealth will be participating as a matter of course, but where there is a novel question of law um, that needs to be resolved so that all people who are participants in the system have clarity about how it operates, um, then that avenue is available. Senator Thorpe. Yeah. Uh, Minister, can you outline how and why the Commonwealth might oppose an agreement even where all the other parties are in agreement. Minister. Um, it's the position of the Commonwealth to support decisions by parties to resolve matters by consent. So that's not anticipated. Senator Thorpe. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you, Minister, can you outline to me in detail how this bill will support the clans and nations that are excluded because they are in a minority on decision-making processes? Minister. Sorry, thank you very much, um, okay. Deputy President. Uh, the answer really was given yesterday, and the, the decision um, about how to go about decision-making processes um, and whether or not there's going to be the acceptance by um, a native title group um, of a particular decision is in their hands. And if, if a particular group wants to make it so that more than majority is required, whether that's special majority, whether that's um, unanimity, uh, that, that's a decision for the people um, who are affected by the decision. That's not a matter for the Commonwealth. Uh, Senator Hanson. Madam Deputy President, the bill we have been asked to consider today may appear at first to be relatively simple, altering decision making from a requirement for a unanimous vote to requiring a majority vote does make sense and is in line with the accepted practice in most modern democracies. But my problem with this bill isn't so much as what it contains, but rather what it doesn't contain. We were asked by Senator Thorpe and the Greens to tick off on amendments proposed, which she well knows contain no mention of accountability of for funds, outcome evaluations of expended monies, effectiveness of the management of funds and every other audit or performance related process that normally applies to the use of taxpayer funds. It's almost as if Senator Thorpe is saying to the Australian people that Indigenous communities and authorities should be held to a lower standard than the rest of Australia in their use of taxpayer funds. It's almost as if the Senator doesn't understand that an open and transparent view, review of the use of funds is a prime driver towards improving performance and processes going forward in future projects and grants. Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy Chair, perhaps Senator Thorpe doesn't understand that empowering performance and holding people to a higher standard in any area is a highly empowering process. But I'm sure Senator Thorpe and every one of her fellow Greens knows the continuing empowerment of Indigenous groups and communities across the nation, something every right-thinking Australian supports, spells oblivion and total irrelevance for the posturing Greens and their mates in the Indigenous activist industry. Senator Thorpe relishes her moment in the spotlight when she has an opportunity to harp on the theme of perceived Indigenous oppression and constantly label Indigenous Australians as oppressed victims. Never a mention from Senator Thorpe of Indigenous successes that would seriously get in the way of her narrative of centuries of continuing oppression and enslavement. Preach only the negatives. Do it relentlessly, and some of it might even stick in uninformed minds as fact. That's our classic tactic of the left that we see every day in this place and across the media. Madam Deputy President, Senator Thorpe and Senator Dodson would have us believe any legislation do, to do with Indigenous issues is introduced to benefit mining companies. Senator Thorpe calls the $33 billion that went to all Australians, including Indigenous Australians, and a further $6 billion for Indigenous-only issues last year, scraps? Really? Scraps? $39 billion? Scraps? Senator Thorpe also hides an inconvenient truth when she fails to disclose that as far as back as 2015, native title has been recognised over approximately 2,469,647 square kilometres. That's around 32 per cent of the Australian land mass for around less than 3 per cent of the population. That's a statistic that we'll never hear from the green truth deniers, so I should repeat it for their benefit. Around 32 per cent of the Australian landmass for around 750,000 people who identify as Indigenous. Identify, not necessarily Indigenous, but identify. 
A third of Australia under native title and $39 billion is scraps, according to Senator Thorpe and a true denier colleagues. If almost $40 billion and around a third of Australia are scraps, we can only thank our lucky stars the Greens don't have the keys to the Treasury. Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy Chair, Senator Thorpe fails to point out that, as Tom Connell told us on Sky News recently, the dollar spend equates to $22,000 for every non-Indigenous Australian and $45,000 for every Indigenous Australian. And more scraps for Senator Thorpe's information come from a look at the mining industry she and her fellow truth deniers love to vilify. Indigenous, indigenous jobs in the mining industry are around 6,599. That's around 3.9 per cent of the total mining workforce. Over 6,000 jobs in any industry are anything but scraps, and I'm sure those Indigenous employees who take home their pay to their families each week see it that way too. If Senator Thorpe really wants to empower any group of Australians, she might consider calling on the government to ensure there are strong accountability and audit measures incorporated in any advance of federal funds, irrespective of background, race, religion or gender. If you want to be seen as empowering the group you represent, irrespective of background, race, religion or gender, to escape the need for federal funding and to create for themselves a sustainable economic future, you may want to consider including in your amendments performance reviews that closely examine how effectively the funds were used. Include how the funds can be better used next time to deliver better outcomes all around. It's called gradual improvement, Senators. Madam Deputy President, any bill that comes before us here that goes to perpetuate the victimhood status of any group of Australians has no place. Whether that bill includes such mechanisms or, as is the case here, omits processes that will enhance the lives and futures of that group, we should give it no credibility. Senator Thorpe apparently doesn't even mind misleading the Senate, and I quote her words from Hansard when she told the Senate earlier today or yesterday, a nuclear waste dump in South Australia, traditional air owners do not consent. Senator Thorpe well knows there's no proposal to locate a lo nuclear waste dump on native tidal land in South Australia. But when we let fact and truth get in the way of a rolling agenda aimed at painting a false sort of permanent oppression, the Greens and Senator Thorpe are a one-act pony when it comes to Indigenous affairs. They seek to label and to perpetuate the myth of permanent victimhood over our Indigenous Australians for their own scurrilous political ends. Unlike Senator Thorpe and the Greens, I have faith in our Indigenous Australians. I have faith in all Australians. I was raised to think of myself as a proud Australian woman. And I also know that by recognising and applauding success, by providing checks and balances, by reviewing and carefully auditing performance, and always seeking to empower and improve, we will prosper as a people and as a nation. Australia is a country of equal opportunity. It's not a country that should ever regard one group more or less equal than another, and it should never be a country that perpetuates victimhood against any group. Notwithstanding my comments, we will support the bill. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thank you. Um, in relation to the matter of transparency and accountability for funds that was raised um, by Senator Hanson, can I um, indicate that Schedule 8 includes measures to improve the transparency, accountability and governance around native title corporation decision making, but the particular focus in this bill is on membership, as Senator Hanson has identified. Um, the amendments will do important things, though, that indirectly affect accountability for funds by removing the discretion of directors to refuse membership to a native title corporation where an applicant meets the eligibility requirements and has applied for membership in the required manner. And, um, it will require corporations to align the membership criteria with native title determination. And it also limits the grounds for cancelling membership to those provided for under the corporation's Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Act, the CATSI Act, um, and as um, Senator 
uh, hands and nose. That's the one that deals primarily with the financial accountability matters. May I also, Madam Deputy President, um, provide some answers to matters I took on notice yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the first was in relation to um, a question asked by Senator Thorpe. She asked, can you also inform me which mining companies asked the government to fix this problem for them? Now, um, I'd like to address that question now so that it can be taken into account in dealing with the bill, um, but also because the premise of the question isn't accurate. Um, it assumes that this bill came forward only because mining companies asked for it, and that is in fact false. Um, in the wake of the 2017 Maglay decision, um, there was the Native Title Indigenous Land Use Agreements Act brought before the parliament. And during the Senate inquiry for it, a number of stakeholders, including um, Senator Thorpe, the National Native Title Council, raised concerns that Maglade may also have ramifications for Section 31 agreements. Um, now, due to the urgent need to address the issues um, raised by Maglade, that couldn't properly be considered at the time, and it deserved a proper consultation process that um, meaningfully involved everybody who has an interest in the sector. Um, so a proper and extensive consultation process was undertaken. The measures in Schedule 9 of the bill to confirm the validity of these agreements um, is supported by a broad range of stakeholders in the native title sector. Now That includes the Na National Native Title Council, quite importantly, and its members, but it also includes peak mining groups such as the Minerals Council of Australia and the Association of Mining and Exploration Companies, as well as state and territory governments. Um, so it's very important to note this was not triggered by some request from mining companies. This was triggered um, by genuine concern raised in the Senate inquiry process, including from, from many stakeholders, but including the National Native Title Council. Um, finally, there was a question yesterday about who constituted the membership of the Expert Technical Advisory Group. Um, I had obviously set out everyone I understood was in the group, and I concluded by saying, as I understand it, um, industry wasn't a part of the expert technical advisory group. I wasn't actually correct about that. Um, so if I could clarify, peak industry bodies were members of the expert technical advisory group. Um, they were um, including the Minerals Council of Australia, National Farmers Federation, and the Pastoralists and Graziers Association of WA. States and territories have also been closely engaged in the development of the bill and um, they participated in the expert technical advisory group process. But um, as I mentioned yesterday, that is along with the National Native Title Council, so that it is a balanced process in that design. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Minister. Uh, and I will, I've only been here four months, um, so I will um, learn people's names whilst I'm here. Uh, but the senator over here, uh, brought up some um, interesting points which I actually agree with, surprisingly, and I agree that there needs to be accountability processes, absolutely. So, Minister, um, your party has received millions in donations from mining companies, uh, and the question is, has the mining companies brought your support for this bill? Minister. Senator Thorpe, I'm not going to indulge this, um, this juvenile and unfounded narrative. I've made it very clear that the impetus for this bill uh, was the Senate committee process that commenced in 2017, and it was a product of the Maglay decision. Um, and uh, you, can, you can speak to your base all you like, it doesn't make it truth. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. And just a follow-up. Have, uh, Minister, have any of those companies donated to the Liberal Party because of this bill? Minister. Again, Senator Thorpe, um, you clearly didn't listen to my answer because the answer um, makes it very clear that this bill is not prompted by mining companies. This bill is prompted by the 2017 Senate inquiry process. Senator Wish Wilson. Minister, you, you claim it was a juvenile question. Why do these parties, why do these corporations donate to the Liberal Party? Do they, do they not expect something in return? Minister. Madam Deputy President, this is not a matter that's relevant to the bill, um, and so I'm happy to take questions directed to the bill. Uh, if Senator Wish Wilson wants to um, make points about 
matters of electoral funding, then he can do so in a matter that's appropriate. Yes. Senator Wishwills. Take the opportunity to respond to that, uh, Acting Deputy President. We just received the latest update yesterday on political donations in this country. $168 million to the Labor and Liberal Party in the last 12 months, mostly to the Liberal Party. 5 per cent of donors contributed more than 50 per cent of those donations. It is the problem with our democracy and it is the problem with this place. For you to come in here and say uh, that Senator, somehow that has Senator, nothing to do with this Senator bill Wishwilson. or this legislation Senator before Wilson, us— Senator please resume your seat, Minister. Point of order. Madam Deputy President, this is not relevant to the committee stage. Um, and so my point of order is relevance, and I would ask that we bring the matter back to the issues of the bill. I'll just remind the minister, um, Senator Thorpe, in her question, did relate it to native title, and um, Senator Wish Wilson is doing a follow-up. It is a broad-ranging debate. Minister, you can choose whether to answer the question or not. Please continue, Senator Wish Wilson, and then I'll th go th to you, Thank Senator you. Had you been here a little bit longer, Senator, you probably know that we do tend to have a, a wide-ranging debate. But actually, this is directly relevant to what we are discussing here. I know you've, you've been elevated recently, and you're, you're enjoying this uh, this debate. But, Senator, how can you say that big mining companies donating to your political party don't want something in return? How can you say that? I'm not finished yet, uh, Senator. You, have, of course, have the right to take a point of order, but I'd ask that you pay the respects of, he of hearing me out, even though you may not want to, and you may not like what I'm saying. But, Senator, how can you say that these mining companies that give millions of dollars to your political party don't want something in return? It is legalised bribery. What happens through political donations? It is pay for play. Now you can say that perhaps it's not this exact issue, but how would you know if you're not the person that's working the relationships with these large corporations, with these industries? We need to cap political donations in this country for this exact reason, because this is a democracy and the public interest matters. And while I accept that these big corporations and these industries do some public good. There's no doubt about that. They employ people. They contribute to our economies and our communities. What they want is not always in the public interest. And there should be a fair, level playing field in terms of influence in this place. And that was Senator Thorpe's question, Minister. It was about political influence. What kind of influence do these companies have? And it comes directly relevant to this debate. So I'm just taking my own long long-winded point of order on you saying that this was a juvenile question. It goes to the heart of problems in this place and in our democracies and with this bill. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I indicated I was giving the call to Senator Dodson. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam oh, did you Deputy. Wish, sorry, Minister. Did you wish oh. to respond? question, um, Madam, Acting, oh, sorry, Madam Deputy President, um, I think I should answer it. And, and the answer is I gave a full answer to Senator Thorpe's question. Um, it was that this is um, not prompted by any kind of donation process. This is prompted by the 2017 inquiry process. Um, and all of the evidence shows it. And um, no amount of condescension from um, Senator Wish Wilson changes the fact that that is the genesis of this bill and the consultation process that has emerged shows that it is one that is supported by all of the stakeholders uh, relevant to it, including um, the National Nature Charter Council. Uh, thank you for the indulgence, Senator Dodson. Thanks, Minister. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Minister, I've got a question and I want to thank you for your commitment to the review of the Act uh, by the Social Justice Commissioner. But for clarity, are you able to say whether the review will be in accordance with section 209 of the Native Title Act. Senator Dodson, I wasn't sure whether that was the end of the question. Um, the, the review that's been committed to, uh, I'll just, excuse me a moment. I'm instructed yes. Senator Dodson. Uh, the Minister, 
given that any comprehensive review of the Native Title Act will require significant resources, and we've been speaking about resources, for example, to engage with traditional owners in remote locations, can you provide the Parliament information about what additional resources will be provided to the Commissioner and to the Native Title Rep bodies and PBCs to enable this review to be effective? Minister. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Um, at this stage, the intention is for the review to be done within the um, existing resources of the Social Justice Commissioner. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, Minister, can you tell me what your understanding is of cultural practices around decision making for clans and nations around what they allow or not allow to happen on country? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, well, the, the relevant point, I think, Senator Thorpe, and uh, I'm not going to speak to you chapter and verse because you know this very well. You're, um, as, you, as you've said frequently, um, uh, an Indigenous native title holder yourself. Um, but what's important about this bill is that it allows um, native title holders to, in a sense, choose their own adventure because they can do things in a way that is relevant to um, their group's customs, their practices. Um, there is the ability through the um, mechanism for imposing conditions on the exercise of authority, the ability to um, use a decision-making process that works for them so that it can reflect truly the diversity of the ways in which decision-making can occur um, across different communities. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. Minister, if you don't understand how clans and nations make processes, decision-making processes, then why is this bill being introduced? What's happening on the ground out there is traditional owners in their thousands are being excluded from decision-making that ultimately destroys country or gives country away. So, if, if, if you're not uh, clear or, or don't have an understanding around cultural practice in terms of decision making, then how is this bill relevant? How can you put this bill forward? Minister. Um, Senator Thorpe, I don't accept the premise of your question. Um, I didn't say that at all, and so I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. Minister, why are you trying to impose a majority decision-making process on clans and nations that have been acting by consensus for over 80, 90, 100,000 years? Minister. Very clear. Um, the majority rule is a default one, and any um, clan that wishes to adopt a decision-making model that requires um, consensus or unanimity is um, a matter entirely for them. They can impose conditions to that effect. And um, I think we've made it very clear in this debate that the ability to impose a process that suits the practices of a particular group um, is remaining entirely in their hands. Thank you, Minister. Um, do you, you haven't moved your amendment, Senator Thorpe. If you want to move them, that would be good. Uh, yes, I uh, seek to seek leave to move amendments 1 to 13 on sheet 1185 together. So both those amendments together. Mm -hmm. Is leave granted? Yes. Yes. So just to be clear, Senator Thorpe, we're moving 41213 on sheet 1185 and 13511 on sheet 1185 by leave. Leave is granted. I move the amendments. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. So the question is that those amendments, as moved by Senator Thorpe. Okay. Sorry, I'm just informed. Even though you've moved them together, I'll put the two questions separately. So the first one is uh, that schedules one, two, and four and nine, as division two of schedule three, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. I only heard one voice, Senator Thorpe. Uh, 
I'm just asking people to take some advice, and I'm going to put that question again. So um, the question is that schedules one, two, and four and nine, and division two of schedule three stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those against? Aye. Right. So division required. Okay. Ring the bells for four minutes. The 
question is that Schedules 1, 2 and 4 to 9 and Division 2 of Schedule 3 stand as printed. All those in favour of, uh, for the ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator Dean Smith for the ayes and Senator Seawert for the noes. Ayes 40, noes 90. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the amendments as listed on 1 to 3, amendments 1 to 3 and 5 to 11 on sheet 1185 by leave together be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that amendments 1 to 3 and 5 to 11 on sheet 1185 be agreed to. Those in favour will move to the right of the chair, those against to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart for the noes and Senator Seawert for the ayes.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 40. The question is resolved in the negative. So the question now is that the bill stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I'll let the minister get back to her seat. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill will now be read a third time. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to native title and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Crimes Legislation Amendment, Economic Disruption Bill 2020, second reading debate. So, Senator Kitching. Deputy President. Um, Mr. President, I rise to, Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Crimes Legislation Amendment, Economic Disruption Bill. I will say from the outset that Labor supports these reforms. Labor has consistently argued that Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing framework must continue to evolve to counter attempts by actors to thwart it. Now, more than ever, the risk of money laundering and terrorism financing remains significant as criminals and terrorists seek to stay one step in front of the law. It's a race we cannot afford to lose. Money laundering and terrorism financing is not just an issue here in Australia. There are, they are global problems facing many countries. They threaten to undermine Australia's national security and destroy the integrity of our financial system if left unchecked. And so Labor welcomes efforts by the Morrison government to improve our anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing framework. Australia cannot afford to be a weak link in the global financial chain, nor can it be a soft touch for organised criminals around the world seeking to launder the proceeds of their crime. It is unfortunate, however, that Australia still lags significantly behind our international counterparts in this field. It's appropriate that a government uh, led by um, Scott Morrison, a former advertising man, uh, has made Australia such an attractive destination for a very niche audience. As a nation, our laws have lagged uh, behind so that we've become a target for nefarious actors wishing to exploit our soft defences. The Morrison government has repeatedly missed deadlines in its own anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing reform timetable. This latest legislation comes more than four years after the then Minister for Justice tabled the report on the statutory review of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006 and associated rules and regulations, which first called for these changes in March 2016. Nearly five years later, this legislation fails to implement many of these 2016 recommendations. While other countries have strengthened their defences against the proceeds of criminal and corrupt business practices, the Morrison government has left the door open for illicit capital to flood into Australia. The world's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force, has expressed serious concerns about Australia's regulatory framework in regard uh, to these issues and this government's failure to implement reforms according to its own timetable. These concerns are why the FATF placed Australia on an enhanced follow-up remediation program in 2015, following a major evaluation of Australia's anti-money laundering counter-terrorism financing framework, which found major non-compliance with international best practice in several areas. The FATF's 2015 Mutual Evaluation Report made clear that Australia is, and I quote, an attractive destination for foreign proceeds of crime, particularly corruption-related proceeds flowing into real estate." End quote. Serious and sustained breaches of FATF standards and obligations can result in jurisdictions being grey or blacklisted, increasing the cost of doing international business and restricting access to international finance. 
There are growing risks to Australia from the failure of this government to fully implement either the FATF or the statutory review recommendations. Other jurisdictions have been able to race ahead of Australia with much stronger protections. This year, Australia banks reportedly, un reportedly unknowingly washed over $500 million for violent South American cocaine cartels, with the proceeds of crime moving through multiple countries before it was finally disrupted by Australian law enforcement. This is clear proof that while Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, has underperformed in his position, um, his failure to implement basic anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing measures has made Australia an attractive destination for criminals and terrorists to launder money. We can't afford to be a soft touch for these criminals. Australia needs to ensure its anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws are compliant with international best practice. It is unacceptable that Australia remains behind its international counterparts in this crucial area. But the government has been slow to make, even make a start on bringing on Australia's anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing laws and making them up to scratch. The FATF's 2015 report noted that Australia lacked focus on, I quote, addressing risk from abuse of complex corporate structures, end quote, and that authorities were challenged to present convincing evidence about what outcomes their efforts were achieving. This, as well as the government's failure to properly enforce existing laws, meant that no action was taken against Westpac until it had breached AML CTF laws 23 million times. This is obviously unacceptable. Indeed, an ongoing New South Wales Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority inquiry into Crown, Crown, into Crown Casino has revealed shocking non-compliance with money laundering laws by Australian casinos and junket operators, even going as far as being accused of turning a blind eye or being recklessly indifferent to money laundering. But Austrac, the government's own regulator, gave these risky casino junket operations its tick of approval only three years ago. Since then, tens of billions of dollars have poured into Australia through these channels. Labor had to fight to get Austrac to release its full 2017 report into casino junkets. Initially, Austrac would only release a heavily redacted report. It was Labor senators who moved an order of production of documents which forced the government to release the document, and that is when we found out that Austrac had warned the government back in 2017 that there were major gaps in the regulation of junkets in 2017. Austrac went on to say that compliance by casinos appeared to be generally more with the letter than the spirit of the law. Casinos use these technicalities to absolve themselves of conducting robust due diligence in relation to the source of the funds presented to them. Austrac was concerned that casinos appeared to underestimate money laundering risks involved in the, production, in the provision of junket services. While there was a theoretical acceptance that junkets may be exploited, it was Austrac's view that this possibility was not taken seriously. These are all quotes from that report. So, we ask, did the government proactively release this information in 2017? No, it did not. We ask, did the government work to close these regulatory gaps in 2017? No, they did not. And what was the result? It was a work of Nick McKenzie from nine newspapers and later the New South Wales Casino Inquiry that it became obvious that there was widespread money laundering and terrorism financing, and that's how it was exposed. This was happening under the noses of this government. The government had this information in 2017 and yet did nothing. It's worrying that we've needed a New South Wales casino inquiry to bring systematic, systemic breaches of money laundering laws to light, given the profound responsibility of the government to protect all Australians from money launderers and the funders of terrorism. We need to get Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, law, financing laws right. It's too important to get it wrong. We are not going to labour. We'll not oppose this much-delayed legislation, but we do call on the Morrison government to take anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws seriously. If nobody does follow up on this, we are going to be left susceptible in the battle that we must engage in against money launderers and, counter and terrorism financing. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The coalition government firmly believes in enforcing the rule of law and holding 
lawbreakers to account. The introduction of the Crimes Legislation Amendment Economic Disruption Bill of 2020 demonstrates our commitment. This bill is a significant step forward in the Morrison government's fight against transnational, serious and organised crime groups. As a government, we are committed to ensuring that Australians are protected from all crimes. But transnational, serious and organised crime, or TSOC as it's known, have significant impacts on our communities, our economy and our national security. TSOC groups are systematically affecting the health, wealth and safety of Australian citizens through abhorrent conduct such as illicit dr drug trafficking, mass fraud and child exploitation. Corruption and money laundering do real harm to people, holds back development and undermines confidence in government and public institutions. The Crimes Legislation Amendment Economic Disruption Bill of 2020 deals with the fact that money laundering is an important aspect of serious crime. Money laundering is an important aspect of fraud, terrorism, human trafficking and supporting totalitarian regimes. We must deal with these issues properly. By introducing the new measures to tackle money laundering in this legislation, we are helping to ensure that Australian dollars are not being used to support these criminal organisations. According to the Australian, in Australian Institute of Criminology, each year TSOC organisations cost Australia up to $47.4 billion. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, when indirect social and economic impacts are considered, the true cost is immeasurable. Internationally, it is estimated that money laundering alone now costs more than US $1 trillion globally. TSOC groups have evolved into sophisticated and multinational businesses that are primarily driven by a profit motive with no care or concern for the people who their actions are affecting. TSOC groups operate as sophisticated and compartmentalised businesses, generating huge profits from their criminal pursuits. In order to clean their proceeds of crime and realise these profits, the TSOC, TSOC business model relies on money laundering. This allows profits to be concealed and reinvested in further criminal activity used to fund lavish lifestyles or to funnel money to terrorism and other nefarious activities. These groups are so sophisticated that they are deliberately structuring their operations to avoid prosecution. They are well financed and are intent on retaining their profits through any means necessary. And the Morrison government does not accept this is good enough. We believe Australia needs a tough regime aimed at destroying their business model, and this bill will do just that. Under the Crimes Legislation Amendment Economic Bill 2020, we are enhancing key laws to take the profit out of crime, striking at the heart of criminal business models and reducing its impact on everyday Australians. This bill seeks to attack transnational, serious and organised crime groups by targeting their illicit wealth that sustains them. This bill is designed to remove TSOC from our country and our economy, giving honest Australians a fair go. This bill includes an overhaul of the Commonwealth's money laundering offences in the Criminal Code to address the increasingly complex methods employed by TSOC actors. It will strengthen money laundering, money laundering offences by targeting money laundering networks that deal with illicit property at arm's length, those that remain willfully blind to its criminal origins <coughs> excuse me, and those who actively seek to conceal these origins. Madam Acting Deputy President, the TSOC networks are typically led by controllers who issue directions to others to launder criminal profits, while keeping themselves at arm's length to avoid criminal liability. The person who physically deals with the money or property is intentionally kept ignorant of its criminal origins. This bill says enough is enough. We are changing the current legislation so our law enforcement officers can effectively target those controllers at the heart of the operation by treating them as though they dealt with the criminal money or property themselves and are punished accordingly. The bill also strengthens criminal asset confiscation laws by enhancing information gathering powers 
preventing criminals from buying back property, improving powers to preserve the value of seized property and clarifying key provisions to ensure that illicit overseas property and benefits obtained through the criminal avoidance, deferral or reduction of a loss due to your liability can be confiscated. This bill also strengthens undercover operations by clarifying that undercover operatives are not bound by the same obligations as identifiable law enforcement officers. This includes the obligations to caution a person who is under arrest or a protected suspect before starting questioning. Madam Acting Deputy President, operational experience has demonstrated a willingness by suspects to obstruct the information gathering process. This means that the offences for non-compliance are currently impractical to enforce. This bill also seeks to enhance the ability of law enforcement to, enhance, to enforce compliance with the information gathering powers in the Proceeds of Crime Act. These powers provide law enforcement with valuable information about an individual's property and its potential links to crime. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, make no mistake, if you are engaged in transnational, serious or organised crime, the Morrison government is coming for you. We will catch you. We will arrest you and try you in court. We will, will disrupt your network and we will confiscate your property. The Australian public is sick and tired of organised crime gangs thinking that ca they can come into our country and run amok. Every TSOC organisation working in Australia is having a negative effect on the health, wealth and safety of Australian citizens. With this bill, the Morrison government says enough is enough. I'll say it again, enough is enough. As a government, we are proud of our tough stance on crime, and these amendments to the crime legislation will make it harder for offenders to evade the reach of our law enforcement. Madam Acting Deputy President, I just want to conclude by saying that I'm grateful for the work of all members of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, chaired by my good friend and colleague, Senator Stoker, for their work in reviewing this legislation. It is a very technical piece of legislation, but it is vitally important for protecting Australians. And finally, can I say thank you very much to the many wonderful men and women who walk, work in law enforcement. Their com contribution to our national security does not go unnoticed by those of us in this place. Thank you. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on the Crimes Legislation Amendment Economic Disruption Bill 2020. This bill introduces amendments to adapt and update money laundering offences in an attempt to combat modern money laundering networks, which have become increasingly sophisticated and to enhance access compensation laws and strengthen undercover operations. Together, these proposed amendments would increase the pressure on the growing strengths of transnational serious and organised crime groups by targeting the financial benefits they gain from their illegal activities. As a result of a lack of action by the coalition government over the past seven years, Australia has slipped in its defence of criminal practices and allowed criminal enterprises to flood illegal assets and money into Australia. That's happened under this government's watch. The Australian Institute of Criminology estimated transnational serious and organised crime groups, TSOC, costed Australia up to $47.4 billion per year. Money laundering remains a fundamental enabler of almost all the TSOC's activities and has grown in scope and complexity as once localised activity is now a global reach and a wide range of products and channels available to them for transferring money around the world. We must acknowledge that Australia is the home to stolen assets that have been shifted across borders. The Australian Federal Police have reported they have restrained more than $250 million in criminal assets in courts across Australia and overseas last financial year. And I acknowledge the work that the AFP do in this country and beyond. Criminal organisations operate as sophisticated and compartmentalised businesses, generating huge profits from their criminal pursuits. In order to clean their proceeds of crime, 
and realise their profits, the TSOC business model rely on money laundering. This allows profits to be concealed and reinvested in further criminal activities or used to fund extravagant lifestyles. These criminal organisations always aim to be one step ahead of the law, and that's why it is so important for the government to be extremely agile in responding to constantly evolving threats and challenges. Our world is highly globalised, and we face threats that weren't constrained, and they're never going to be constrained by borders. In order to keep in step, the bill has seven schedules and would propose to amend the Crimes Act 1914, the Criminal Code Act 1995 and the COAG Reform Fund 2008 and the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 to do the following. It will update Commonwealth money laundering offences to address the behaviour of modern money laundering networks, remove unnecessary obstacles to securing convictions and introduce new sentencing thresholds. It clarifies that the obligations imposed on investigating officials under Part 9 of the Criminals Act do not apply to the undercover operations. It will ensure that buyback orders under the Procedure of Crime Act cannot be used by criminal suspects and their associates to buy back property forfeited to the Commonwealth or delay the Proceeds of Crime Act proceedings. It will also clarify that the POC Act permits courts to make orders confiscating the value of a debt, loss or liability that has been avoided, deferred or reduced through criminal offences. Clarifying the operations of the Proceeds of Crime Act in relation to restraint and confiscation of property located overseas. It will strengthen information gathering powers under the POC Act by increasing penalties for non-compliance and clarifying the circumstances in which information gathered under these powers can be disclosed and used. And finally, it will expand the official trustee in the bankruptcy's powers to deal with the property, uh, gathered information and recover costs under the Proceeds of Crime Act to allow the official trustee to discharge its functions in a more cost-effective manner. Labor welcomes effects by the government to improve our anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financial framework, and we support this legislation. But we must note that this bill comes almost five years after the then Minister for Justice tabled the report on the statutory view of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006 and associated rules and regulations, which first called for these changes to be made back in March 2016. And still, Five years later, this legislation fails to implement many of those recommendations. The world's watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force, has expressed serious concerns about Australia's regulatory framework and this government's failure to implement reforms according to its own timetable. So to come in here, government senators, to pat themselves on the back, this should have happened at the very least in 2016. While other countries have strengthened their defences against the proceeds of crime and corruption business practices, this government has sat back and allowed illegal capital to stream into this country. It was again recommended in 2017 where an outgoing, an ongoing, I should say, an ongoing New South Wales Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority inquiry into Crown Casino revealed shocking non-compliance with money laundering laws by Australian casinos and junk operators. Despite these findings, Austrac, this government's own regulator, gave these risky casino junket operations its tick of approval only three years ago. Since then, tens of billions of dollars has poured into Australia through these channels. To even get this information, Labor had to fight to get Austrac to release its, in full its 2017 report. It was only after Labor senators moved an order of production of documents, which forced the government to release the document, did we find out that Austrac warned the government 
warned them back in 2017 that there were major gaps in the regulation of junkets in 2017. Austrac then conceded that casinos were using technicalities to pardon themselves of conducting robust due diligence in relation to sources of funds presented to them. Austrac was concerned that casinos appeared to underestimate the risks of money laundering involved in the provision of junk services. Did the government proactively release this information in 2017? No. Did the government work to close these regulatory gaps in 2017? No. And what was the result? Well, only because of the work of Nick McKenzie from the Nine Papers and later the New South Wales Casino Inquiry was widespread money laundering and terrorism financing exposed. Right under the noses of this government, under the nose of Mr Morrison, money laundering and terrorism financing has been occurring. The government had this information in 2017, and they did nothing. It's concerning that we've needed a New South Wales casino inquiry to bring systemic breaches of money laundering laws to light. Getting Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws right is too important to get it wrong. Labor will not oppose this much-needed delayed legislation, but we do call on the Morrison government to take anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws seriously. In a report undertaken by the Australian Financial Review last week, it found that Australian banks washed $500 million for, for violent South American drug cartels in a sophisticated money laundering scheme. Between 2014 and 2017, more than $100 million in drug money was funnelled through Australian banks each year before it was routed to other destinations throughout South East Asia and the Middle East. Once the money was in Australia, illegal profits were used to buy high-end electronics and were shipped overseas in order to move the funds and avoiding detection. What really shows here is that in this area, as in so many other parts of this government's agenda, there is a vast gap between the rhetoric and the follow-through that undermines it. It's not good enough in any respect, but particularly when we consider the risk of money laundering and terrorism financing. Money laundering is a real and pervasive threat to Australia. And it's about time that the Morrison government enacted some legislation that attempts to keep in line with the strength, the stealth of the international criminal organisations. If the law does not continue to evolve in Australia, it will be more of a desirable inter to the international criminal organisations. That's not the sort of reputation Australia wants. We must remember that it is about money laundering as an integral aspect of fraud, terrorism, human trafficking and transporting the illegal assets of violent criminal enterprises. The last thing Australians want is to become an easy pickings for the money laundering and terrorism financiers. Our framework must continue to evolve. We must continue to strengthen our laws, and the Morrison government must do more to stay ahead of the curve and maintain our domestic security and integrity. We know that our men and women who work in this area do a fantastic job, but they need to be supported by good, strong legislation which this government was elected to provide. We on this side of the chamber will continue to hold this government account to do all that we can to disrupt the workings of serious organised criminal enterprises. And the way to do that is to have strong legislation to ensure the AFP has the agility powers and that the government stays ahead of the curve when it comes to these criminal organisations. Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. I thank all senators for their contribution to this debate. I also thank the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs uh, Legislation Committee for its recommendation that the bill be passed without amendments. I note that the addendum to the bill's explanatory memorandum was tabled in the House of Representatives on 10 December last year, which responds to specific concerns raised by both the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. During debate on the bill, the opposition recommended that the government regulate lawyers, accountants and real estate agents under the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act. The Australian government is absolutely committed to continually improving Australia's AML and CTF regime and is working with businesses to ensure that Australia's financial system is hardened against criminals and terrorists without placing an undue regulatory burden on industry. The government is taking a phased approach to a phased approach to reforming this regime. This phased approach allows for effective consultation with stakeholders and staggers the regulatory impact, which will ultimately result in a higher level of compliance by businesses regulated under the regime. Expanding the existing regime to lawyers, accountants and real estate agents would capture as many as 100,000 additional businesses, the majority of which are small businesses, sole traders or practitioners. It would also have a significant resourcing impact on the regulator, Austrac, which would need to oversee compliances, of compliances by all of these businesses. Such an extension must be consulted in a careful and considered way, with affected industries being fully consulted. This bill is a significant next step forward in the Morrison government's fight against transnational, serious and organised criminal groups. These groups harm our communities, our economy and our nation's security. So this is why uh, combating transnational, serious and organised crime groups is a key priority for this government. These groups eat away at the heart of our society, mercilessly pursuing profits at the expense of the health, the prosperity and the safety of ordinary Australians. This bill takes the profit out of crime by strengthening money laundering offences, criminal asset confiscation and controlled operations, ensuring that law enforcement has appropriate powers to cut off the lifeblood of organised crime. And I commend this bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Mm -hmm. I think the ayes have it. No amendments. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914, the Criminal Code Act 1995 and the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and for other purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move that this bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914, the Criminal Code Act 1995 and the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and for other purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 3. National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, Mandatory Credit Reporting and Other Measures Bill 2019. Second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, Mandatory Credit Reporting and Other Measures Bill 2019. At the outset, I can confirm that Labor will be supporting the bill, alongside the constructive amendments being proposed by the government to improve the bill. This bill legislates the requirement for major banks and credit providers to make available detailed credit information to credit reporting bodies with the aim of supporting credit providers to better meet responsible lending obligations. It also provides protections for consumers to ensure that the supply of credit information isn't abused by unscrupulous operators within the sector. Schedule 1 will require the major banks to supply detailed credit information to credit reporting agencies. And it's worth noting that this element of the bill will have no immediate effect because all eligible major banks already supply detailed credit information to the agencies. Schedule 2, however, sets out new standards for how people in financial hardship should be treated. 
by the credit reporting agencies. And the new standard will create two categories of hardship flags that may be placed into the credit reports of individuals. And the distinction is this between these two categories. The hardship flags will set out whether the individual has a permanent variation or a temporary variation to their credit obligations. And as I will talk about later in my remarks, this is an important distinction that is important for the protection of consumers. Broadly, credit reporting matters. It's a pro-competitive measure and it supports competition in the financial industry. In particular, it allows smaller banks and lenders who do not have access to significant amounts of financial data to make better lending decisions. The credit uh, reporting system must be, however, as transparent as possible so that consumers can access, understand and seek corrections of their credit reporting history. The current framework in the Privacy Act does not adequately support transparency of credit reporting information. Individuals are only allowed to access a free copy of their credit information once every year or in other very specific circumstances. Credit reporting agencies have also used loopholes in the Privacy Act to refrain from disclosing credit scores. And as a result, these agencies have developed a very profitable side business in selling individuals access to their own data, to their own personal credit industry. Labor believes that, access should labor, that individuals should have access to their individual information and that that access should be timely. I mentioned earlier that this bill establishes flags for people who are experiencing financial hardship and they will be placed into the credit reports of individuals. These hardship indicators are important. They will better distinguish between customers who are experiencing long-term hardship and require a permanent variation to their credit obligations and customers who experience a temporary variation to their credit obligations. This will be an incredibly important consumer protection. It will allow customers the space to access hardship provisions without undue fear that their credit rating will be negatively affected into the future. By allowing customers access to these more nuanced provisions, the bill seeks to ensure the continued flow of credit in the community and in the economy and to allow customers to access legitimate hardship provisions before their financial situation deteriorates beyond repair. Because the th real thing is this, many people do experience hardship, but they are able to work their way through situations in life where they experience such hardship if they are given temporary support by their lender. But once they are out of that situation, the hardship classification should not last forever on their credit file. And addressing this requirement will remove barriers that inhibit customers from accessing hardship provisions. It will be better for credit providers and for customers, and it will allow credit providers to receive the money they are rightfully owed and will ensure that customers continue to make repayments within their means. So if we consider an example of this kind, a person with a credit arrangement with their bank loses their property and their business as a result of a bushfire, and I've met a person in exactly this circumstance. This person will experience a period of immense and, frankly, tragic hardship, and they will experience a period of time out of work or with disrupted income flows. The lender is aware of the circumstances that have caused this situation. They understand that the person has been affected by circumstances well beyond their control, and the person goes to the bank and says, I need a holiday on my repayments because of this hardship. The bank agrees puts in place an informal suspension of repayment requirements. For the most part, that suspension will not constitute a variation to the credit contract. So the credit contract with the bank remains in place, but there's an informal agreement between the bank and the creditor. At the moment, the hardship's flagged within the bank system, but it's not passed on to the credit reporting agency. What is passed on is the repayment history. And what the repayment history shows, without the additional piece of information, is that the repayment his history has been interrupted. The problem is this. That informal arrangement creates a situation where information is passed on to the National Reporting Agency 
that affects the customer's credit score but doesn't really reflect their actual financial circumstances. It's inaccurate, it's unfair and it's something we need to deal with. It's disappointing given the disruptions caused to so many people's lives as a result of the 2019-2020 summer bushfires that it's taken this long for the legislation to come before the Senate. It's high time that the parliament ensures that an initial hardship visited on somebody as a result of an occurrence like a natural disaster, well beyond their control, isn't compounded by the fact that they have a hard to repair interruption to their repayment history information, and Labor wants that fixed. As I mentioned earlier, access to information is also critical. Labor believes there is a need to ensure that the current credit reporting arrangements allow more frequent and more detailed access to information for consumers. And we want to ensure that consumers have access to the information that relates to them. There are two reasons. It's their information. And there might be errors in that information or the need for them to repair some of that credit history information. And secondly, it's an information asymmetry. Quite often, if someone is going to take out a new loan or apply for the refinancing of a loan, the bank has access to the information, but the individual consumer may not. And we want to ensure that in those circumstances that they have. Um, under current arrangements, the current framework within the Privacy Act, individuals are only allowed to access a free copy of their credit information once every year. In addition, under the current arrangements, reporting agencies have used loopholes within the Privacy Act to refrain from disclosing what is known as credit scores. As a result, credit reporting agencies have developed quite a profitable side business, charging customers to access their own personal credit history. And we support amendments that will allow individuals to access a copy of their credit information held by a credit reporting agency. They will, these, amend, these changes will require derived or generated credit scores to be disclosed to individuals as part of their right to access their own credit information. They will require the individuals to receive a statement summarising the key determinants of their credit score as part of their right of access to credit information. And these propositions are strongly supported by consumer advocates. It's worth pointing out that similar provisions currently exist in New Zealand and have done nothing to undermine the capacity of credit providers to offer services. We don't believe, on the information that's available to us, that they will impose any significant new cost on the credit reporting industry. However, they will provide additional rights to consumers and additional competition benefits to the sector as a whole. Labor proposed amendments to the bill to improve transparency of the credit reporting system. We've had a constructive dialogue with the government and we welcome their willingness to bring forward these amendments in the Senate and thank them for their accommodation of these sensible proposals. As I've already alluded to, these amendments strengthen this legislation by allowing individuals to access a copy of their credit information held by a credit reporting agency for free every three months and requiring the derived or generated credit scores to be disclosed to individuals as part of their right to access credit information. We also require a statement to be provided to individuals that summarises the key determinants of their credit score as part of their right to access credit information. And consumer advocates are strongly in support. I do want to make um, uh, a comment in relation to the second reading amendment that I believe will be moved by Senator McKim. It goes to another piece of legislation and makes reference to the government's baffling decision to remove incredibly important lending protections for consumers. The Liberal Party has never been in favour of a financial system that serves Australia. Their highest priority, as evidenced over years and years and years of public statements and policy decisions, has been in favour of a financial system which serves the interests of their mates in the big banks. It's the only way to explain voting 26 times against establishing a Royal Commission. They've never had a vision beyond what their mates in the banking sector tell them over a very nice lunch. And the National Consumer Credit Protection Supporting Economic Recovery Bill, an Orwellian title if there ever was one, will strip back responsible lending obligations from almost all consumer credit contracts. It is quite unbelievable that they would have the audacity to bring forward legislation of this kind after the information that was made public 
the scandals that were made public through the Banking Royal Commission. Indeed, the legislation goes directly against the first recommendation of the Royal Commission, which explicitly told the government not to fiddle with the responsible lending obligations. These obligations were put in place by Labor in 2009 to ensure that banks and lenders made sure that their credit products were suitable for their customers. They were designed precisely to prevent the sort of behaviour that we saw in the global financial crisis. And this bill is nothing less than a free kick for the big banks, stripping away necessary protective legislation just to save a few bucks on paperwork. It will also undermine the credit reporting system we're talking about today, a system which we support and which is intended to help banks lend responsibly. And in supporting the amendment moved by Senator McKim, we want the government to know that the Australian people don't want them to give the banks another free kick. As I said, we're in support of the legislation before us today. It was first proposed in the last parliament. It sat in the current parliament for over a year. Like most things this government is seeking to do, it progresses with no real urgency. But Australians experiencing financial hardship will benefit from the reform these reforms, which allow them more access to their own information and ensure that they're not tied to periods of financial hardship in credit reporting systems uh, for any period longer than is absolutely necessary. And I commend this bill and the amendments that will be proposed to it by the government to the Senate. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, as we've heard, this bill will require banks to provide more information about the credit history of their customers to credit bureaus. The theory is that credit bureaus will be able to better inform banks about a potential new customer's credit worthiness. Therefore, banks are more likely to provide loans or to not provide loans appropriate to a customer's circumstance. Currently, banks are required to report negative data about customers to credit bureaus, that is, payment defaults, bankruptcies and court judgments, for example. This bill would require banks, starting with the major banks, to report positive credit data, that is, loan details and repayment history, for example. This bill implements the recommendation of the 2014 Murray Financial System inquiry that positive credit reporting should be mandated if banks don't do it voluntarily. And completely unsurprisingly, banks haven't done it voluntarily. The Murray inquiry stated that comprehensive credit reporting would reduce information imbalances between lenders and borrowers, facilitate borrowers switching between lenders and greater competition, likely improve credit conditions for borrowers, including small and medium-sized businesses, and reduce the likelihood that loans will default. In Australia, the promise of comprehensive credit reporting fits within the framework established by the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. By giving banks access to more complete information about a potential customer, comprehensive credit reporting should better enable banks to meet the requirements of the Act, namely that they assess whether a loan would be unsuitable for a customer before providing it. However, and there is so often a however with this government, the trouble is this government is systematically trying to dismantle the very framework of consumer credit protection that this bill is built onto. At the very same time that the Senate is being asked to mandate the sharing of customer information so that banks can better assess the suitability of a loan, this government is seeking to abolish the requirement that banks must assess the suitability of a loan. Here's the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, on introducing this bill. Credit providers will have a more complete picture of a co consumer's financial situation. This will help them to better price credit and to meet their responsible lending obligations." End quote. That's the Treasurer in the other place explaining how this bill will help banks meet their responsible lending obligations. 
Those are the very responsible lending obligations that the Treasurer is now trying to abolish. Those are the responsible lending obligations that the then Assistant Minister to the Treasurer, Mr Sukar, when introducing the original version of this bill into the 45th Parliament, said are an important part of consumer protection arrangements." End quote. These are the responsible lending obligations that Commissioner Hain said should not be amended in Recommendation 1.1 of the Banking Royal Commission, that the government under former Prime Minister Turnbull was dragged kicking and screaming into proposing and supporting because he had lost the numbers on the floor of the House and could not guarantee that the House would not impose that Banking Royal Commission against the wishes of the Prime Minister and the government. And I can tell you now exactly what the government's going to get up and say. They're going to spin, try and spin Recommendation 1.1 to mean something that Commissioner Hain did not mean it to mean. That's what they're going to do, and I've heard it before, and we're all about to hear it again. And I counsel people who are listening to this to understand that Commissioner Hain's primary recommendation out of the Banking Royal Commission that exposed systemic criminal conduct by our banks, a culture of greed, a culture of profit over everything. And that recommendation said, do not change responsible lending obligations. And those words, the ordinary English language meaning of those words, is now being ignored by the government and they are doing exactly what Commissioner Hain recommended that they not do. They couldn't make the banks abide by the law, so they're changing the law to abide by the banks, their corporate mates. This is a government of shills for big corporate donors. The dirty, corrupting influence of political donations is writ large in so much of what this government does. Those responsible lending obligations that the government is trying to abolish, if they were properly enforced, they are what stands between the banks being held to the service of their customers and the broader public, and they are what prevent the banks from basically becoming loan sharks. But this government wants to enable the banks to become loan sharks because that will increase the profits of the big corporate banking sector in this country. So whatever value there is in introducing comprehensive credit reporting, it is being undermined completely by this government's attempts to repeal responsible lending laws. Now this might look simply like completely incoherent policy making. I'm sure that's how it looks to a lot of people. But actually it's far more cynical than simple incoherence and incompetence. When you understand that this is a government of its mates, by its mates, for its mates, then this incoherence, this apparent incoherence, actually makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense when you see it through the prism of the latest donations data that's just been released this week. It shows that all the major banks are now back in the game. NAB and ANZ both took a hiatus in recent years under the pall of the Royal Commission and a momentary need not to look like the puppet masters that they are, but they're now back in the game. That facade is now gone. In 1920, all big four banks donated. In fact, in total, they donated $280,000 to the LNP and $260,000 to the ALP. Over half a million dollars donated by the major banks to the major parties, basically with a 50-50 split. 
and I'll, uh, as an aside there, say that is the very definition of hedging by the big banks. And it's working for them. Whatever needs to be done to keep the banks happy, this government will do. Political donations in this country are nothing more than legalised bribery. And for this government to deliver for their corporate puppet masters, their corporate donors, if it means abandoning the first and primary recommendation of the Royal Commission under the cover of a pandemic, then that's exactly what they're going to do. And in fact, that is exactly what they are doing. Beyond the interaction with responsible lending obligations, the Greens have concerns with some of the functioning of this bill, namely how information is being portrayed and consumer access to the information. So, to that end, we'll be supporting the government's amendment that places conditions on the provision of information related to hardship conditions entered into between a, consume, a customer and their bank and requires credit bureaus to provide customers with their credit rating. In respect of credit reports, the government's amendment is a watered-down version of an amendment circulated by Senator Wish Wilson to the original version of this bill. The Greens would have preferred the use of the term credit-derived information to be clear that credit bureaus should give customers any and all interpretations of their credit data. It's unclear whether the government's amendment, as worded, will ensure customers see exactly what the banks see. The importance of providing customers with access to their credit scores was highlighted in 2018 when Equifax was handed a $3.5 million fine for the Fed, by the federal court for misleading, deceptive and unconscionable conduct. Equifax told consumers that the credit score that customers paid for was the same credit score used by banks, but that was not always the case. Equifax was not giving the same information to consumers about themselves that they were giving to the banks. And this gets us to a broader issue that the Australian Greens have, which is who this information is being given to and who it's not being given to. This bill will require the data on tens of millions of Australians to be given to three multinational credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian and Illion, whose business models are to derive credit scores for sale to banks. As was demonstrated by the federal court finding against Equifax, these multinationals are actually not particularly interested in helping consumers. They're simply interested in making obscene profits. Neither have they shown any particular interest in protecting their consumers' privacy. In 2017, Equifax suffered a security breach in which the data of up to 143 million US citizens was compromised. In some ways, both of Equifax's transgressions are what you might expect when multinational private entities have a regulated oligopoly from which to profit. They've got the market sewn up around the world, so why would they care about their consumers and why would they care about the public good? Now, there is an alternative, of course. A number of European countries have a public credit register. France, Italy, Belgium, Spain, Portugal and Slovenia have public credit registries that play a major role in collecting and collating credit information. These public credit registers are subject to parliamentary oversight and are a source of de-identified data for governments and financial regulators to help inform their understanding of financial markets and of the broader economy. It's no surprise that this government is advocating a market-based solution to a market-based problem. I mean, that's what they always do and it's what they tell us they stand for. But when considering how to provide a universal system for collecting, storing and sharing consumer banking data, we will be much better served by a public provider whose role is to clearly act in the interest of consumers and the wider public. So faced with the choice of the status quo or this bill, the Australian Greens will support this bill, assuming that the government's amendment succeeds. But this support is based on the assumption that this bill will improve the functioning of the existing consumer credit protection framework. And on that basis, I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1190, standing in my name as circulated. And I thank uh, Senator McAllister for indicating that the Labor Party will be supporting that amendment. And that amendment, uh, in brief, 
highlights the Treasurer's statement that this bill will make it easier for banks to meet their responsible lending obligations and ensure that loans are not unsuitable for customers. It also highlights recommendation 1.1 of the Hain Royal Commission into banks that those responsible lending obligations should, and I quote, be enforced as they stand. It highlights the rampant hypocrisy of this government, their flagrant rejection of the primary recommendation of the Hain Royal Commission. And I make the point that the government was dragged kicking and screaming into that Banking Royal Commission. And I want to acknowledge the work that my friend and colleague Senator Wish Wilson did in that campaign. And uh, if there is one person in this place uh, that the Australian people should be thanking for the Banking Royal Commission that exposed uh, such criminal conduct and rampant greed and a toxic culture in the banking sector in this country, it is actually Senator Wish Wilson. So I urge the Senate to support the second reading amendment to highlight to the government that the passage of this bill makes the case for abolition of responsible lending obligations all the more ridiculous. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I would like to thank those senators that have contributed to this debate. This bill will implement the government's mandatory comprehensive credit reporting regime, delivering benefits to lenders and borrowers alike. This important reform will require our largest banks to participate fully in the credit reporting system and provides clarity on the treatment of financial hardship information. The mandatory credit reporting regime will provide more Australians with better access to credit, will enable credit providers to make better informed lending decisions, and it will drive more competition in the lending market. The bill will deliver these benefits while also maintaining and strengthening important security and consumer protections. So Schedule 1 of this bill requires the largest banks to provide comprehensive credit information on all accounts to credit reporting bodies by September 2022. It includes provisions to ensure the security of consumer credit information and obliges credit reporting bodies to share credit score ranges and methodologies when requested by consumers, who will now also be able to seek this information more frequently. Schedule 2 addresses concerns raised regarding the treatment of financial hardship information. It provides the, length, the legal certainty for credit providers to disclose this information and ensures that consumers will not be unfairly disadvantaged by this change by placing restrictions on the use of hardship information. With the implementation of this regime, uh, customers with good credit histories will be better placed to shop around and to be able to obtain lower rates because their credit history will be available to all credit providers. Consumers who may have poor credit rating will get a better chance to demonstrate their credit worthiness through, future through their future reliability. Credit providers will also see benefits, having access to a more complete picture of a consumer's financial situation, and this will help them to better price credit for the consumer. The regime will drive competition in the lending market. With access to this data, smaller providers, including new entrants and innovative fintech firms, will be much better able to access creditworthiness and, comp and compete for customers. Just on the issue of the second reader amendment uh, that has been um, moved by the Greens, um, from a government perspective, this second reader amendment is little more than a pious amendment, has no practical effect on the legislation that has passed. In fact, the amendment that has been moved is criticising a completely unrelated piece of government legislation, which is the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2020, which will simplify uh, Australia's credit framework and support the flow of credit to the Australian economy. Um, so the amendment doesn't go to the substance of the bill. Rather, it's a bill that is currently before the Senate Economics Legislation Committee. Now, despite the, um, despite the rather noisy assertions of Senator McKim that the government has not has certainly not reneged 
on its acceptance of the recommendation of the Financial Services Royal Commission. Recommendation 1.1, Senator McKim, states that the NCCP Act should not be amended to alter the obligation to assess unsuitability. Now, this relates specifically to representations that were put to Commissioner Hain that the relevant test under responsible lending laws should be amended so that it requires lenders to determine that a loan is suitable, as opposed to the current test, which requires lenders to determine that a loan is not suitable. With respect to the recommendation, Commissioner Hain noted, consumer advocacy groups urge me to recommend that the NCCP Act be amended to require lenders to determine whether a loan contract or a credit limit increase was suitable for the consumer as distinct from not suitable. I do not favour this proposal. That was said on the Royal Commission into Misconduct in the Banking, Superannuation and Financial Services Industry final report on page 59. You have cherry-picked your information. The government remains committed. The government remains wholly committed. The government remains wholly committed to implementing all of the financial services. Uh, Royal Commission's recommendations, the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment supporting Economic Recovery Bill will, simply, will, will simplify Australia's credit, reporting, sorry, credit framework and support the flow of credit to the Australian economy. And that bill will appropriately be considered by this chamber at the appropriate time when the committee has reported. This bill before us today is about mandatory credit reporting, not, um, uh, not, the, frame, uh, not the framework and the flow of credit. Um, and so I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. We'll, uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Yes, uh, Acting Deputy President. Just, just a quick question um, in relation to the Minister's oh, sorry, response yeah. to Senator McKim. Oh, I thought we were in committee. There you go. My apologies. Senator Wish Wilson. We'll now deal with uh, Senator McKim's second reading amendment. Uh, the question is that the second reading amendment uh, moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Uh, the ayes um, will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator Smith, teller for the noes. There being uh, 28 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together? Thank you, uh, Minister. Move that the second. I'm Yes, yes. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Minister. No. Yes. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? No. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Uh, I think we have to move to committee. Okay. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, uh, it is so ordered. Now we move to amendments. I table a supplementary memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thank you. And, and, uh, and I seek leave to move the amendments to all together on sheet PM114. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Hume be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, look, I indicated in my second reading. Sorry, can I just ask, honourable senators, could you either resume your seats or leave the chamber? Thank you, Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I indicated in my uh, second reading remarks that Labor supported um, would be supporting these amendments. We previously proposed amendments to this effect, and we're very pleased with the constructive engagement from the government, uh, and we consider that this will further support consumers in financial hardship. Thank you. Uh, the question uh, is that the amendments moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Uh, sorry, Senator McKim. 
thank, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just had a, a question for um, the minister, if she's able to either um, respond now or potentially to, um, to take the question on notice. But it's just um, whether the government um, can provide an update on the timing of the um, implementation of the recommendations of the Hain Royal Commission and whether government can um, commit that uh, legislation, legislation giving effect to those recommendations will actually um, be tabled in such a way that it can pro progress um, through this parliament before uh, the Australian people next go to the polls. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, Chair. Um, two bills were passed through the Senate last year. There is another two that are sitting. So there is another one that is sitting in the House of Representatives as we speak, um, and that should the intention is to pass that by the middle of this year. Uh, sorry, as soon as possible, Senator McKim. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, just to be clear, Minister, so that's five bills from the Royal Commission. Is there any others? There was over 70 recommendations, so just interested if you could break it down into regulation and uh, versus legislation. Minister, Senator Wish Wilson, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, two have passed, one's in the House, but they contained a number of recommendations in each of those bills. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, question is that the bill be now reported. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the committee has considered the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment Mandatory Credit Reporting and Other Measures Bill uh, 2019 and agreed to it with amendments. The, the question is, Minister? The report of the committee be adopted. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. This bill now be read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a third time. All, all those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to credit reporting and for other purposes. Government business orders of the day number four. Customs amendment product specific rule modernisation bill 2019. Second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Deputy Acting President, I rise to speak on the customs amendment product specific rural modernization bill. Labor has consistently argued that free trade should be fair trade. At a time when the government should be doing everything to build the public's confidence in free trade, they're exempting a key part of Australia's free trade framework from this parliament's scrutiny with this bill. This run runs a real risk of damaging the public's trust in this issue. Whilst this bill has some merit, the government's attempt and its implementation is dangerous. The bill proposes what's described as a streamlined implementation of product-specific rules of origin, otherwise known as PSRs. The bill applies six of Australia's. The bill applies to six of Australia's 11 free trade agreements, including those with Chile, New Zealand, the United States, Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand. PSRs are an essential component of free trade agreements. Each trade agreement has a PSR annex implemented domestically for each free trade agreement. If goods meet the requirements, they are essentially deemed to have originated in the agreement party country and are entitled to the preferential treatment on customs duty imports into Australia. Five-year revisions on the harmonized community description and coding system, an international naming system for the classification of traded products, usually requires FTA parties to update their PSRs. This bill purports to streamline that process, but in doing so has the potential for de decreased parliamentary scrutiny. It's all too easy to get caught up in the technicality and the legalism of PSRs and to forget the importance of this very complex web 
of free trade principles. The parliament should be very complex, very cautious in treating complexity as a license to pass the buck and have a public servant solely handle these matters. Now, Labour has worked hard to maintain a healthy and a pr productive bipartisan approach to international trade. And while that approach has been further justified by economic headwinds during and after COVID-19, the parliament must be disciplined in our scrutiny of the executive power now more than ever. The trouble with this bill as it stands is that it doesn't leave PSRs and future changes in the regulations that are tabled in black and white in the parliament. By amending the Customs Tariff Act to directly reference the agreements themselves, the bill denies senators oversight and scrutiny of this important legislation. With that in mind, my colleague, Labour's Shadow Minister for Trade, Madeleine King, wrote to the former Trade Minister, Senator Birmingham, last year. In that letter, the Shadow Minister said, in a democracy like Australia, all parliamentarians should always be skeptical about any attempt to reduce parliamentary scrutiny. More broadly, Labour is committed to practical rules in international trade that will free up our businesses to contribute to our economy. Regre regrettably, though, the then minister's response was unsatisfactory and did not meet the outcomes and the requirements outlined by Labour. We did our job, we sought assurances, and the government failed to provide them. But our concerns remain this year, in as much as they did last year when this legislation was introduced, the Parliament has a duty to provide scrutiny to our free trade deals and arrangements. And as the Labour Senator's minority report in the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee stated, poorly drafted or ambiguous rules of origin, for example, can be an opportunity for firms in third non-party countries to gain unfair benefits through an FTA. They continued, any such activities by third parties are likely to undermine the community's confidence in free trade agreements. PSRs belong in the public debate because they're an important part of Australia's international trade story. While efforts to simplify arrangements are generally welcomed, there's no strong demand for these significant changes, and I'll expand on those matters shortly. If product-specific rule changes are in our national interest, all the better. But without a guarantee of parliamentary scrutiny, it's just another issue open to potential blunders and secret failures somewhere in a departmental office. It's far more important that we assure our community that anti-dumping rules are in play. Our pandemic recovery in trade is robust and Australians aren't getting ripped off. These are failures that all Australians would have to pay for, and if they occurred, we would need an accountability mechanism. The most efficient way to assure that the Australian public that they're consistently getting a good deal is through running PSRs through regulations in the, under the Customs Act. A disallowable instrument currently becomes before the Senate every time the government implements a PSR change. Labor's amendment seeks to protect parliamentary oversight through retention of a process that includes a disallowable instrument. You would have thought this government wouldn't or shouldn't try to pull one over on Australians and escape further scrutiny. This government avoids answering questions on notice. They say important matters are in the bubble, and they shrug off scrutiny at every turn. But they can't pass the buck when it comes to Australia's trade system. By leaving the Senate, including government senators, out of the process, especially on Australia's main window into the global economy, they would intentionally leave in the shadows the specifics of Australia's place relative to our trade partners. Labor's amendment seeks to provide certainty to small and medium-sized businesses that their interests are front of mind for the parliament. The alternative put by the government is twofold. One, they have, a point, they have pointed to amendments to the Customs Tariffs Act the parliament can seek every five years. And two, they have suggested individual members of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties could seek to form an inquiry into PSRs. Further, they've suggested that PSRs can be open to scrutiny in the Joint Standing Committee's inquiry into treaty-making treaty processes. But our founding assumption should be that Australians want us protecting their interests. There's a meaningful difference between the right to have an inquiry or putting amendments twice a decade compared to the ongoing scrutiny 
of decisions that must be tabled in the Parliament for all to see. As Australia prepares itself to ensure that global trade works in our national interest after this pandemic is over, Australians deserve assurances that, we're getting, that we are getting and that they are not getting shortchanged. It shouldn't take an inquiry to make that happen, and they shouldn't have to rely on amendments which may or may not pass every five years. As the Shadow Minister for Trade pointed out in her second reading speech, Australians expect assurances that where Australia signs up to a free trade agreement, they are fair and they are in the interests of working families. We want our fair trade agreements to be on the side of working families. There are times where the parliament can be all too keen on keeping important but tough decisions out of the parliament behind closed doors. The government's now asking that we leave key decisions about Australia's preferential treatment of goods at the border and outside of the parliament. This is part of the complex story of modern trade, but surely that's reason enough to keep this issue in the public eye and in the public's parliament. We can make international trade even easier for local business without excluding the parliament. The curious part of this debate is that the Senate inquiry only received three submissions on this bill. One, the Australian Border Force and Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in favour of the bill. And two, the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union against the bill. No industry groups or companies volunteered their support for excluding the parliament from the conversation. Government submissions to the Senate inquiry identified two reasons for the changes. One, workload issues, and two, that domestic implementation of PSRs in the latest harmonized system nomenclature can be several years behind Australia's domestic tariff updates. Now, given the public, the limited public awareness of these highly complex but important arrangements, parliamentary scrutiny is more important than ever. These are common sense objectives, but they are no reason to exclude future parliaments from their oversight of our trade relationships, especially when it, when it would not slow down positive changes. Effic efficiency in the legislation around trade doesn't have to come at the price of scrutiny, and it's unfortunate that our amendment is required at all. I remind the government that Labor's amendments are another opportunity for this parliament to demonstrate the bipartisanship that is expected of us during this recovery. Any senator who dismisses these valid criticisms is failing the constituents they represent, their place and their role in the Senate and in Australia. As Labor has done during the COVID-19 pandemic, a time when this parliament's decisions are more important than ever, we will fight for constructive amendments that will serve the national interests of Australia and be on the side of working families in Australia. Labor's amendments fulfill our commitment to the public. We will support free trade when it is fair trade. Thank you, Senator Keneally. And those amendments you spoke about, they are in the committee stage, not second readers. Thank you. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you uh, very much, Deputy President. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank Senator Keneally for her contribution. I think the Australian Greens are more or less totally in line. Uh, with, uh, with your observations as to the problems uh, represented with this legislation currently put before us, um, and we'll be supporting the amendments you just outlined to the Chamber. Um, we've been uh, reflecting on this piece of legislation for a while now, uh, since it has risen and fallen and risen and fallen again uh, with the government's uh, thoughts about whether they've got the numbers or not in the place uh, for it to pass. Um, it, for me, it, it says two things. One, that the government uh, is fundamentally out of step uh, with community expectations when it comes to our trading relationships uh, with our regional and global neighbours. Now, we know that uh, Australians, our community, uh, want to see us work with our friends and neighbours in, re in the region and around the world. We know that there is support for the exchange of goods and services and trades of all kinds as long as they meet the basic standards, human rights, uh, environmental protections, labour protections uh, and transparency and uh, public accountability. Uh, the mechanisms by which, uh, mechanisms by which Parliament uh, and the people uh, retain an ultimate 
uh, position of authority over approval of these processes. Uh, now, we are in a situation here in Australia due to the uh, corruptive, I believe, influence of corporate money on this place, uh, that we do not have a process by which uh, free trade agreements uh, whole bar are scrutinised and agreed to uh, by the parliament. My colleague Senator Wish Wilson, in his previous uh, role as our trade uh, spokesperson, uh, has spoken at length um, on the issue and the challenges that are, that are presented by mechanisms such as uh, ISDS within our uh, free trade agreement frameworks. Uh, what we have uh, currently is a system by which government to government tick the thing off, and we are given the opportunity here as a chamber uh, to have a look into it through a J. Scott process without teeth, um, and then uh, decide whether or not to implement the relevant sections that pertain to our legislative requirements here in Australia. It is not good enough. It is not a process that the Greens support. Uh, it is something that we have continually opposed. Um, what this legislation seeks to do is take uh, one of the few scraps of parliamentary oversight that still exist um, in our process and turn it back over to the government to make an already um, non-transparent process uh, worse. Um, and it, you have to almost suppress a dark laugh uh, when you read the justification uh, for uh, this legislation as proposed by the government. The justification is that it will make the uh, administrative process for the Department of Foreign Affairs and, uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade simpler. Um, they they, they uh, seek to come before us today and propose a piece of legislation that would remove parliamentary oversight so that the people of DFAT don't have to work so hard. I mean, it, 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 really, is a, uh, it really is a bit of dark comedy in and of itself. We have hardly have any oversight, as my colleague rightly mentions, hardly any oversight at all, and we are to give back one of the only functions of oversight because having that function of oversight is causing the department uh, to have to work too hard. Not good enough. Not good enough at all, particularly when the department, as my colleague points out, uh, very helpful interjections, Senator Wilson, thank you very much, uh, often operates as a black box, and it is very hard to get information out of DFAT, and even uh, uh, during my time on the committee, on the J. Scott committee, we found that to be challenging. So that's one of the first thing, that's the first thing that I would say, um, observing this legislation. The other bit would be, the other bit would be, and uh, it's, it's a funny old thing. There's many people on, on, the, on the conservative side of the, the chamber that I expect have spent a lot of time in their lives seeking to be in federal government, uh, to hold the reins of executive office, <laughs> uh, to have majorities in this place and, uh, and to be in government. And it's just... Um, it defies belief to see the Parliament's time spent, so much of it spent, um, on legislation like this. Tiny, piddly, fiddly stuff that just burns up the time where an actual agenda should be. Uh, we, this has been on the books now for the best part of, I'm trying to think back when we first heard of it, probably the best part of a year now. Um, it, it's just November 2019. You know, it, if you have an evil agenda, surely you could. Could we not fight about the evil agenda? That would at least be, you know, you have an evil agenda. But let's let's see a legislative evil agenda. Let's let's engage with with some stuff. A, con a contest of ideas. This is a contest of bureaucratic process. It, it's, ah, oh, it's, yeah, I don't know. I sh maybe I shouldn't complain about it, because if you had more terrible ideas, you might get them through. But it's very odd. It's very odd. It's just like sitting in the lane, letting the engine tick over, collecting your salaries, not really doing much. 
Uh, but there you go. Uh, we, will be, we will be, as I flagged, uh, supporting the Labor um, amendments as put. Um, uh, we will not be supporting the bill uh, as it is currently written, um, because it reduces parliamentary oversight in a process that is almost free of parliamentary oversight as it is. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I am very pleased to rise today in support of the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill 2019. Australia is a proud trading nation. What we make, grow, produce and mine here is sought all around the world. And because of that, we are able to enjoy a much higher standard of living than we ever could if we shut ourselves off from trading with other nations. Our success in negotiating mutually beneficial free trade agreements with nations all around the world has brought further opportunities for Australian businesses and Australian producers to sell their products overseas. And, as I say, free trade agreements uh, are a, a key way that we facilitate this. But these agreements commonly take years to negotiate. They're very complex and very technical documents, and it's important that we monitor them on an ongoing basis to ensure that they are operating effectively and efficiently. And that's what this bill today that we're debating here, Madam Deputy President, does. It seeks to greatly reduce the administrative burden of updating product-specific rules for six of Australia's 11 free trade agreements, being the Australia and United States Free Trade Agreement, the Thailand-Australia Free Trade Agreement, the Australia-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement, the Australia-Chile Free Trade Agreement, the Malaysia-Australia Free Trade Agreement and the Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement. These changes that will be processed as part of this bill will simplify the administration of these free trade agreements without changing their operation or requiring significant changes in practice by traders seeking to claim preferential tra tariff treatment for goods imported under the free trade agreements. And I must disagree with some of the uh, contribution from um, Senator Stilljohn regarding um, how insignificant this piece of legislation apparently is. I absolutely disagree with that assessment. Uh, these changes are incredibly important as part of our broader um, approach to, to dealing with free trade agreements and ensuring that they are simplified and easy to uh, operate and understand. Because, Madam Deputy President, it is more important now than ever that we seek to maximise the efficiency of our free trade agreements with valued trading partners around the world. Recent events, particularly in the last 12 months, have demonstrated very clearly that we can't take for granted the fact that just because we have a free trade agreement and history of trading ties with a nation, that they will treat our producers and businesses fairly. For example, despite our free trade agreement with China, they have been openly treating our fishers, fruit growers, wine producers, barley growers, miners and other businesses unfairly by levying additional tariffs and stopping Australian product getting to Chinese customers. This is being done in breach of World Trade Organisation rules and as a blatant attempt to try and force Australia to change our foreign policies and the way in which we stand up for our democracy and human rights in our region. As Prime Minister Scott Morrison has made clear, Australia will never trade away our values or our right to stand up for our interests. And I wholeheartedly agree with this sentiment. Indeed, Madam Deputy President, I have regularly spoken in this place in agreement with that sentiment. Because of these breaches of our free trade agreements by the Chinese Communist government, many Australian businesses and industries are working hard to now diversify their customer base, to expand their reach into markets like those covered by the free trade agreements affected by this bill. The USA, Thailand, Chile, Malaysia, Korea as well as other large markets such as India. It's completely understandable, given the impacts of COVID and the behaviour of the Chinese Communist government, that Australians want our nation to be more self-reliant, and so we should be. But we also have to remember that the reason we are a trading nation 
is because in many of our key areas of strength, we are not just self-reliant. We are so much more than self-reliant. For example, our Australian farmers produce 70 per cent more food than our population needs. And that's why we need our farmers to be able to get those surplus products to international markets to ensure their farming operations remain profitable and viable. And that's why free trade agreements with key strategic partners are so important and why I look forward to seeing our government do even more to strengthen Australian trading partnerships into the future as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. As I said, Madam Deputy President, I'm very pleased to speak in support of this bill today because, like I said, Australia is a proud trading nation and our free trade agreements form a really important integral part of what makes us such a successful trading nation. And we need those free trade agreements to operate efficiently and effectively. And that is what the changes that we are debating here today in the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill 2019 will do. They will reduce the administrative burden of updating product specific rules for six of our 11 free trade agreements. And I pay credit, Madam Deputy President, to the former Trade Minister, uh, Senator Birmingham, and the new Trade Minister, Dan Tehan, in the other place, for their hard work and focus on ensuring Australian businesses and farmers benefit from trade and from our free trade agreements with our partners. I'm very confident that going forward, as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, international trade is going to form an absolutely vital part of that recovery. Uh, Australia will need to focus more on what we can do on Ireland, uh, and I think that this government has an incredibly promising agenda, particularly in the manufacturing space, to ensure that that occurs. But we need to be looking more broadly across the world to identify new trading partners so that we can trade our way out of this economic uh, crisis that we have regrettably found ourselves in due to COVID-19. So, Madam Deputy President, with that said, I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, this uh, debate is timely. Um, it's um, extraordinary in my time here that um, we have seen the growth of the number of bills that are carried by this parliament that contain effective a dereliction of duty from this chamber to the public service. We have a situation now where uh, the number of bills containing um, regulation legislation by regulation is growing at a, an extraordinary rate. And the number of bills that can attain uh, instruments where there is no capacity for the parliament to actually disallow those regulations is equally growing at an extraordinary rate. Uh, the uh, fact remains that as legislatures we are negligent in not doing something about that fact. We are failing in our responsibilities as members of parliament in not insisting on the capacity of this parliament to properly supervise the work of the executive and the public service. So the debate is timely. It's timely because it focuses our attention, our, our, the importance of government transparency and the ability of this parliament to ensure proper oversight. It's timely because it involves our trading arrangements at a time of global economic disruption, at a time, of course, when there's trade wars going on between our major trading partners, where one of our trading partners, which at the moment involves some 46 per cent 
of our exports is imposing tariffs and other sanctions on this country and where our other major trading partner, the United States, is engaging in preferential trading arrangements with that country at our, to our disadvantage. So they're not good trying to cloak this in some sort of mantra of anti-communist hysteria. This is a more fundamental issue about the role of this parliament in the protection of the Australian people and the capacity of members of parliament to do their job. And for us to suggest that somehow or another this is all legitimised because we are reducing the administrative burden suggests to me that we could take that much, much further, couldn't we? Why do we need to meet at all? We could simply pass a series of omnibus bills giving the power of the executive and the public service to do whatever they like. That's the logic of the argument. So this is a bill that attempts to reduce the transparency of government as well as the government's accountability to parliament. On the positive side, the bill highlights the role of the Senate committee system. I'm uh, the uh, deputy chair of the legislative committee that actually brought forward the report which has led to these amendments being uh, taken up by the Labor caucus. Despite the fact that there were very few submissions, because very few people have actually read the legislation. I'm also a member of the Scrutiny of Bills, the Delegated Legislation Committees, and what I must say to you, as a reminder to me, given the years of service that I have put in here, of the splendid work undertaken by the secretariats of those committees, because well, at least we know there's someone here in this building that actually reads all the legislation and points out the consequences of not paying proper attention to the detail. And when I raise the issue, the fact that delegated the, 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 these regulatory measures were being taken in such a manner as to take away from the parliament, people at first said to me, oh, they can't possibly be right. In fact, it was. See, in democracies like this country that claims to be, we should be sceptical about attempts to reduce parliamentary scrutiny in the name of administrative efficiency, about reducing administrative burdens. We should be sceptical about the failure of our political system to actually keep an eye on our administrators. The minority report of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee makes the point, and the amendments we've moved today come about as a result of that report. And if they're not carried by the chamber, the Labor Party won't be supporting this legislation. I trust the majority of the Senate won't support this legislation because it is time to make a stand on the question of delegated legislation and the capacity of this parliament to actually stand up when it comes to proper scrutiny. Now, this is a bill that relates to product-specific rules, which are important elements of bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. I've been involved in industry policy for a very long time. I have seen how these rules of origin arrangements are exploited, are abused, how unscrupulous individuals and unscrupulous firms take advantage of them. There is a constant threat of transshipment where firms in third countries try to export goods to Australia under favourable term terms by transshipping them via one of our trade agreements to other partner countries. The consequences of that are to seriously damage the economic interest of this country, the revenue of this country, to undermine the political interests of this country. And as Australia's anti-dumping commissioner, for the time being, because he's been given the heave-ho by this government, Dr. Dale, Mr Dale Seymour, he's discussed at Senate estimates the challenges faced by Australia in terms of transshipment over many, many years, including the, very much, the question specifically around the 
the matter of unfair competition to Australian firms and to Australian workers who obey Australian laws are faced with companies that don't have to. Now, these are the actions that threaten Australian industry and threaten Australian jobs. And we have an obligation to stand up and defend those jobs, defend those industries, and not abrogate that responsibility so some faceless, unelected bureaucrat. Australia must maintain a strong anti-dumping measures in the time of uncertainty, given the trading system as it is globally. We shouldn't let complaints about China or the many other countries. I want to emphasise that. The many other countries that take advantage of our lax attitude on these trade issues. The rabid fact-like commentary from the Australian media, particularly the Australian Financial Review, who are trying to divert us from defending our national interests. We've got to make sure that we actually stand up for the Australian people because the opportunities for circumvention and the misuse of product-specific rules make it more difficult for the Anti-Dumping Commission to ensure compliance with Australian law and with Australia's trading agreements. Now, the Commission's reported there are 80 measures in force as of the 20th of June of last year. They involve 22 countries, not just China, 22 countries, comprising 69 dumping measures and 11 countervailing measures. Nearly two-thirds of those measures involve the steel industry. And during the past five years, the Commission heard 273 cases, 60 per cent of them related, of course, to China. So we don't have to question the product-specific rules. What you need to question is to ensure that there's proper accountability to the way in which they're administered. To make sure they are updated accurately, regularly, that robust rules of origin and product specific rules are in fact administered properly. Now, the framework, which was established in 2013 and expanded in 2015, nominates a series of activities that are likely to constitute transshipment to avoid anti dumping penalties. Australia has got to remain alert to those threats. And that's why we believe changes to these regulations should be done by a disallowable instrument. Now, the PSRs define goods that will be eligible for preferential trade treatment if they have been substantially transformed in Australia or in an FTA partner country. Product-specific rules define what is sufficiently transformed. Now, based on the so-called harmonisation system, the classification of goods based on international agreed descriptors for goods and it's updated every five years. The current arrangements, of course, provide for a parliamentary role. But the bill's aim is to streamline the way in which the product-specific rules and the origins of a, and these various agreements can be changed in regard to six so the 11 free trade agreements. The proposal is to remove these from the by the normal regulations. Now, of course, it's said, oh, well, we'll, you know, we'll move this off to J. Scott. J. Scott is not an effective parliamentary committee when it comes to the question of proper scrutiny. It is very low-level scrutiny. Its recommendations cannot be disallowed. Border force builds the cat when they, of course, make it clear, and I quote, the domestic process includes referring the FTA amendments to J. Scott as a category three minor treaty action. J. Scott has agreed to treat all harmonised system prepositions as minor treaty actions. These J. Scott recommend arrangements have not prompted a, a, a public inquiry or calls for public submissions, and of course, 
Any active J. Scott measure is dependent upon an individual member with the resources to take on the bureaucracy and the capacity to alert the rest of the parliament to failures. So the government's reason for not having these matters as disallowable instruments is hollow. Complexity, of course, and demands greater parliamentary scrutiny, not less parliamentary scrutiny. The definitions of goods and their origin are complex and technical, as is for sure. There are enormous disputes within industry as to what is a reinterpretation or a subversion. The rules of origin are complex and are critical to Australian industry and Australian workers. And there is an expectation that this parliament will take an interest in guarding the interests of Australian industry and Australian workers. This is not something that should be abrogated to somebody else. Transparency in the rules of parliamentary scrutiny is therefore essential. The Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Bills has identified its concerns with this bill as well. Scrutiny Digest No. 9 of 2019 comments, at a general level, the committee will have scrutiny concerns where provision in a bill allow incorporation of legislative provisions by reference to other documents. The three risks are identified. It raises the prospect of changes being made by law in the absence of parliamentary scrutiny, it can create uncertainty in the law, and it means that those obligations to obey the law may have inadequate access to the terms. The same committee recently considered the implication of the growth in the number of bills, which I've already referred to. The number of bills, of course, involving such dereliction of duty has doubled in recent years. And that has important implications in a whole range of industries, civil aviation, farm household support, the NDIS, vehicle standards, building standards. These are all matters that have been referred to other committees. This is the latest move in an attempt to reduce parliamentary oversight by the Morrison government when it dodges its accountability responsibilities and ought to be Thank rejected you, Senator by Your this time chamber. Has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, one Nation continues to oppose so-called fair trade agreements. Instead, what we support and what we want is fair trade. Now, this bill does not expand free trade agreements. It simplifies their administration. As such, One Nation will be supporting this bill that is essentially housekeeping for existing free trade agreements. Australia's free trade agreements supposedly allow our producers to receive preferential tariff treatment in the countries that our free trade agreements cover. Each agreement specifies what must happen to a product in order for that product to qualify as Australian-made. These are called product-specific rules. These rules have been written separately for each free trade agreement and included in the schedule to each agreement. Each time a rule change was agreed, the free trade agreement had to be updated. This is cumbersome and costly. So what this bill does is it replaces the individual schedules with the World Customs Organization's common set of definitions and standards. 183 countries worldwide, accounting for 98 per cent of world trade, use these harmonised systems classifications. Now, people know that One Nation are the last people to support an expanded role for unelected, unaccountable foreign bureaucrats. This bill, though, simplifies free trade agreements and does not expand free trade agreements. In this case, adopting these harmonised definitions helps everyone, including Australian producers. This does not change One Nation's opposition to free trade agreements. Despite their name, so-called free trade agreements are never free. These agreements always come at a cost to someone and that cost is usually everyday Australians. 
Underdeveloped countries do not sign free trade agreements with industrialised nations in order to give away what they have. It is the industrialised nation that gives wealth away. And that is the history of free trade agreements. For example, the Indonesian free trade agreement calls on Australia to send educators to Indonesia to train their skilled workers so they can then come to Australia and take jobs from Australians. In return, Australia gets to sell agricultural produce to Indonesia. There is one catch with that. Indonesia is not issuing import licenses. Indonesia remains wedded to their policy of self-sufficiency in agriculture. When Australian grape growers tried to use our newly signed free trade agreement just a few months ago to sell this year's crop of tra table grapes, the Indonesian government refused import licenses. Our farmers were left to find other markets for grapes. Indonesia wins and we lose. Australian workers lose. Australians lose. Australia loses. Our table grapes industry is not able to add extra workers because the increased sales fail to appear. Yet in other areas of our economy, Indonesian workers that we trained are displacing our workers. Where is the benefit of this to Australians? There is no benefit to our people. Why does Labor blindly and automatically support free trade agreements that benefit globalists and hurt Australian workers? One Nation do not support free trade agreements. We support, free tra we support fair trade. I'll say it again. One Nation do not support free trade agreements. We support fair trade. The government needs to work harder and honestly to make these so-called agreements fair, or we should just walk away from the table. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Ayres. Like on so many other occasions, one nation says one thing and does another. Uh, Senator Roberts claims that one nation party is out there campaigning against free trade agreements. Uh, but in this parliament, they've just indicated uh, that in this chamber they'll be supporting this legislation. Uh, Senator Roberts indicates that he's opposed to unelected bureaucrats uh, dealing with uh, issues like product specific rules. But this legislation deletes parliamentary scrutiny of product specific rules. Uh, like so much of One Nation's activity, it's saying one thing to its constituency, particularly in Queensland, and doing another. That's why they were voting with the government this morning to support the big banks against some sensible amendments that would have made uh, financial governance and protecting ordinary consumers, particularly low-income consumers in country towns, from predatory practices of the big banks, and yet Senators Hanson and Roberts, like they are so many times, are on the government side of the chamber supporting the Morrison government's agenda. Now, Senator Carr's contribution, as it is on so many occasions on questions of trade and industry policy uh, and uh, protecting the interests of Australian industry, was exactly right. The principles that this bill touches uh, go to scrutiny, parliamentary scrutiny, and go to enforcement of product specific rules. And I think that Senator Carr's contribution uh, went to some detail about the importance of product specific rules, in particular for protecting Australian manufacturers and the importance of parliamentary scrutiny. Now, this bill means less scrutiny, and less scrutiny inevitably means less enforcement. It is so consistent with this government's approach to all of its responsibilities, not least its approach to trade questions, that it's all talk and no delivery. Now, it is absolutely vital that in the agreements that we sign, 
that Australia signs off on and the trade that is conducted that unscrupulous firms are not allowed uh, to uh, breach these provisions. And what stands against unscrupulous firms breaching these provisions, which cost workers jobs, particularly in the suburbs, particularly in our regions, is three things. Good legislation, a good legislative framework, strong parliamentary scrutiny, uh, and strong enforcement and resources behind strong enforcement. And we have none of those things uh, in the Australian framework. We have a weak framework uh, of uh, protection against dumping and a low level of commitment from the government to that framework. We are deleting parliamentary scrutiny in this bill. Uh, and we have a government that is not committed to strong enforcement action, uh, to working with Australian industry to protect Australian industry against dumping and against unscrupulous firms who manipulate the complex array of product-specific rules. Now, Senators Carr and Fear of Andy Wells have been very strong on the issues of parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary accountability, and on this parliament not delegating its authority in its proper role. And more attention should be paid uh, to the work that they have done in these areas, and I'm sure that the parliament and the Senate are going to hear a lot more about it. If we want to enforce preferential trade agreements for Australian goods, we have to be capable of monitoring whether, in fact, a good is manufactured in Australia or not. And this does become more complex as supply chains become longer, the process of regulation becomes increasingly complex and product specific. Take, for example, a radiator. If an Australian company wants to avoid export duties in Indonesia under the Australia Indonesia FTA, they have to prove that their radiators are Australian made. If the radiator is made from imported parts, cooling fans, pipes, etc., at least 40 per cent of the final product's value must be from the Australian manufacturing process. Salmon exported to Indonesia must be fished in Australia to avoid tariffs, but smoked salmon made from imported fish smoked in Australia will also avoid tariffs. Those regulations, complex product-specific rules, are included in the free trade agreement itself. Each agreement has a separate PSR system based on the harmonised commodity description and coding system, which is used by more than 200 countries. Labor's amendment to this bill is simple. We would give the Senate more power to scrutinise the way in which those PSRs are updated. There is a balance between efficiency and scrutiny in the way that our legislation oversees trade agreements, uh, and this bill goes too far in delegating authority and in the parliament abrogating its responsibility to effectively monitor what is absolutely in the interests of Australian firms and Australian workers, particularly in the regions. Like in so many other areas on trade, the government has given the game away. Uh, while the bill relates to a technical matter within trade, it reflects a larger problem with the Morrison government's trade agenda. Put simply, it is all announcement, no delivery. The government loves announcing big trade deals, loves and announcing cutting the ribbon on a trade agreement. They like the signing ceremony but they are never there for the hard work of compliance and delivery and supporting Australian exporters. We've heard the government talk about trade diversification recently as if it's a new conversion and a new problem that nobody had ever thought about before. And what we see is a paltry commitment, a too little too late commitment to trade diversification. And of course supporting our exporters in the Morrison government's mind 
is all about free trade agreements and nothing else. When it comes to supporting Australian exporters, to backing them, to shifting Australian exports up the value chain to where the good jobs are, to where the real jobs are, the Morrison government is nowhere to be found. Now, Australia has continued to retreat, has continued to decline down global value chains. Our exports have become less and less complex. We have become more of a farm and more of a quarry and less of a manufacturer and less of a sophisticated goods and services exporter. And the Morrison government's only response is a free trade agreement fetish. The law of diminishing returns in this area has left us desperately trying to draw up agreements with countries as small as Uruguay. Now, I love Uruguay. People in this parliament would have a great regard uh, for Uruguay. We've got a great history. But why was so much emphasis put into a free trade agreement with Uruguay? Our highest trade volumes with Uruguay over the course of the last decade has been about $24 million. Saddles, soap and plastic plates. Why has so much emphasis been on put on ribbon cutting on a free trade agreement with Uruguay? Because it's all about announcement, not about real delivery. The people who understand this best are located in the regions and in the suburbs. Now, I read with interest the National Party's contribution. Now, remember, the National Party's history in this area has been the big supporters of free trade for Australian agricultural exports. Uh, there, when the Cairns Agreement was signed, uh, National Party MPs lining up to support uh, free trade agreements. Well, we've seen a change of heart from what remains of the Bunyip aristocracy that runs the National Party in Australia. They released to no acclaim, no applause, a brief little skirmish in the Australian newspaper, their Manufacturing 2035 plan this week. Uh, and it's not a surprise that it's sunk without trace. Because if ever the National Party was put in charge of a response to Australian manufacturing, uh, that would be the end of Australian manufacturing. Their approach to manufacturing, the slogans, the bright ideas, to the extent that there's anything good in this document, it's been pinched off, it's been pinched off the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union. To the extent there's anything good in it, uh, ideas that have been taken from others. But these guys pretend they haven't been around for the last seven years of government. Uh, now, it's been obvious, hasn't it, that the manufacturing industry uh, hasn't benefited from the National Party's role in government. They're in a sort of dreamland, as if they haven't been around, not just for the last seven years, but the Howard years. And what have we seen over the course of that period? A shallow and weak commitment from the Howard governments and then the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments to supporting Australian exporters, an approach that's all about free trade agreements that have uh, prioritised the interests of farmers and miners over the interests of manufacturers, put commodities first and dragged us back down the global value chain. We've seen governments that have presided over the closing of the Australian car industry, but there's a lot about cars in the National Party's publication as if they had nothing to do with the closure of the Australian car industry. Uh, there's a lot in the National Party document about uh, fabrics and textiles. I mean, every wool scouring plant in Australia has closed. Every single one on the way out. And, and in Wagga, not too far away from Senator Dave, where Senator Davey lives, Riverina Woolcombing closed many years ago under the Howard government. Uh, the Australian textiles industry is almost gone, almost gone, and the National Party, who never raised a finger 
as Australian wool processing was sent offshore, mostly indeed to China, some to Italy, never a peep from the National Party over the course of the last two decades, but suddenly now they're interested. Uh, I, I think that a feigned interest from the National Party in the interests of regional manufacturing, it's a bit like Idi Amin professing an interest in human rights or Margaret Thatcher suddenly being excited about the rights and welfare of coal mining workers. Maybe that's a little bit closer to where the National Party uh, is today. Extraordinarily, in this document, which probably won't see the light of day for most Australians, it says, adding to these pressures, Australian manufacturers are paying 91 per cent more for electricity and 48 per cent more for gas over the last decade. Well, that's right. It's absolutely right. But where have the National Party been on these questions? They couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. What they have been doing is focusing upon one job, not the jobs of rural Australians, not the future of regional industries, but one job. Who is going to be the leader of the National Party in the House of Representatives? Squabbling over the spoils in Canberra, but in a dreamland when it comes to the future of regional industry and regional jobs. And not only do they forget their own role in sending all these jobs overseas, the only plan they've really got is to make electricity more expensive for Australian manufacturers, to throw more public resources behind making energy more expensive and consigning more of Australian manufacturing Thank you, to Senator the dustbin. Ayers, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to add my voice in opposition to the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rural Modernisation Bill 2019. The bill removes critically important parliamentary oversight of our laws which prevent the dumping of goods in Australia. We hear a lot about companies that deliberately move their profits around globally to avoid paying tax. Well, there are also organisations that move goods around the world under so-called transshipment arrangements to avoid anti-dumping or countervailing duties on their products. They do this by abusing the rules of origin regime that is part of a robust, rules-abiding international trade system. Paying bit of these anti-dumping and countervailing duties based on rules of origin is what protects Australian companies and Australian workers producing goods here. These rules also allow us to give preferential treatment for goods coming from specific countries, for example, our Pacific neighbours. These are important rules for our trading system. We should be strengthening these rules and not permit them to be watered down or easily avoided. This customs bill, if passed, would actually dilute the oversight and policing of dodgy operators who often use highly sophisticated schemes to get around these laws. If passed, this bill will undermine Australian jobs and Australian businesses at a time of global pandemic, a time when we should be building our sovereign capacity and growing our jobs at home. Let's be clear about dealing with what we're dealing with here. These schemes include moving goods through one or more third countries to disguise their origin. These operators undermine Australian companies and working conditions of Australian workers who are forced to compete with goods that bear unfair and artificially lowered price tags. Since 2013, Australia has had an anti-circumvention framework designed to prevent this kind of law-breaking. In 2015, it was expanded and for good reason. I think the Australian people would be genuinely shocked to know what lengths some unscrupulous companies 
are going to to avoid Australian anti-dumping laws. The law is complex, but it has to be to catch up with all the tricks that companies use. Just some of the schemes that are used by exporting companies bringing goods into Australia are avoiding duties by importing parts into Australia, which are then essentially here and is passed off as an Australian made. Not paying duties by assembling parts in a third country and shipping it via country with preferential arrangements with Australia. Avoiding the higher rate of duty by making an arrangement with another exporter with more favourable rates to bring those goods in. Not increasing the price of the goods with the duties payable by law so as to undercut local competitors and avoiding paying duties by slightly modifying goods in an attempt to classify them as outside the anti-dumping rules. Mr. President, uh, Mr. De Mr. Acting Deputy President, this bill is also an example of a more general trend that we're seeing from the government. I'm talking about the volume of laws that did not get the adequate scrutiny of parliament. There is no reason why our product-specific rules of origin and extras in trade agreements cannot be updated when the international rules change. Our laws may, of course, need to reflect those changes. In order for the law to be fit for its purpose of protecting Australian companies and workers from unfair competition from imports. But what this bill does is also allow for new updated annexures to our trade agreements to be automatically recognised. These changes would be brought into effect without allowing the parliament to scrutinise them and have the option to vote against them. That's because this bill would drastically diminish the current level of parliamentary scrutiny. It would reduce the scrutiny from a disallowable regulation to the mere requirement that a joint standing committee on treaties hold an inquiry. The J. Scott Committee has government opposition and crossbench members, of course, but it's dominated by the government. So its inquiries are likely not to, unlikely to contradict either the minister or the government. Last year, J. Scott held an inquiry into the contents of this bill and Labor produced a minority report laying out our concerns. In its submission to that inquiry, the Australian Border Force suggested that Australia's existing domestic treaty-making process already allows for parliamentary scrutiny by J. Scott. However, we should be clear that this scrutiny does not mean there will be a vote in parliament. In fact, even if the government's own committee members had serious reservations about a treaty, an inquiry report that challenged the government's view is an advisory only and has no legislative power. This is highly problematic because Australian, Australia's negotiations and trade agreements largely are in secret. There is very little opportunity for stakeholders to be part of the process. Now, that means that workers, unions defending the rights of workers, NGOs defending the state, defending the state of the environment and those speaking up for health, government procurement and use of local content laws of a sovereign nation are already largely shut out of discussions when the terms of these deals are being thrashed out. In fact, stakeholders in Europe and in the US have more access to trade negotiations and the process of decision-making than we do. In the United States, of course, the Congress has to, has to vote to pass trade deals. In my view, we need more, not less, ability for the Australian Parliament to weigh in on the deals we sign with other countries. And of course, this bill goes in the opposite direction. So if our government, behind closed doors, develops an extra to a trade agreement and the ch changes are deemed to be technical in nature and don't alter the commitments made in the treaty itself, then Parliament will have zero ability to disallow these new rules. It's important to understand that this inability to disallow new trade deal rules will apply even if these new laws create this, this risk 
that Australian jobs and Australian companies will be undermined by the abuse of the rules of origin framework. Stacting Deputy President, we know that abuse of the rules of origin is a growing problem. The latest evidence we have from the Australian Border Force is from a report in April 2019, and this does not make for reassuring reading. In the anti-dumping and countervailing part of this compliance report, the Australian Border Force reveals that in the year to March 2019, more than 34 per cent of the shipments they inspected that are subject to anti-dumping duties were found not to be compliant. These goods were misclassified, but the report does not reveal what the reasons for the misclassification was. It could be illegally using dumping duty exemptions or the misdeclaration of country of origin or illegal transshipment. Meanwhile, Border Force and ABF put, busted a large shipment of aluminium from China in 2019. The importers had attempted to transship the aluminium via third countries such as Indonesia and Singapore to Australia and to avoid significant duties that would have applied. In addition, Capital Aluminium ran an anti-circumvention inquiry into extrusions transshipped from China to avoid duties. The anti-dumping commissioner made the findings in relation to aluminium extrusion exported by Zanarko from Thailand, Yunsin from Taiwan, and by following the exporters from Thailand, Bay Enterprise, Siam Industrial Supplies, and V Power Bio Biotech. Last year, Australia's anti-dumping commissioner also found that aluminium extrusion that originated in China and manufactured in Forsham ZP aluminium of China were exporters to Australia, except they were deliberately shipped via Malaysia and Thailand. The commissioner concluded that this constituted circumvention activities. Also last year, in a Senate estimates hearing, my colleague Senator Carr questioned the anti-dumping commissioner, Dale Seymour, on efforts to try to catch companies avoiding anti-dumping duties. Mr Seymour said, and I quote, the problem with anti-circumvention is that once the tax has been imposed, it's almost guaranteed that businesses will try and limit their exposure to those obligations. You'd like to think that they'd, they'd do that legally, and obviously many of them might think they're doing it legally, but they're actually in breach of Australian custom law. He went on to say, what's really interesting is the emergence of what I call intermediaries, who are neither technically the importer nor the exporter, but seek to be a midpoint trader who speculates, takes a certain level of risk in buying and selling in the international market, clips the ticket, if you like, and takes a cut on the way through and who openly advertises circumvention services on the internet, not the dark web, the internet, and specifically say that we will ensure that the Australian duties on this product will not need to be paid through their actions to circumvent and transship these products. When asked if this was legal, Mr Seymour said, no, I don't believe it is legal. It's contrary to an obligation that an importer would have to pay a duty on a product that is subject to a measure. So in that sense, it is a contravention of the Customs Act. We have the ability now, the legislation was amended a couple of years ago, to run our own investigations on these transshipped products. We did so with aluminium, and the minister agreed with my, with my recommendation, he said, and we altered the notice and we named a number of foreign actors in the space who were clearly circumventing. The ones that weren't were able to capture, however, we were their intermediaries who, under the law, current law, I'm unable to name on the notice. I think going forward, I would be talk, talking to my colleagues on the policy side about how we might be able to provide some disincentives to stop those practices occurring. But it's extremely challenging and difficult. What's quite clear with this legislation? 
that we have to have a robust system of oversighting, circumvention, the actions by various corporations around the world, those companies that I've listed and named within this speech, are just a few of the examples of the challenges that we have. But also what's critical on that is that there isn't a simple uh, decision made by departmental advice and the minister and the government on matters of grave economic importance to this country. It's critical that these matters aren't simply handed over to a well-meaning bureaucrat, but not a well-meaning bureaucrat that can be oversighted appropriately and properly by parliament and by an area of trade, an area of responsibility that's important for this particular parliament and this Senate. It's incredibly important that we have a robust system that makes sure that avoiding duties by importing parts into Australia are then assembled here and passed off as an Australian made is held to, held to account. We've got to make sure that we don't just simply leave someone to come up with a view about what should be changed, a ministerial um, uh, precedent set that can't be overturned even under necessity and the will of parliament. That not paying duties by assembled parts in the third country are critical issues that we need to be concentrating our efforts in. Avoiding the higher rate of duty by making an arrangement with another exporter with more favourable rates to bring those goods in we need to be aware of. That the issues that come up with not increasing the price of goods and commensurate with the duties payable by law so as to undercut local competitors. And of course, avoiding paying duties by slightly modifying goods in an attempt to classify them as outside the anti-dumping rules. Mr Seymour went to a long list of the challenges that are within, that are within his purvey. He's done an exceptionally sterling job in taking those challenges up. So there you have it. What we need in Australia, according to our own export, expert officials, is a more robust anti-dumping regime, Senator not the weakened Sheldon. one the government is proposing. Your time has expired. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank Sullivan. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I uh, rise to speak uh, this, this morning on uh, or afternoon on this uh, important bill. Important bill, the Customs Amendment. Product Specific Rules Modernisation Bill 2019. Now, this bill will allow for the removal of almost 3,000 pages of regulation. 3,000 pages of regulation. It will enable uh, exporters, those that involved in trade across the world, to be able to streamline their processes. These changes will make it simpler for Australian businesses to identify the tariff benefits that they can access under. Uh, free trade agreements uh, as they look for opportunities, especially, especially. Senator Sullivan, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it being 12:45, um, I shall now proceed to senators' statements. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking over in the corner for you, Senator McKenzie. Sorry, <laughs> Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, the need to reinvigorate and bolster Australia's manufacturing capability to protect our supply chains is essential in essential products has never been more important. Indeed, its fragility uh, and our overexposure to certain markets has been exposed uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. The National's ambitious Manufacturing 2035 plan to modernise and rejuvenate Australian manufacturing will do just that. Manufacturing 2035 will get production lines humming and reboot our sovereign manufacturing capability. The Nationals' plan will make Australia make again. But there are challenges. Our plan is a solid roadmap to address these challenges because Australians need to be able to buy Australian-made products. Over the past decade, there have been trade protection measures reduced with some manufacturing industries all but disappearing from Australian shores. Record demand for Australian resource exports has maintained a relatively high Australian dollar, making it tough for manufacturers to compete against cheaper, mass-produced imports, often from countries where the tough environmental standards that our own uh, Australian manufacturers operate under uh, do not exist. And our manufacturers have paid 91 per cent more for electricity and 48 per cent more for gas over the past decade. 
All of these challenges have resulted in our manufacturing decline in real terms, with a 5 per cent reduction in domestic manufacturing over the past decade. This has had a flow-on impact on Australian jobs. With a new record low of fewer than 850,000 people employed in manufacturing by the end of last year. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Nationals are here and we have a plan. Regional Australia is the engine room of the Australian economy and we will continue to lead the way. It is through the can do attitude of hard working, visionary Australians that regional Australia accounts for more than 60 per cent of Australia's existing exports. Our plan, uh, released during January, will protect strategic industries, will increase trade promotion efforts and grow exports, will provide accessible access to finance and capital for those wanting to enter and grow uh, manufacturing efforts, support a Buy Australian policy, get people into trades and harmonise qualifications and employment conditions, and invest in reliable and affordable energy and the strategic infrastructure that supports Australian manufacturing. Over the last 12 months, I've met with manufacturers right across Australia via Zoom, obviously, last year, and on-site visits recently to the Hunter uh, and the Northern Rivers in New South Wales. And I've heard what they've had to say. I've heard how we can actually support these brilliant local businesses to grow their potential, reach new heights and employ more people locally. And there, whilst there are particular issues specific uh, to each region, the, some of the messages have been clear and consistent. They're, not, they're ready to expand. They want to help more Australians buy Australian products. They're very passionate about having um, Australian-made products on the shelves uh, ready for Australians to buy and online. They want to employ Australians, very much so, and in, uh, support the growth and development of their communities. And they also need strong government, state and federal, to help them, a government that backs them and their vision for their local business and their industry. How many pairs of iconic RM William boots do we see walking the halls of parliament? And I had the opportunity to bump into the former Shadow Minister for Agriculture, uh, Ed Husick. Hadn't quite got around to buying his pair of RMs before he was moved on. Uh, but another great champion uh, in the Labor Party of uh, Regional Australia, uh, a, a man that I often find myself agreeing with, uh, Joel Fitzgibbon, does own a few pair of the iconic RM Williams brand. The Australian bootmaker is expanding. Obviously, it's National Party um, you know, uniform for us to have multiple pairs. Uh, but how many pairs of iconic RM Williams boots that we do see here in Parliament and right across Australia, particularly out in the regions, it's great to see that they're expanding their factory and bringing manufacturing uh, of that iconic product back home. Other manufacturing businesses want to do the same. They want to expand and grow. Recently, the Business uh, Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals and the HunterNet Cooperative invited myself and Senator Perrin Davey to the Hunter Valley in New South Wales so we could better understand the opportunities and challenges that they face. We're also, I was also able to visit uh, cooperative food manufacturers in the beautiful northern uh, rivers region uh, with BCCM again to learn about their business ambitions and how government policies can support them, everything from cooperative man macadamia uh, processes, blueberry farmers and obviously um, milk and uh, beef processing operating within cooperative structures. All uh, high-tech, advanced food processing manufacturers that want to grow uh, and succeed. And last week, uh, in Sawtill in New South Wales, North Coast, I also was able to meet with foresters in Coffs Harbour with uh, the National Party member for Cowper, uh, Paddy Conahan. All great sm uh, small and medium enterprises, all family businesses, uh, and the Australian uh, Forest Products Association, we have some of the most amazing advanced technology uh, being used by these businesses to make sure our sustainably harvested and produced, environmentally sound and principled Australian timber can be turned into beautiful products that we can all be very proud of and be very also proud uh, that it's produced under high environmental standards, that if we import those timber products from other countries, we cannot uh, be as confident uh, in the environmental impact. 
I'm very excited about uh, the work that we're going to be doing as a party uh, and as a Senate team in supporting uh, food and fibre uh, manufacturers going forward into this year. We're also going to be focusing as a, as a group on the EPBC Act review, uh, which severely impacts our foresters uh, and also agricultural and uh, de development opportunities out in rural and regional Australia. In my home state of Victoria, we've got an, a wonderfully strong timber and forestry sector, um, particularly down in Gippsland, but also through the northeast and over in uh, Western Victoria, under attack, I might say, by a state Labor government. Uh, very, very disheartening, I think, to see a once proud party that supported hard-working timber workers are turning their back on those regional communities and on that industry in itself um, you know, to chase green votes in Brunswick. And, uh, I know that's not a view shared by all of the Labor Party colleagues uh, in this chamber, but unfortunately the Labor Party state premier in my home state of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, uh, really wants to see you know, the forestry industry cease. Uh, in our home state, which is uh, very, very sad to see and something we'll be fighting, obviously, at a state and federal uh, level. In Kyabram, we've got Wayne and Peter, uh, David Mulcahy's Kai Valley Dairy Group. It's the largest and leading bulk fresh milk supplier into Southeast Asia, which includes Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, Tatura is the home of the largest Australian-owned producer of cream cheese and infant formula. We've got some great food and fibre uh, processing happening out into the regions, employing hundreds, thousands of Australians. We want to see that grow and prosper. The Nationals want to build our sovereign manufacturing by turning our already abundant primary products into manufactured goods and complex products. Our energy and mineral and agricultural resources are all located out in the regions. We also want those high-tech, uh, sustainable careers in the processing side also located uh, out in the regions, which is why our manufacturing plan uh, 2035 backs the setting up of regional hubs. And I know uh, in the Hunter they're very excited about being identified in our policy as one of the key areas, along with Gladstone, for setting up that regional hub where we can really focus on the already existing capacity in regions like the Hunter and Gladstone for advanced manufacturing of primary products, whether it is our mineral resources, our food or our fibre. That capacity already, that skill set, that passion, that know-how already exists in those regions, and we want to build that going forward. For forward. We want to do it for two reasons, because we believe that we should have a sovereign capacity here located onshore that we control as Australians that is less subject to the vagaries uh, and challenges of overseas trading partners and uh, global unforeseeable circumstances such as COVID-19. But we also want to see those jobs here at home. Uh, we want to reboot Aussie manufacturing. We've got a nine-point plan to do that. We're delivering and we look forward to getting production lines humming right across Australia. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak on a matter of national importance. As the COVID-19 pandemic buffeted the world and severed supply chains across the world, our nation began to realise that years of liberal economic policies and speeches of the kind that we've just heard uh, have done nothing to correct the whittling down of our sovereign capability and, in fact, have left our nation with a depleted manufacturing base. Australians who trusted the three versions of this LNP government since 2013 have been lied to, they've been ripped off and they've been let down. For eight years, this LNP government has been pushing out blue pamphlets claiming they're part the party of jobs and growth, but there's been a steady decline in the number of manufacturing jobs. That hurts. It hurts workers who lost their jobs. It hurts the local economies where they used to spend their hard-earned cash, and it hurts the entire industries, like car manufacturing. But loss of manufacturing also hurts every Australian. It makes us less safe, less able to look after ourselves. And COVID has shown that we cannot, cannot take international trade and movement for granted anymore. Those days are gone. We need to manufacture by ourselves, for ourselves, 
but this government doesn't care for you or your needs as Australians. In my home region of the Central Coast, manufacturing is a vital, important industry, supporting thousands of jobs and helping our region weather the storm of COVID-19. Common sense government policy should be to support manufacturers like those on the coast and indeed in communities right across the country. Any industry minister worth their salt would use the ministerial powers to support domestic industries over foreign competitors. But Minister Andrews is not a common sense minister. In 2015, then Parliamentary Secretary Karen Andrews signed several ministerial exemption instruments that removed removed anti-dumping duties on steel from the People's Republic of China. Given the choice of protecting Australians or letting Chinese dump steel, Karen Andrews chose China over Australia. This is despite near-universal reporting that China was in fact dumping steel on the market. In April 2016, Arium, the major steel producer that ran the Wyala Steelworks in South Australia went into administration, and the Wyala Steelworks was only saved not by this government, not by industry policy, not by Mr Morrison, not by anybody in the LNP, but by workers at Wyala who agreed to large cuts in conditions and pay just to keep it functioning. A subsequent Senate Economics Committee inquiry into Australia's steel industry and the Arium collapse, the Australian steel industry forging ahead report, cited the pressures caused by the influx of dumped and subsidised steel are considerably greater than the normal pressures expected in, natu in naturally competitive markets, creating additional pressures on the Australian steel industry. That very well-researched report tabled in this very parliament also noted that the industry will continue to decline without urgent action by the Australian government to address the issue of unfair import competition. Yet despite 28 recommendations which would have saved jobs and protected Australian sovereignty, the Liberal government's all of the flavours of the three ones that we've already had in the last eight years did nothing. Karen Andrews did absolutely nothing. By 2017, the Australian Workers' Union was reporting that local companies appeared to have lost $200 million in work due to dumping in the previous 12 to 18 months, following Minister Andrews' decision and action to roll back anti-dumping protections. Even today, Industry Minister Karen Andrews has implemented precisely zero, zero of that report's recommendations. Not only have the government failed to respond to the recommendations of the steel industry report, they've lied to Australians about protecting and growing Australian jobs. Morrison's minister, Karen Andrews, has vacated, and, and the, both of them have vacated the space and let the anti-dumping reform process stall over and over. The effect has been at the frustration of the Australian industry. Anti-dumping has been described as a regulatory arms race, and it's in a race. You cannot step off the track. Refinements to laws and methods need to be updated regularly to react to adaptive predatory behaviour by unscrupulous exporters targeting the Australian industry. However, the last substantive anti-dumping reform package that this government brought to the parliament was way back in 2015. Now, as Parliamentary Secretary Andrews in November uh, 2015 put out a media release, and this is what she said back then, while Australia's current anti-dumping system is strong, it must keep pace with industry trends. The government is committed to working with stakeholders over the coming months to identify future reform opportunities to further strengthen our anti-dumping and countervailing system. Well, her commitment was a declaration of a decision to do nothing. What she says and what she's done are completely at odds. Her words mean nothing. Yet the continued charade of consultation and the time that industry has spent on it, thousands of hours consulting with the department on reform options, waiting for years and years for these much-needed reforms. But despite a package being finalised by the department on multiple occasions for the minister and cabinet's consideration, under Minister Andrews and her predecessors, reform has gone nowhere. Recent Senate estimates reveal how careless the government is on anti-dumping, with Minister Andrews slashing funding for the Anti-Dumping Commission for this financial year by 5 per cent and by 13 per cent compared to the funding of the 2016. She's also engaged in a process which has led to the current highly respected commissioner, Mr Dale Seymour, 
a man unrivalled in his knowledge of the anti-dumping system in Australia since becoming the inaugural commissioner in 2013, effectively being forced out of office from the end of this month. Despite the US slapping tariffs on steel imports and the EU enacting emergency safeguards on steel imports, the Australian government has done nothing. Minister Andrews and the MIA, Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, will not even contemplate transferring responsibility for safeguard investigations from the Productivity Commission to the Anti-Dumping Commission, which is best international, pro, uh, pro, um, best international practice. There's not one Australian minister standing up. This government has vacated the field. There's not one front bencher on the so-called Team Australia taking up the industry ball for us. Mr Morrison's Cronulla Sharks jersey in his cap might create the impression that he understands teamwork, but whenever he's been needed to put on the jersey for Team Australia for the Australian industry sector, he hasn't even shown up on it for the training session, let alone made it onto the field for Team Australia. And his industry minister? Well, she's a Karen. And this is all occurring at a time where Australian industry faces unprecedented threats from dumping. As state and federal governments spend billions in infrastructure and housing projects to help the economy recover from the biggest shock since the Great Depression, our domestic demands for steel have become even more vulnerable to cheap dumped foreign steel. Just at this critical moment, when Australian industry requires a responsive trade remedy system and a dedicated minister willing to do everything in the government's power to defend Australian jobs against unfair trade, we are stuck with an industry minister and a prime minister who are paralysed. They have an appalling record. They're asleep at the wheel, leaving manufacturing jobs sitting as a sitting duck to predatory behaviour. Australia needs a local steel industry. It supports regional jobs. It protects our national sovereignty and defence procurement in a time of war. And as the pandemic has shown us, local manufacturing is crucial, crucial when supply lines are disrupted. Australians understand today, here in February 21, what was less obvious to us in February 2020, pre-pandemic. We need to build our own. Australians want to build our own. If you believe in Australian industry and manufacturing jobs, it's only Labor that's going to do the work. Three governments have failed. Three LNP governments have failed to address this critical problem and have failed to save jobs for hardworking Australians. It's a fact that since Karen Andrews became the industry minister, the playing field for Australian industry has become far less level and the results have been dire. According to the latest quarterly figures from the ABS, which came out in November, there were 128,400 fewer jobs in the manufacturing industry. That's a 13.5 per cent decrease. Let's put it another way. A manufacturing job has been lost every four minutes since Karen Andrews became minister. That's two manufacturing jobs since I started speaking because of their failure to act on this critical area. It doesn't need to be like this. I thank the Australian Workers' Union and the CFMEU for their advocacy on behalf of Senator their workers Ernie, because the government has, has abandoned the field. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, thank you Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to talk about the power of big tech and the influence that big tech has on our lives. My teenage daughter is a digital native. She's got a smartphone, she's got a laptop. She has social media. She streams what she wants to watch when she wants to watch it. She can search the answers of almost every question ever asked. She speaks with friends from other sides of the world that she's never met before on a variety of different platforms. She shops, plays and learns online. But almost everything that she does is traced, is part of surveillance and is watched very carefully in order to influence the decisions that she will make next. The data of her footprint online is captured for corporate profit. This influence of big tech companies needs to be taken on. And I know it's radical to suggest that these big tech companies who are so powerful now need to be reined in, but it is exactly what we need to do. 
not just to protect the safety of our children online, but to protect democracy itself. Tech giants aren't working in the public interest anymore. The internet isn't open and free as perhaps it once was. It is now manipulated and controlled by a small handful of big corporations. They watch what we do, they follow what we do, and then they sell what they think we're going to do next. The internet has become an essential part of our lives. We use it for shopping, for healthcare, for accessing information, and to be keeping in touch with friends and family. But it is people who are the product of the big tech platforms. And as users, we have no idea just what information they have on us. We need better regulation. We need openness and transparency. And we need a genuine conversation about creating an open and transparent and public space for what is online. Corporations should never have been allowed to get this powerful. We're in the middle of a debate here in Australia right now about the influence of two big companies, Google and Facebook, because there is a suggestion that one part of what they do would be regulated because of the huge market share they have. And instead of participating in that conversation in a genuine, balanced way, those two big corporations, Google and Facebook, have said they'll pull the plug. They'll withdraw their services. How did it get to a point when corporations this big, who have so much influence and control over our lives, can just say they'll take their bat and ball and go home? If there was ever an example of why we need proper and better regulation in the tech space, online and of these big tech giants, this is it. We need scrutiny of the algorithms that run these services, more rights for users of what data is gathered and how it is used, regulation of hate speech and misinformation, proper taxation of companies that are making billions and billions of dollars from the users that are simply accessing this service as an essential part of their daily lives, and these companies are collecting this data and selling it to advertisers. Platforms would have you believe that they're simply an independent third party. They're the road that you take to get from A to B. But of course, everything along that road is collected, is sold, and you don't even know which parts of your journey are being traced and who that information is going to. It is your data and it should be your choice. It should be up to the Australian people, the individual user, to decide what is traced, sold, who should profit from it and for what purpose. It is time that we actually had a genuine open conversation about how big and powerful these companies have gotten. Technology is an, Im is an important element of how we have developed and how we're going to deal with the challenges of the future, particularly in a time of global change, dealing with climate change, environmental destruction, and trying to bring the world together uh, rather than divided. But if we are to do that, democracies need to be protected. Technology needs to be set amongst rules that are fit for the community and not just for corporations. We need oversight of social media and the mechanisms and mechanisms in place to ensure that they are responsible for the information that is promoted and used. It is unthinkable that in the time of a global pandemic that we have some companies making money off the promotion of misinformation that could put people's health at risk. 
It is unthinkable that some people can post in positions of power and responsibility misinformation about health advice and not have to be held accountable for it. We need to prevent the spread of misinformation and hate speech online. Facebook has become a platform where people get more likes and more friends and more shares. The more outrageous they are, the more hateful they are. Is that good for the rest of democracy? Is that good for social cohesion? Is that good for community? What rules and practices do we need to put in place to make sure that these spaces that have become quasi-public, the new town square, are regulated in the same way that it would be if it was offline? These conversations are happening not just here in Australia but around the rest of the world. But the big underlying element of all of this is what we do as users, how that information is collected, who owns it and where it goes. Big tech companies have been able to make huge profits and become incredibly powerful. It's time to regulate them in the public interest so that Everyday people can take back control over the decisions they make, where their information goes and who they share it with. There's a lot of impressive people working in this space. It's time for us as politicians, as thought leaders, as government members to not be afraid of these big companies, not be afraid of taking on these monopolies but instead look at what are the solutions. And it may be that some of these companies are way too big and need to be broken up. They have such a monopoly that they are distorting the market. It may be that government needs to invest in genuine services for the public good, social media platforms that are run independently and for the public for the community, search engines that are there to give people information, not to sell data to advertisers. But whatever the solution is, it must involve proper rules and regulation that are fit for the world that we live in today fit for ensuring that the online space is safe, is open, is transparent and is accessible to all people. If it's good enough in the local park, it should be good enough online. If it's good enough in the town square to have rules and social norms, then it shouldn't be so hard to expect that of corporations and businesses to behave appropriately, to be honest and open with the community online too. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to take this time uh, here in the Senate today to address uh, an issue that is going on in my home state, in my home city of Perth right now. Uh, what we're seeing in the eastern suburbs of Perth uh, is a very, very serious fire uh, that is uh, ravaging uh, quite large uh, stretches of land and, sadly, uh, properties as well. Uh, we've seen reported uh, so far uh, to 71 properties have been destroyed as a result of this uh, terrible fire that's been burning for about three days now. Uh, the disappointing uh, news is that uh, the, fire, uh, the weather conditions are expected to be catastrophic and continue for a further three days. Uh, so this is, a, of course, a very alarming and concerning uh, incident that is occurring in Perth right now 
as we speak. And so I just wanted to take uh, this time uh, to bring a few messages, but also to thank uh, those that are involved uh, right now in dealing with this uh, very serious emergency. Uh, this fire is occurring in the uh, eastern suburbs of Perth. Uh, it's uh, sort of started up in the hills and has moved east, uh, westwards with a very strong easterly behind it uh, down into the foothills. Uh, it's in the shires of Mundaring, Northam and the cities of Swan. Now, for those that are not familiar with Perth and have seen uh, where these areas are, some of it is, is, is heavily uh, wooded areas, uh, heavily forested areas, uh, and then there's sort of peri-urban areas where, where beautiful homes have been built among these idyllic uh, locations. But it's actually moving into uh, the, the suburbs of Perth. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just in these peri-urban uh, or, or even rural areas. Uh, so it's a very serious incident that, is, uh, that our emergency services in Western Australia are dealing with right now. Um, residents of Perth uh, are not only dealing with the impact of this fire, but they're of course dealing right now with uh, lockdown as a result of a uh, COVID pandemic and a case that's occurred in Western Australia. I, I must stress for, for anyone that, that may actually be listening and you're wondering what, uh, if you're in these areas, uh, because you've been asked to isolate and quarantine at home, it certainly does not mean that you can't leave your home if uh, you've been directed to do so uh, if you're in the, the, the face of this emergency. Um, what I would simply ask is that people continue to wear their masks as they relocate uh, somewhere safe. So um, you don't need to um, stay in your home. Um, if you've been directed to leave, uh, you should leave and, uh, and you should uh, go and isolate uh, in somewhere where it's safe. As I said, I'm uh, saddened to hear that the conditions uh, are actually going to worsen over the day. Uh, 70 kilometre hour winds uh, are now uh, flanking this fire and pushing the fire towards the housing estates uh, right there on the edge of Perth. 71 homes have been lost and I can't imagine what sort of impact that must be for those families. Uh, read uh, on the front page of the West Australian newspaper today of a a mother and a daughter who had to uh, protect themselves by going into their swimming pool as they watched their home burn. Uh, that must have been a, an absolutely horrific scene. A home that they'd built about 20 years earlier, now destroyed in front of them. Uh, there are no words that could be offered to provide uh, the kind of support that would be needed. Uh, but Myself, and I'm sure I'd be joined by Senator Brockman as he joins me here in the chamber, uh, do express our sincerest uh, condolences and support to those that have lost, uh, lost their homes and lost property. The Australian government is uh, doing all that we can uh, to support the West Australian government and the services that are operating there to protect these homes and to deal with this fire. Uh, the uh, Minister for Defence uh, organised for a, uh, a large uh, air tanker to be sent over filled with retardant, fire retardant that can then be used uh, to supply the uh, smaller uh, planes that are, that are actually involved in the, in the extinguishing of this fire or the, the dealing of this fire. Uh, that was initiated uh, very, very quickly and on the advice or on the request of the state government and we gave them absolutely everything that was required. Uh, the other thing that has happened uh, today is Minister Littleproud has uh, announced that uh, residents that have been impacted by this fire uh, are able to access a uh, $1,000 uh, per adult and $400 per child disaster recovery payment. Uh, and this money will be available from 8 a.m. tomorrow through Services Australia through Centrelink. Now, I really want to stress. Um, you know, these are very proud people that live uh, in Western Australia and certainly in these areas. And, and I know many of them would feel that you know, they may not necessarily uh, need or, or want uh, uh, you know, any kind of handout like this. Uh, but let me say, uh, 
there, of course, are some uh, immediate issues that need to be dealt with, you know, supplies that you might need. Um, there is no shame in accessing this payment at all. Uh, Australians stand with you. This government stands with you if you've been affected, and uh, you know, we encourage you to make use of this payment that is available, this disaster recovery payment. Uh, it will be in your bank account straight away, and it will just be there just to help tide you over with a few of the immediate necessary things that would be required to help you deal with this present situation. So the government is, uh, is doing what we can and we're responding to those requests that come from the West Australian government. If, of course, there are more requests that come through, uh, I've got no doubt, I've got no doubt that the relevant ministers and indeed our Prime Minister will do everything uh, within our power to support these communities. Um, th this, of course, is a, is a very challenging time for Western Australia. Uh, whether you're caught up in lockdown due to COVID or you're dealing with these bushfires, um, it is, of course, a, a, a very serious uh, incident that is occurring. And I'll just encourage everyone to do what they can to, to stay safe, whether you know, you're a long way from the fires and you're just dealing with, uh, with the COVID situation and doing uh, what you've been asked to do, which is to stay home if you can. And, if you're needing to go out to get groceries and such things, so you wear your mask. And, and it's great to see the reports that are coming through where people are doing everything they can. And uh, the compliance uh, with these orders, uh, with these requests, is, is from what we're hearing. Uh, obviously, we're over here in Western Australia, uh, sorry, in, in Canberra, and not, not there present uh, with the community, which is, you know, I think Senator Brockman would agree, is a, a strange feeling, um, not being able to be there right now with our community. But we're doing what we can from here to support our communities. Uh, but it's really good to see the way that West Australians are, are rising to the challenge. And no doubt you know, the, 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 the generosity uh, of West Australians will come through over the next few days. And I encourage uh, you know, every Australian to consider, as the calls get put out for, for donations, uh, to be able to help people that are dealing with the impact of this fire. Uh, I've got no doubt that West Australians, and indeed uh, all Australians will, will rise to the challenge in, in the way that West Australians rose to the challenge in helping to raise funds uh, and supporting communities that were impacted by last summer's uh, bushfires. Uh, West Australians, I was very proud to see, uh, as a West Australian, those, uh, that, that support that went into the eastern states while we looked on to the challenges that were going on uh, in, um, uh, in the eastern states while um, you know, we went through a relatively trouble-free uh, bushfire season in Western Australia last year. I had a fire uh, just down the road from my house. Um, there were two of them that occurred over a week. Um, thankfully, uh, no property or serious amounts of property were, were damaged. Uh, but I got to see you know, firsthand, uh, literally 500 metres or so from my house uh, where we live, I got to see firsthand the uh, the, the tremendous effort that is put in not only by career firefighters and of course police and other emergency services but it, indeed of, of all of the volunteers uh, that, that step up at times like this and uh, we just want to say I just want to say uh, thank you very much you are you are heroes you are incredibly brave and we appreciate uh, all that you do uh, particularly when you're putting your lives in danger Senator Sheldon Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Last week, Uber Eats made an announcement, an announcement that we would be making significant changes to their business model. Those of us concerned with the impacts of the growing gig and on-demand economies on the Australian workforce, of course, were curious to hear what those changes would be. Now, we've seen five, the deaths of five delivery workers in the past few months. Maybe the company has decided to step up, I was thinking, and take responsibility for providing occupational health and safety training, ensuring safety of its workforce. Maybe after the election of an American president who is actively promoting the empowering of workers as a pathway to economic justice, this US-based company was going to begin working with workers' representatives and give them a seat at the table. Or maybe I thought after the years of complaints from restaurants and delivery workers, the company was going to turn a new leaf 
and begin a process of ending the exploitation of both. Well, did any of this happen? Of course, fat chance. Instead, Uber Eats has made it abundantly clear that it has no intention of improving the lot of riders and drivers. They are upending their business model, no longer carrying on with a false pretense that they are some sort of matchmaker between restaurants and delivery workers. From the first of next month, Uber Eats will now be directly engaging delivery workers as contractors, issuing new contracts. The intention of these contracts is to absolve Uber Eats of any responsibility for riders or drivers for death or injury while working for the company, and to continue to pay them any sum that that company seems and deems fit at any given moment of the day by simply a change to the algorithm. In black and white, it sets out that Uber Eats can unilaterally terminate or deactivate. Lovely language, isn't it? Deactivate. You know, we're talking about human beings that are trying to make sure they can put food on their table, lowly paid, paid below the minimum wage. And of course, when the algorithm says they've stepped out of line, they've been five minutes late, or there was a complaint that was never double checked certainly not checked by a human being, that they get deactivated. Your income's taken off you. You're thrown on the scrap heap. You have nowhere to go. Well, these contracts included clauses spelling out a, a, a treaty against any worker who engages in conduct that has the potential to cause regulatory scrutiny. Well, after strong opposition from groups like the Transport Workers Union and many riders, Uber has dropped that sh this shameful clause. However, Uber has made it clear. If you work for them, you must remain silent. This is a company that wants to gag its workforce, terrified of, being, terrified of having to treat its workers with the rights to collectively bargain, to have minimum rates of pay or adequate standards of safety or a voice at work. And yet, I do not hear a single defence from freedom of speech from the other side. Where are the Liberals and Nats who fight for the rights of right-wing columnists to spread misinformation but refuse to stand up for the rights of workers at Uber Eats to use their freedom of speech? Where are, sen where are senators like Senator Bragg who champion the supposed liberal value of freedom only to remain silent while Uber Eats is attempting to bully its workforce into silence? I think that's more like freedom to be ripped off, is Senator Bragg's catch call. That these contracts come after the tragic string of deaths last year is a kick in the teeth to delivery workers, their friends, their colleagues, their family and our community. And it's in the midst of their grief that they had to take the courageous action to step up and make their voices heard. And how does Uber Eats respond? They have made it abundantly clear we are not responsible for you, and if you speak out, your account will be deactivated. This is the desperate actions of a company afraid that their paper-thin argument that its workers are not employee-like will soon be subject to either judicial decision or regulatory response. Last year, in a case merely, con merely connecting people, was torn apart by justices presiding over the legal case. The justice presiding made a number of telling comments, I quote, in cross-examining and making comment on Uber's evidence. Everybody knows what function Uber plays. The restaurant's function is to prepare the food. Uber's function is to deliver the good. Isn't that right? And in response to the legal arguments prepared by Uber to that question, he goes further to say, well, we actually operate in the real world here, the judge said. Judgments are practical things, especially in this context. This is not a debating club. Of course, afraid of the implications of losing, Uber was left with no choice but to settle that case. They chose to settle the case and now redoing their business model in an attempt to avoid any future judicial decision that might see workers, treat, workers treated with employee-like rights. Heaven forbid, paid the minimum wage. With rights and conditions, the rights and collective bargaining, their labour and their freedom speak out as an issue that matter to them and the workforce. But who, who can be surprised by the actions like their actions? 
This is a company that has been caught in the past spying on its clients, oftentimes on politicians or activist journalists that have been subject to lawsuits for lying to its drivers about rates of pay or for underpaying them entirely, or one in which the corporate offices have been revealed as hotbeds of sexual harassment and discrimination. Uber's decision comes at a time of great change for this industry. Australia's largest states are moving towards regulation. This week we have heard that while the federal government defers, the Federal Labor Party is committed to regulating this Wild West industry. I want the workers on the gig economy to know that they have a friend in Federal Labor. These workers making ends meet while at the mercy of uncountable algorithms driven by reckless greed deserve better from the federal government. Why don't they deserve better safety at work? Why don't they deserve dignity in retirement afforded to them through superannuation? Why don't they deserve the ability to collectively bargain and organise for their rights and their conditions? What is so special about being employed by a NAP that you be denied the basic rights of any worker? What is so special about the gig economy, so innovative, that this government thinks that these workers deserve nothing. Well, the future of work is here right now. What's happened in food delivery and in transport is already happening in aged care and in the NDIS, at times aided, abetted and funded by the government departments overseeing these industries. This is not a corner of the Australian or global workforce that cannot be disrupted by models like the pushed by Uber Eats. If, we, begin, if we, we do not begin to regulate it now, establish fair and safe rates of pay, conditions and afford, afford, that afford dignity, and establish rights to collective organise, then the present and future of work will remain bleak. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just on a year ago, I embarked on a series of speeches in the Senate that aimed to put the spotlight on Australian business people who, in various ways, have an impact on Australian society, economics and politics. The person I wish to speak about today has had a prominent career. However, outside of Australia's political, business and academic elites, he is little known to most people. Dr Jeff Raby is an Australian economist, former diplomat and business adviser. He has uh, been seen as one of Australia's best and brightest. He has enjoyed a stellar career. Dr Raby is a graduate of La Trobe University with, uh, with bachelor's and master's degrees and a PhD in economics. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the 1980s. He rose rapidly through the ranks. He worked at Australia's embassy in Beijing, served as head of DFAT's Northeast Asia Analytical Unit led the Trade Negotiation Division before becoming our ambassador to the World Trade Organisation. Dr Raby then headed up DFAT's International Organisations Division, served as ambassador to, to the APEC Forum before becoming a DFAT secretary from 2002 to 2006. This impressive diplomatic career was capped when uh, Dr Raby served as Australia's ambassador to China from 2007 to 2011. At that time, as Raby has described it, Australia on a quote, enjoyed almost unrivalled access to top Chinese leadership, high-level visits were frequent and engagement was expanding exponentially on every front. Dr Raby was tipped as a future DFAT secretary, but those ambitions were not fulfilled. Instead, on completion of his ambassadorial term, he abruptly resigned from the diplomatic service and established Jeff Raby & Associates, a Beijing-based a business advisory firm. There were some who questioned the propriety of an ambassador walking out of his office and immediately setting up a lobby shop in the capital where he had just represented this country. Undoubtedly, the lure of the lucrative Chinese market was very strong. Jeff Raby and Associates, uh, Associates appear to have enjoyed some success in the boom times of the Australia-China relationship. In the 2009-19 Queen's Birthday Honours, Dr Raby was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for, and I quote, distinguished service to Australia-China relations through senior diplomatic roles 
and to multilateral trade policy development. Now, Dr Raby has been a, con a frequent contributor to public debate on foreign policy, especially Australia-China relations. He has long been a leading advocate for deeper economic ties between Australia and China and for Australia to accommodate and adapt to China's rising power and influence. And as tension between Beijing and Canberra has grown, he has been increasing, increasingly critical of Australian government policy and those who are concerned about China's regional ambitions, Chinese espionage and Chinese political in interference and human rights abuses. As early as May 2018, Raby penned an opinion piece claiming that Australia's relations with China could only improve through the sacking of the then Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. In October 2019, Dr Raby delivered the annual La Trobe University China oration. He asserted that what he called the China threat is much exaggerated both as a military adversary and as a challenge to Australia's domestic institutions. Dr Raby has elaborated uh, views in a book in which he makes a sharp critique of Australia, uh, Australian policy towards China and offers what he claims to be a realistically but relatively benign view of, of China's ambitions and capabilities. Dr Raby believes that Australia won't be taken seriously if we can't manage relations with Beijing, that we're too close uh, to the US and uh, that we should avoid too sharp a criticism of the Chinese Communist regime and its human rights abuses. Now, Dr Raby is free to express his views. We need open and diverse debate on our relations with China, something that will uh, be our most difficult international challenge for years to come. That said, it should be noted that Dr Raby's views have often been quoted by the ultranationalistic propaganda mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist regime with the likes of the Global Times welcoming him his, his critiques of Australian policy, albeit selectively, they like what he has to say. Moreover, it's worth highlighting the business context of Dr Raby's contribution to foreign policy debate. Jeff Raby and Associates, Associates was deregistered in 2016. Much of his business activity was, uh, now appears to be focused on directorships in enterprises that include Legend Media Group, a Chinese-focused entertainment and media company, and Ocean Gold Corporation, a multinational gold mining company. Most significantly, since June 2012, Raby has served as a director uh, with Yan Coal, the big Chinese-owned coal producer that operates mines across Australia. Yan Coal Australia is indeed Australia's largest pure coal producer. It's a highly profitable company that operates and manages mines across New South Wales, Queensland and Western Australia. The largest shareholders in Yanko are Shandong-based Yan Zhao Coal, with a 62 per cent holding, and Cinder International, a Hong Kong-based investment company, with 16 per cent. Yan Zhao Coal is now owned by Yan Quan Group, the fourth largest coal mining-owned enterprise in China. Yanko is thus majority owned by the Chinese state. Yang Ko's board includes five Chinese directors, including uh, Chairman Bao Kai Zhuang, uh, who also represents Yan Quan Group, and one other Chinese director who represents Cinder International. There are three Australian directors, Greg Fletcher, a, a former senior partner with Deloitte, Helen Gillies, a legal and risk management expert, and Dr Raby. In March 2019, Dr Raby appropriately registered with the Australian Government's Foreign Influence Transparency Register regarding his position as a director of Yanko. Uh, Dr Raby worked with Yanko for nearly nine years. That's significant because in that time, Yanko has emerged as one of Australia's top corporate income tax dodgers. The extent of Yanko's aggressive tax minimisation is made clear by the Australian tax officers corporate income tax transparency reports. Between 2013 and 2014 and 2018-19, Coal generated $16.6 billion in, in revenue. Remarkably, they declared just $26 million in income tax, tax on taxable income. Uh, over those six years of activity, as the coal price skyrocketed, Yang uh, Coal paid no corporate income tax at all, not a cent. Just how Yang Coal managed this is a complex story, but as investigative journalist Michael West has shown, 
It's in line with the aggressive tax minimisation practices employed by many foreign mining and energy companies operating across Australia. There's the so-called Singapore uh, hub corporate structures, hundreds of millions of dollars of payments to related parties. As of 2017-18, $1.5 billion in loans from associated co uh, companies at rates of up to 7 per cent, and some $200 million in other co uh, corporate uh, costs paid to associates. Yankel has had $1.3 billion banked in tax losses to offset against future profits. It's also noteworthy that, as the recent reports by the Centre of Public Integrity show, that over the past 20 years Yanko shelled out over $2 million in political donations, in spite of a published code that says it's against company policy to use corporate funds for political purposes. That's right, no corporate income tax paid, but plenty of dollars to buy political influence. This is essentially a colonial-style mining operation, a foreign-owned and controlled enterprise stripping out wealth while paying back uh, an absolute minimum, if anything, to the community. Jeff Raby knows quite a bit about this sort of operation. He once wrote a book on Australia's colonial economic history. Now, in the latter part of, of his career, he's embraced a new colonial relationship where a Chinese-owned state enterprise makes handsome profits and feeds China's industrial expansion while uh, paying not a cent in corporate in income tax in Australia. Dr Raby has properly registered as a foreign agent, but in doing so he should have described himself as what he is, just a front man, a paid operative selling his influence and credibility to foreign corporate tax dodgers. It's a sad postscript to a distinguished career, and it's uh, the context in which Raby, Dr Raby's commentary on our relationship with China should be viewed. Perhaps the next time an Australian university or think tank contemplates inviting Dr Raby to give an address, rather than asking for his views on high diplomacy, they might ask him to justify his involvement in one of Australia's biggest corporate tax dodgers. Thank you. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. The last 12 months has illustrated the importance of self-reliance. When a country cannot rely on itself, then its sovereignty is jeopardised. In his political masterpiece, The Prince, Nikolai Machiavelli writes, wise princes have always shunned auxiliaries and made use of their own forces in the belief that no true victory is possible with alien arms. Mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous. If the prince bases the defence of, of his state on mercenaries, he will never achieve stability and security. At the time of writing, Machiavelli was lamenting the downfall of Italian states, which in his opinion had been caused by the reliance placed on mercenary troops for so many years. Australia today in many ways resembles Machiavelli's Italy. We rely on foreign auxiliaries for so many of our core responsibilities—defence, capital, labour and manufacturing. The fake meme of an Australian soldier on Twitter last year showed why we can never trust foreign companies to defend our national interests if it is against their vested interest. Self-reliance is the bedrock of sovereign independence. It is my view that there is too much focus on trade and not enough focus on production. While trade is obviously important for a country like Australia, it is no substitute for the ability to control our means of production. In the same way the horse comes before the cart, production must always come before trade. What is the point of generating wealth if it is to end up in an offshore bank account? There is no future for our children if they cannot control the means by which wealth is generated and, more importantly, do not know how to generate the wealth in the first place. True liberty is the ability to stand on your own two feet and not have to depend on others. If Australia is to remain a truly sovereign nation and not become a vassal state of multinational corporations, we must ensure control of our wealth and be responsible for the tasks that underpin any nation's sovereignty, in particular our infrastructure that provides essential services to Australians. I've spoken about this many times before. Infrastructure built and paid for by Australian taxes should be controlled by Australians. To those that say Australia has always relied on foreign capital, I say think again. As the words of our national anthem state, it is wealth for toil, 
not wealth for foreign debt. Using foreign debt to fund our way of life only begets more debt and with it the loss of control over our nation's wealth and the high standard of living that comes with it. Ultimately, debt becomes slavery and we owe it to our children not to enslave them with the burden of debt. Few people seem to understand that borrowing from offshore drives up the Australian dollar as foreigners swap their currencies into Australian dollars before lending those very dollars back to us. This is counterproductive for Australian industry, as the higher dollar makes it harder to export goods and easier to import goods. As a sovereign nation, Australia has the sovereign right to issue its own credit against our untapped wealth. It does not need to outsource this responsibility to foreign central banks by taking on foreign debt. Australia has the sovereign rights to the rainfall, to the sunlight, to the materials and the toil that is needed to produce its own goods and services. From an accounting perspective, those sovereign rights are already equity. So why give up title over that wealth in exchange for a mortgage that enslaves our children? The quantitative easing being pursued by the RBA should focus on building infrastructure to increase production rather than consuming foreign goods. It is time that the RBA and the Foreign Investment Review Board put an end to foreign companies turning up with a truck full of free cash supplied by foreign central banks to steal our infrastructure. The same goes for foreign labour. The skills shortage in Australia is not yet another threat to our sovereignty. And it's not just fruit picking. Boilermakers, diesel mechanics and various other trades are in short supply. It is a sad indictment of our over-reliance on foreign labour that Australia, a first world country, has to rely on skilled labour, especially doctors, from developing countries. As the saying goes, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. There is no better way to learn than being in an actual job. Yet today Australia is determined to send all of our children off to, off to university when in fact many of them would be better off doing a trade. Too many young people are graduating from university with massive debts but no employment prospects in their studied profession, while business have to import labour to fill skills shortages. While education is important, we should remember the saying, those that can do and those that can't teach. In recent decades, higher education has become driven by profit and ideology rather than skills and productivity, and it is our children who have suffered for it. Our skills base is further eroded when corporations offshore, jo offshore jobs further jeopardising our sovereignty. Australia has seen too many of its corporations move their head offices offshore. BHP and Rio are just two of the many that have moved offshore despite the fact that most of their wealth is generated here in Australia. In the main, this is driven by our Tax Act, which encourages the offshoring of both labour and profits. This has had a devastating impact on our industries, especially manufacturing. Multinational corporations are the mercenaries of the 21st century. The threats by Google over the Australian government's desire to tax news content is just one of the many examples of how these corporations act with undemocratic belligerence to undermine our sovereign rights. Our tax treaties work against the national interest, allowing foreign en entities to transfer their profits offshore at a lower rate than the onshore tax rate has gifted them a competitive advantage to the detriment of Australian industries and jobs. Withholding tax taxes on profits need to lift in order to reduce the arbitrage between profits retained in Australia and profits sent offshore. Too much of our wealth is being transferred offshore. And finally, any discussion about sovereignty shouldn't ignore the Commonwealth First Tasmania High Court case that put the rights of international treaties above those of state governments. The Constitution says that the federal government has the power to make laws with respect to external affairs. Can somebody please explain to me how dam building is an external affair? It isn't. It's a domestic affair. 
You can't tell me that protectionists like Deakin and Barton, Barton had dams in mind when they inserted the external affairs powers into the Constitution. This decision needs to be overturned. Australia, as a small isolated country in the South Pacific, must put national self-interest in front of vested interests driven by false ideologies. We should not be a servant to trade, but are rather a master of production. Or, like so many states before, it will fall to mercenaries who are only loyal to their vested interests. To achieve this, we must rewrite our international treaties, especially our tax treaties, control the flow of capital that controls our borders, that crosses our borders, and teach our children trades rather than just ideologies. Australia should hear the, heed the words of Lord Palmerston when he said, we have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are internal and perpetual, and those interests are our duty to follow. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy uh, President. And before I uh, start my contribution, uh, here today, I would like to um, just take up one point of uh, Senator Rennick's uh, contribution, and that is about teachers. Here we have a former teacher right here, uh, is Senator uh, O'Neill, who is a very good teacher. And I also would like to say, on behalf of all teachers out there, um, I'm sure they can, Senator Rennick. Um, <laughs> I want to draw. I want to draw to the Senate's attention uh, to the plight of Tasmania when it comes to the attention of this government, the Morrison government, because it has become sadly clear that Tasmanians are being overlooked and left behind by Mr. Morrison. There are a litany of broken promises, job opportunities missed and people and businesses doing it tough, who have been abandoned and left behind by this Prime Minister. It's become a story of a flood of dollars for mates on the mainland, compared with a trickle of cents for those in need in Tasmania. When it comes to his own backyard, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, had no difficulty in finding the funds, the money needed to build the second airport in Sydney. Off the back, mind you, and I, I know the um, at, Madam Acting Deputy President will know this, as she is from New South Wales, but off the back of a dodgy land deal. Mr Morrison has no trouble splashing cash on his mates, but when it comes to investing in or supporting jobs in Tasmania, all we get is spin and re-announcements with next to no substance. In fact, the Liberals have repeatedly dangled projects like a new bridge across the Tamar in front of Tasmanians. Yet, time and again, budget after budget, they have failed to stump up any substantial investment to actually deliver on their promises. Shame. It's all smoke and mirrors. And I'm glad Senator uh, Dunham uh, is in the chamber because I know he knows only too well how in this is spot on. It is all about stunts and re-announcement and spins. Promises left unfilled and opportunities missed because this government repeatedly leaves Tasmanians off the map. It's a, it's a speech you should be given because you know it's correct, Senator Dunham. Order. So order. If you, Could I please ask senators to direct their comments, for, not a talk across the chamber? Yes, thank you. Uh, my apologies, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tasmania is well behind the eight ball in the development of a clean energy hydrogen production and export industry at Bell Bay, because this government and this Prime Minister are long on rhetoric and short on actual delivery. Absolutely. They failed 
to make a commitment towards this important new industry for northern Tasmania at the last election. And whilst they like to make supportive noises, and as they have done in the past on many um, projects, they make the noises, they, they talk about support, but they have continued to fail when it comes up to stumping up any actual investment. This failure has real-world tangible impact. We have the potential, with the right investment from the federal government, to create well-paid, secure, decent manufacturing jobs in northern Tasmania, but this government and this Prime Minister simply aren't interested. When it comes to rorting taxpayers' money and securing dodgy land deals for mates in his own backyard, this Prime Minister can't sign up quickly enough. But when it comes to actually investing in creating jobs in further uh, in places like Tasmania, he's nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen. And Tasmania desperately needs more jobs. Good jobs. Secure jobs. Jobs with higher wages. Because with higher unemployment and lower wages, a greater proportion of people and businesses in Tasmania are reliant on JobKeeper and JobSeeker than the nation as a whole. Yet next month, Mr. Morrison's gov Mr. Morrison, this government is proposing to abandon these people and businesses by ending JobKeeper and axing the coronavirus supplement. The government claims it will have something to announce. We've heard that before, but this is what the government's saying. The government claims it will have something to announce regarding job seeker prior to the end of the, of the supplement. Sadly, for many thousands of Tasmanians who rely on this payment to make, men's, uh, make ends meet and put food on the table are now used to this government stringing them along until the last possible minute. There is no way to give people the certainty they need to help them secure a job. No way to treat people who, through no fault of their own, have found themselves without a job or are not enough hours of work because of the impacts of this pandemic. We also know that many tourism, travel, creative and events businesses and workers in these industries are continuing to struggle with, with international borders set to remain closed for some time and the continuing impact of capacity restrictions. Just this week, the Tourism Export Council released figures showing that domestic travel has, re has replaced less than 20 per cent of the revenue received from international visitors. In fact, 55 per cent of tourism businesses exposed to the international market will not survive till September without some kind of government support. And yet, as it has done to unemployed Australians, the government has failed to communicate with businesses in the tourism industry that Order, about Senator any Brown, plan. It being 2 p.m., we'll go He's to got questions no idea. without notice. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne will be absent from question time today, Wednesday, 3 February 2021, due to ministerial business. In Senator Payne's absence, I will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, and the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment. Senator Rustin will, invest, will represent the Minister for Women. Senator Cash will represent the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday in question time, the Minister said, and I quote, the confidence that Australians have in the vaccines that we have available is going to be absolutely crucial to the take-up of vaccines across the country and to the protection of Australians, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Are the comments from Mr Craig Kelly assisting or hindering confidence in the vaccines? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for the question. And I would, at the outset, confirm the statement that I made yesterday. I stand by that wholeheartedly. 
Uh, it's, it is an extremely important thing, Mr. President, that Australians have confidence in our national vaccine strategy. Mr. President, uh, I, I, I repeat and reaffirm those statements, and Mr. President, and the and and the the medical and the health advice that we have received from those that are guiding our response to COVID-19 is extremely important, Mr. President, and I can confirm to the chamber, Mr. President, that the Prime Minister has today met with Mr. Kelly, uh, and Mr. Kelly has, in a statement, confirmed that meeting that he met with the Prime Minister this morning, and uh, the Prime Minister has reinforced to Mr. Kelly uh, the importance of enduring public confidence in the government's vaccine strategy, confirming my statement of yes, mis yesterday, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I think it's I think it's I think it's reasonable that the Prime Minister has conversations with his colleagues in this place and uh, and reinforces the Prime Minister's Order. point of view, Mr. President. And as a part of that process, Mr. President, in his statement today, Mr. Mr. Kelly has said, I agreed to support the government's vaccine rollout, which has in, been endorsed by medical experts. And Mr. Kelly has also said, Order. I have also always sought to support. The, su Order. the success of our national public health response during the pandemic, and he believes that the spreading of misinformation can damage the su success of our public health response during the pandemic. So, Mr. President, I, re I, I reinforce, Mr. President, the statement that I made yesterday, particularly in the context of the vaccine rollout for senior Australians, Order. Senator who Colbeck, we all understand time for the are answer the most has expired. Senator, what supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the minister said he was disappointed in, and I quote, completely reckless commentary with respect to the vaccine. Does the minister agree that Craig Kelly continually undermining public confidence in Australia's medical experts and the COVID-19 vaccine is, and I quote, completely reckless commentary? Before I call Senator Colbeck, I, I just uh, remind, urge members to um, also use formal titles. I thought I might have misheard that, if I have my apologies, uh, but please use formal titles of members of the other place. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And yesterday I did condemn the Labor Party's reckless strategy of undermining our order. vaccine Senator, rollout. Senator, Senator Watt, um, order. Senator, Senator Watt, he's been speaking for six seconds, but I'll allow you to raise the point It was order. long enough to know on relevance. The question was clearly about Mr Kelly's comments, not about the Labor Party's comments, and the minister should stick to Mr Kelly's comments. Um, on the point of order, Senator Colbeck. Uh, order, Mr. Senator President, Colbeck on the point of order. Mr President, uh, Senator Watt order. was clearly misquoting what I said yesterday. Uh, clearly misquoting what I said yesterday, order. partially hey. quoting my statements. Sorry, sorry. So Senator, Senator, Colbeck, fully... Senator Colbeck. Well, Senator Wong, with respect, um, I, I, I do grant people some latitude to introduce their point of order before I call them. If the, I, I, was, I was going to ask the minister to come to a point of order, the minute you started saying it was a selective quote, minister, that is, that is not a point of order. Um, but if you wish to raise a point of order on direct relevance, I'm happy to hear it. Or there's a time to debate or answer the question. On the point of order, Senator Watt, I'm not going to rule halfway through the first sentence. Um, a minister being not directly relevant to an answer. The question did contain an extensive quote from the minister. He is allowed to put that quote in context and address the substance of that quotation as well. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and I again repeat that yesterday I condemned the Labor Party's reckless approach to undermining our vaccine strategy. Their commentary is not useful, Mr President. And I repeat Order. the statement that that uh, Senator White has also made Order. repeated today that the, that the strength of our vaccine strategy and the public confidence in our vaccine strategy is absolutely vital to the take-up of vaccine in this country. Mr. President. And that's why the Prime Minister has called Mr Kelly in this morning to have the conversation that he has. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's appropriate. Uh, I don't support anybody who's providing information that undermines the national vaccine strategy we have, Mr. Have, Mr. President, and I have to say, Mr. Kelly is getting more airtime by the publicity given to him by the Labor Party than he is by his own means, Mr. President. It's the Labor Party who is elevating this issue beyond Order, where I Senator believe it Colbeck. should be. Senator, 
Order. Senator Watt is on his feet. Order. Order. Senator Watt is on his feet for a final supplementary question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Kelly has been spreading reckless and dangerous misinformation for months. Why has it taken so long for the Morrison government to tell him to stop? Is keeping Mr. Kelly happy more important than the health and safety of Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The most important thing from this government's perspective, the most important thing from this government's perspective, is the health and safety of Australians and the confidence that Australians have in the vaccine rollout that we will commence very soon, Mr. President. That is the most important thing to this government. That's the most important thing. And so we will continue Order. to do, on the, on the advice of the medical experts, everything that we possibly can uh, to ensure that there is a strong level of pu public confidence in the vaccination program that we are about to roll out and that Australians can, with confidence, take up the vaccine that's going to be provided as a part of that rollout process, Mr. President. That is the most important thing to this government. Uh, and to me, Mr. Order. President, in my ministerial Senator duties. Watt. And that's what we will continue to reinforce, that we have Order a strong, health-based, uh, supported by expert evidence and the great work of our world-class TGA advice to have confidence Order. in the Senator vaccination Colbeck. rollout. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on the devastating situation occurring in Perth right now with the Wurralu bushfire that's burning out of control in Perth's eastern suburbs. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. A bushfire is burning at the emergency warning level in the shires of Mundaring, Chittering, Northam and the city of Swan, 27 kilometres northeast of Perth, an area I know well and love, as I know all Western Australian senators do. The bushfire remains uncontained and out of control. The West Australian Department of Fire and Emergency Services has confirmed that 71 properties at least have been destroyed, and the bushfire has so far burned over 9,000 hectares. I'm advised that no lives have been lost and no one is yet unaccounted for. However, there remains the potential for wind changes, maintaining very unfavourable conditions. We urge everyone to stay aware of their surroundings and follow the advice from local emergency management authorities. While weather conditions have been hampering firefighting efforts, our emergency services personnel are, once again, showing their professionalism and their dedication and their heroism in the face of these extreme conditions. On behalf of Minister Littleproud, on behalf of the federal government and, I know, all senators in this place. I thank everyone who is contributing and working so hard in the firefighting effort to protect these communities and to ensure that there is no loss of life. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Western Australia and with all of our emergency services and, most importantly and most sincerely, with all of those impacted by these horrific fires. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr President, I thank the minister. Can the minister outline what federal support, including ADF assistance, has been made available to support WA authorities with this threat? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President and Senator O'Sullivan. The Australian government has acted swiftly in support of the Western Australian government's response. The Australian government disaster response plan has been activated by Minister Littleproud. He is also activating Australian government disaster payments for those most affected in the Mundaring and Swan gov local government areas. Today, Defence is supporting water bombing operations from RAF Base Pierce, which yesterday same, was in uh, extreme danger. And they're assisting firefighters to move to the fire front. Defence will also fly additional fire retardant from RAF, Rich RAF Richmond to Western Australia. Last year, Defence completed a strategic review of Operation Bushfire Assist to ensure that our support to natural disaster was optimised. Consequential changes are now making it easier for Defence to assist states and territories, and I thank all senators who Order. supported Senator that. Reynolds, a final supplementary question, Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Can the minister update the Senate on Defence's assistance to WA authorities and their COVID-19 response as well? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President and Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, as we are all aware, the West Australian government is fighting not only a COVID-19 outbreak in Western Australia, but also these fires. Yesterday, Defence accepted a request for additional assistance to WA government's COVID-19 response. This support is in addition to the 1,500 ADF personnel still deployed across the country supporting COVID-19 uh, in, in actions in all states and territories. And this includes 150 currently working in Western Australia. So with this uh, addition, 50, staff, 50 additional staff will be based in Perth supporting the West Australian Police conduct vehicle checkpoints in Perth, Peel and the South West region. Vehicle checkpoints are police-led, with ADF providing marshalling and initial assessment of vehicles. And this takes the total of 200 ADF members on task in Western Australia to 200. This includes 93 personnel who are still supporting quarantine compliance measures Order. in Senator seven Reynolds. hotels. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I would seek leave to associate myself and indeed all of my Labor colleagues and particularly my West Australian Labor colleagues with the comments that were just made by the minister, and I would like to seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for a minute, Senator Lyons. Thank you. And obviously, we concur with the thanks to the emergency service workers, um, like Senator Reynolds. I have many friends who live in the area, and it's an area of Perth where you have acreage that meets outer suburban areas. Uh, in fact, a former staff member of mine, Reese, was evacuated um, two nights ago at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, I also uh, want to acknowledge the uh, huge kindness and generosity of the Perth community. There's all sorts of offers of help, as you can imagine. Um, being a, an area of acreage, there's prize horses and other livestock, which um, people all over the metro area are offering to adjust. There's free meals being delivered. And once again, as we saw the Sikh community uh, in the eastern states respond to the fire community, the Sikh community in Bennett Hills, is, uh, who's a suburb that's likely to be threatened, uh, are also out there working. So that uh, generosity, I'm sure, makes all of us as West Australians very proud. And um, I thank the, the minister for the response that uh, the federal government has given. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, I seek leave to uh, associate uh, the Greens with the Minister's comments and to make very short comments as well. Leave is granted. Um, I, I thank the Minister and the Government for the response. I thank every West Australian member in that other place and uh, senators has friends and family that live in the Hills area and live in that area. I certainly do myself. Um, so the Greens are very thankful for the response uh, from the Federal Government and we wish well to every single emergency personnel uh, uh, and people that are currently fighting the fire and defending people's uh, homes and lives. And also our hearts go out to everyone that is affected uh, by this current disaster, given the particular circumstances that Western Australia is facing and the Perth metropolitan area is facing at the moment with the double impact of the COVID lockdown. Um, it is a very stressful time at home in Western Australia, and I thank the government for the response that they are making. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister confirm the Prime Minister has now met face to face with Mr. Kelly? Did the meeting occur today? What did Mr. Morrison say to Mr. Kelly? And what commitments did the Prime Minister get from Mr. Kelly? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, we'll Obviously, uh, obviously, the Prime Minister meets with and speaks with uh, his colleagues uh, on a frequent basis. But I can confirm that he met, as indeed Senator Colbeck has already told the Chamber, uh, that he met uh, with Mr Kelly, the member for Hughes, uh, this morning. Uh, the Prime Minister made clear uh, that the Prime Minister and the government uh, do not support any views that undermine the vaccine strategy, whether made by Mr Kelly or anyone else. Mr President, Mr Kelly has subsequently issued a statement referred to by Senator Colbeck uh, in which Mr Kelly has made clear uh, that uh, he had a meeting with the Prime Minister, that the Prime Minister reinforced the importance of ensuring public confidence in the government's vaccine strategy. Uh, Mr Kelly has stated uh, that he has agreed to support the government's vaccine rollout as endorsed by medical experts. 
and indeed is the government's expectation, uh, and we will continue uh, to advocate strongly for the vaccination rollout uh, to be supported, backed across the Australian community and for Australians uh, to be encouraged uh, to embrace it and to receive those vaccines as and when they are made available according to the targeted strategy that we have developed alongside experts. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This morning, when asked by Ms. Plibersek whether Mr. Morrison agrees with his views, Mr. Kelly said, and I quote, you have to ask the Prime Minister, I don't know. What did the Prime Minister say to Mr. Kelly that he's unwilling to say publicly? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, I've just, I've just outlined what the Prime Minister said to Mr Kelly and what Mr Kelly has put on the public record subsequent to his meeting with the Prime Minister. Now, I have no doubt that, as the Prime Minister has done time and time again, uh, he would reinforce in the other place, in any meeting, the importance of the vaccination strategy and, indeed, the evidence upon which our vaccination strategy Order. is built. It's a $6.2 billion Order. vaccination strategy, Order on Mr. My President. Right and left. A $6.2 billion vaccination strategy that entails four separate purchasing Order. arrangements for 140 Senators million Reddick doses. 140 Senator million doses Senator Wong. of vaccine to be made available to the Order. Australian Senator people. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong on a point of order. I repeat, I'll give Senator Reddick Senator leave Wong, to make statements if he wants Senator to have Wong, them. Please resume Tell us your what you seat. Think. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I was calling both of you to order. Interjections are disorderly, as is responding to them across the table and the chamber. Order. Senator Rennick, that's not helpful as I'm calling Senator Wong to order. Senator White, you've been particularly voluble in the first 20 minutes. I'm going to ask you to take a breath for a while. Senator Birmingham, please continue. Thanks, Mr. President. So the government's position is crystal clear. We have worked alongside our health experts, as we have at every stage of the pandemic, order. in terms of the procurement strategy, the distribution strategy, and our focus. With Senator absolute focus and resolve order. is on Senator seeing Birmingham. that strategy implemented. I'm having trouble hearing Senator Birmingham. Um, not usually a problem Senator Birmingham has. It means there's way too much noise coming from the chamber. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Then, does Mr Kelly's public statement acknowledging the damage of disinformation extend to Mr Kelly removing all content? peddling disinformation from his Facebook, Parler, Telegram or any other social media accounts? Has Mr Morrison asked Mr Kelly to post his statement on his social media to warn his followers of the damage of disinformation? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr, uh, Mr Kelly's statement, uh, as I've referenced, is publicly available. It's publicly available on social media platforms as well. And we expect that Mr Kelly uh, will, uh, will work in the terms and content of that statement. I, order. Senator, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I did directly ask if Mr Kelly would remove the content he's already posted. The minister's that answer provided an answer that he would, in future, not post any news. Se se I asked the minister if he can ask, answer that question. That was the conclusion of your question. Um, if I had a better chance of hearing if I had a better chance of hearing Senator Birmingham, I'd be in a better chance to rule on points of order. So on both sides of the chamber, I ask people to not interject and to not take the bait and respond to interjections. Senator Birmingham. Oh, that was Senator Birmingham was concluded. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small. Order, order. Senator Hughes, please stop. Order. Can people at least pretend and, and, and you know, hold their breath for 10 seconds after I call people to order? I mean, there, wasn't even, there was not even three words out of Senator Hughes' mouth there before the interjection started. It's going to be a long year if that's the case. Senator Hughes, start again, please. Thank you, Mr President. Clock. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is continuing to build a stronger Australia by supporting Australians to undertake an apprenticeship and developing Australia's skilled workforce through its $74 billion jobmaker plan? Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Uh, Mr. President, as we know, the Morrison government is investing in ensuring that Australia has the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Uh, without a doubt, looking at the Morrison government's investments, we have made skills development at the absolute heart of our economic recovery from COVID-19. And in fact, as we now emerge in 2021 from the impacts of COVID-19, we will continue to build on our record of skills reform uh, to support, in particular, new apprentices into training. Two of the signature policies of the coalition governments are the job trainer policy signed with all states and territories, uh, a joint commitment releasing almost 320,000 new low-cost or free training places. The key is in areas of labour market demand into the training space, but also the boosting apprenticeships commencements. Um, it's been a tough year for employers, and the boosting apprenticeships commencements wage subsidy is all about assisting employers to bring a new apprentice or trainee into their workplace. The boosting apprenticeship commencement subsidy it supports employers of any size in any geographic location, in any industry, to sign up a new apprentice with a 50 per cent wage subsidy up to $7,000 a quarter, running through until 30 September 2021. Mr President, there are still nine months of the program to run. And what we've seen to date is over 29,000 employers, and I'm very pleased to say this includes 21,000 small businesses register over 73,760 new trainees or apprentices for the program. This includes bricklayers, 5,600, carpenters and joiners, 4,700 electricians, 4,600 sales assistants, 4,000 automotive electricians and over 3,800 hospitality workers. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's early action through the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy supported small businesses to keep apprentices on the tools and supported small businesses with their cash flow through the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I've just said, we put in place the Boosting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy. That is to bring into the system 100,000 new apprentices and trainees. But of course, when COVID-19 hit, we understood as a government uh, we needed to provide critical support, in particular to small businesses, to keep the apprentices or trainees they already had in training on the job. That was one of the first economic responses that the Morrison government put in place in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy it has now supported more than 58,500 small and medium businesses to keep 117,000 apprentices and trainees in work to date, because that's where we need them on the job. Over 17,000 electricians, 22,000 carpenters, joiners and bricklayers, 5,500 hairdressers. They have all been kept on the job because of the policy that the coalition government, the Morrison government, put in place. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Cash, how will the government's record skills investments support labour market recovery and help Australians find secure work as we emerge from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the skills investment that the Morrison government uh, is putting in place, this is all about generational change, and it will support Australians to get the qualifications and skills they need, importantly, to secure jobs after the pandemic. We want them to train up in areas where we know there is labour market demand. This is, of course, crucial, uh, in particular to supporting job security, economic productivity and quality of life for all Australians. Uh, in relation to the labour market, over the last seven months, we have now seen, or Australians have now seen, 784,500 jobs return to the economy as COVID-19 restrictions have eased. Hours of work have now increased 165 point million, and full-time employment was the majority of employment uh, in terms of jobs growth in both November and December of last year. We know there is a long way to go, but the policies that the Morrison government is putting in place is seeing jobs return Order. to the economy. Senator Cash. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Treasurer and Assistant Treasurer. Minister, as you be aware, there are now over 56,000 registered charities collecting well over $10 billion in donations. However, the secrecy provisions of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Act 
mean that if someone has a complaint against a charity, the complainant isn't permitted to know the outcome. And if the charity is subsequently deregistered, the public has no way of finding out why it was deregistered. Minister, can you advise whether the secrecy restrictions will be lifted in the legislation government is drafting in response to the 2018 legislative review and when you will introduce this legislation? Minister representing the Treasurer and Assistant Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks, Mr President. And I thank Senator Griff for his question. Uh, and indeed, I do understand that the, uh, the review of the ACNC legislation concluded that the secrecy provisions of the Act are overly restrictive and should be amended to allow the Commissioner to disclose information in a wider range of circumstances, including to protect public trust and confidence in the sector. Uh, the review went on to state that uh, the ACNC's inability to make any comment in respect of whether it is or is not undertaking an investigation in respect of a complaint against a registered entity uh, is harmful to the perception of the ACNC as an effective regulator. Uh, the government uh, released its response to the ACNC legislation review on 6 March 2020, I understand, uh, and has agreed to recommendation 17 of the review which will provide the Commissioner with the discretion to disclose information about regulatory activities, including investigations, when it is necessary to protect public trust and confidence in the sector. Uh, the Treasury is currently engaging with the ACNC uh, and will prepare advice for the Minister on how to progress the necessary legislative changes to give effect uh, to that uh, government agreement to the recommendation. Senator Griff, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, uh, there's a difference between giving someone discretion and actually publishing um, um, issues of, uh, for complainants, and I think it's very important that there isn't discretion and it's actually made mandatory. Now, the 2018 review also flagged raising the revenue threshold for a small charity from $250,000 to $1 million, which would give thousands of charities much lower reporting requirements. Do you consider it is appropriate that a charity that receives a million dollars in funding should not be required to provide an annual financial report. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. In relation to, uh, to the first part of, uh, of Senator Griff's supplementary uh, question, there, uh, obviously, discretion, uh, particularly in relation to public um, information about investigations that are underway, um, is, I think, an important factor to strike uh, an appropriate uh, balance to be exercised by the ACNC uh, between maintaining public confidence through the release of information, but also through not eroding public confidence uh, through potentially the release of information prior to investigations reaching a certain point uh, of findings or, uh, or transparency that, uh, that would be helpful to the maintenance of, uh, of public trust. Uh, as I indicated, the government uh, uh, has agreed to uh, the recommendations. I, sorry. I indicated the government's agreed to recommendation 17 of the ACNC review. In relation to, uh, to threshold limits, uh, look, I, uh, I will have to double check uh, the response that has been provided uh, Order, by the government Senator in that regard. Birmingham, time uh, for Senator the Griff, and come back to you. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, just back on discretion. Uh, should there be discretion um, for, a, uh, uh, for a member of the public not to find out why a um, a charity has been uh, deregistered. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Look, uh, in the main, um, I would anticipate uh, that where a charity has been deregistered uh, under the reforms that are being proposed, uh, that should be made public. Uh, there may be elements of uh, of such grounds that uh, that uh, discretion may be applicable for. Uh, but uh, I'm certain the government would be happy to consult uh, as we are drafting the necessary legislative changes with you, Senator Griff, and, uh, and happy to reach out and work in that regard with you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison's government's comprehensive plan to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine to all Australians? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, can I thank Senator Brockman for his question and on indulgence, Mr. President, can I acknowledge the bushfire emergency in uh, Senator Brockman's home state of um, Western Australia in the Perth Hills and advise the Senate that there are two aged care facilities in the area that have their emergency management plans activated 
and are on standby to activate, uh, evacuate as a last resort should that need eventuate. And there's a couple of others that are preparing. And can I uh, acknowledge the staff who have been working around the clock to make sure that the residents of those facilities are kept safe and comfortable? Uh, Mr. President, the vaccination of Australians against COVID-19 will commence later this month, and we are working to ensure a, an orderly rollout to priority groups, which is safe, effective, Mr. President, and well explained. Our rollout strategy will be one of the largest logistic e exercises ever seen in Australia. Our government is investing $6.3 billion in with almost $1.9 billion for medical bodies, logistics companies and general practices and community pharmacies to roll out and administer the vaccine. We expect there will be thousands of sites that will support the rollout, ensuring Australians can access a vaccine regardless of where they live. Mr. President. Australia's world-class primary health workforce will be the cornerstone of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout across the nation. Mr. President, the health workforce, including doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists and many other allied health professionals, have continually risen to the challenges of COVID-19 over the past year. Mr. President, and they will play a pivotal role in supporting the rollout of vaccine to all Australians. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Can the minister outline to the Senate when aged care and disability care staff uh, and residents will be given priority access to the vaccine. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Australia has developed a roadmap based on a phased approach. The purpose of phasing is to identify and make the vaccine available to high-risk Australians first. Our priority, Phase 1A, is being given to aged care and disability residents and frontline staff healthcare workers and quarantine and border workers. Phase 1B, where up to 14.8 million doses will be made available, includes those aged over 70 years. Uh, phase 1B also includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, younger adults with an underlying medical condition or disability, and critical and high-risk workers, including defence police, fire and emergency services. Order. Phase 2A Mr. President, includes adults over, uh, aged over 50, Order. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 18 and other critical Order. and high-risk workers. Senator Colbeck. Um, Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you further explain the phased rollout strategy as part of Australia's COVID-19 vaccine roadmap? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Brockman. Phase 2B covers the, the balance of Australia's adult population. And phase 3, those aged under 16, if recommended. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has provisionally approved the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine for use in Australia. Rollout of the AstraZeneca international dose is being considered by the TGA today. Senator and on track for an early March rollout subject to TGA approval and final shipping confirmation, Mr. President, and that's for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Our compre comprehensive public information campaign will keep Australians fully informed and up to date about the, early, uh, the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines as they become available, including when and how and where to get vaccinated. Senator Hanson Young. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. On October 30 last year, the Government was handed the final report from Professor Samuel, Graham Samuel, which reviewed the adequacy of Australia's environment laws. It was a damning assessment. That was more than three months ago. When will your government respond and implement laws that actually protect our environment and implement an independent watchdog to hold those who trash our environment to account? Those who trash our environment and endanger our wildlife. When will your government act? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young uh, for her question. Uh, indeed, uh, it was our government that commissioned Graham Samuel's review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 
uh, just indeed as it was a coalition government uh, that initially passed the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act back in the Howard government era. Uh, and so this side of politics has a strong track record in terms of uh, the, the passage of and delivery of uh, legislation that provides nation-leading protection in relation to nationally significant areas of environmental protection. And we will respond in an appropriate way uh, to the review of Graham Samuel. Uh, we'll do so in a timely manner. As you know, it was late last year that that report was handed uh, to the government. Uh, we'll do so in a manner where we're conscious of uh, all of the recommendations and findings uh, of Graham Samuel in that review. Uh, those recommendations find areas for strengthening of, uh, of environmental standards in some areas. And they also find evidence uh, that uh, there is excessive uh, bureaucracy or delays that occur in some areas that can be alleviated as well. Uh, and so our government is determined to make sure uh, that in terms of the operation of our environmental laws in Australia, they should operate uh, for the protection of our environment, but they should not unnecessarily act as a handbrake in relation uh, to economic progress and development, and particularly at this time of economic recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it is essential that, uh, that those laws, uh, where possible, also facilitate uh, growth uh, of job opportunities and employment opportunities uh, and avoid wherever possible duplication uh, between Commonwealth laws and state and territory laws or Commonwealth approvals processes and state and territory approvals processes. Uh, and so we will respond uh, to that report uh, and, as appropriate, bring different packages of legislation to the parliament. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The independent reviewer Graham Samuel said in his report, the government should remove the exemption of regional forestry agreements from the EPBC Act and require logging in native forests to be assessed against national environmental standards. Does the government commit to doing this, and when will you do it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. We will respond to, uh, to the report in a comprehensive way, as the government always does. Uh, Professor Samuel made many findings, made many findings in relation to his report, uh, including, uh, including findings in relation to, uh, to forestry. He also made findings uh, in relation uh, to the way in which the EPBC Act operates, as I said, for the environment, but also for business. Uh, we will work alongside stakeholders as we finalise our formal response uh, to the recommendations. Uh, and in fact, uh, I understand that Minister Lee uh, met last week uh, with the stakeholder group uh, to discuss the process uh, and the work around responding to those recommendations. Professor Samuel's uh, work was comprehensive. He engaged extensively across Australia, uh, and so we will make sure we apply a comprehensive approach to responding to that report too. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, Bob Hawke, former Prime Minister Bob Hawke saved the Franklin from damming. Malcolm Fraser saved the whales from whaling. Is this Prime Minister Order. a leader that will save our native forests? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, we will work hard indeed to uh, to. Um, to ensure in responding to this report, we do so in Order. ways that save native forests whilst also saving forestry Order. jobs. We will work hard in ways as well as our government is doing across the board in terms of other aspects of environmental leadership. And this is a government that has banned the export of plastic wastes from Australia. This is a government that is investing significantly in terms of the recycling and reuse capabilities of Australia and showing environmental leadership in terms of the reforms that are there and the actions being taken by Prime Minister Morrison in particular there uh, to provide for better management of plastics in Australia, environmental leadership in, uh, in that space, and we'll continue to do so in that space and others around the protection uh, of Australia's unique nationally significant environmental assets. And that's indeed what the EPBC Act, implemented by a coalition government, was designed to do. And we'll make sure our Senator response Birmingham. to this review Time delivers upon that. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question uh, is for the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Um, the federal government promised to release the electric vehicle strategy in 2019. It didn't come. Neither did it come in 2020. And we now, we now find ourselves in 2021 still waiting. 
The vacuum in federal leadership on electric vehicles is now being filled by state, territory and even local governments going ahead with their own disjointed plans. This is somewhat reminiscent of Australia's rail track fiasco, which resulted in the country having a mismatch of narrow, standard and broad Broad gauge, broad, broad gauge rail scattered across the nation. Just how long will it take for the Morrison government to come up with a national strategy for electric vehicles? What is the delay to this important strategy? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Cecilia. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Pat thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank Senator Patrick uh, for the question. Um, the Morrison government is committed to enabling consumer choice uh, when it comes to new vehicle and fuel technologies. So this follows, of course, our technology, not taxes approach to reducing emissions. So we are developing, in answer directly to answer your question, we are developing a future fuels strategy that considers all of these new technologies, not only EVs. Uh, this includes hydrogen, fuel cell vehicles, hybrids and biofuels. And we've been working to ensure that the strategy is well informed. So to ensure industry has been widely consulted, uh, we will release a discussion paper in the very near future that will help inform the strategy. Uh, but we've already put our money where our mouth is with our $74.5 million future fuels package as part of the budget. Now this backs funding already committed through ARENA and CEFC, including $21 million for two EV charging networks and $11.7 million uh, for focusing on smart charging and tools to make it easier for motorists and businesses to purchase new technology vehicles. Uh, this includes projects uh, like $838,000 for Origin Energy to install 150 smart chargers at homes and workplaces across the national electricity market. $3.5 million uh, for Jet Charge to develop smart charging technology that will help make charging more user-friendly and will better integrate EVs into electricity. I'm, I'm always amused when, when I get Seth Rogen over there interjecting, but I'll, I'll keep going. We are serious about accelerating the uptake of new technologies and ensuring consumers' choice is supported. Order, um, order. It took me a while to pick that reference. Before I call you, Senator Patrick, I'm going to take the chance to welcome back to the chamber former President Parry. Welcome back to the Senate, Stephen Parry. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the government should understand, in terms of uh, consumer choice, the, the, the uh, car companies have made the choice. They are going down this pathway. In the absence of a national strategy, uh, that, that's paved the way for a suite of ill-considered and premature taxes, which will work against EV uptake and limit uh, Australia's ability to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Given that the government is fond of technology, not taxes, in its approach, uh, what is its plan to bring vehicle technology to bring down uh, emissions? Senator Cecilia. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick. Um, look, the, 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 the development of electric, hybrid, and Order. hydrogen fuel cell vehicles Order. is being driven by the world's large car manufacturers, and that is indeed the truth. Now, the number of consumers who choose to buy these new vehicles will rapidly increase as the new technologies reach parity with mature alternatives. Australians are already making the choice. It's about choice, uh, Senator Patrick, to switch to new technology. So hybrid car sales almost doubled in the last year, increasing from 31,191 vehicles in 2019 to 60,417 vehicles in 2020. Our Future Fuels Fund is designed to help develop these technologies and provide choice for consumers. Now, we are bringing down emissions, as you know, 17 per cent already, almost 17 per cent, well ahead Order. of our targets, well ahead of the OECD Senator average. Watt. We are more than doing our Senator bit, Watt. and EVs will be, of course, a part of that mix. Order. Senator Watt. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, electric vehicles that are advancing towards being more than just a means of transport, they will become an integral part of the energy grid, providing uh, drawing from it during low low periods and feeding energy back into the grid during peak uh, demand periods. What is the government doing to ensure electric vehicles are properly integrated into the energy distribution networks? 
Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, the future fuel strategy uh, will consider the integration of electric vehicle into the distribution network. And as I mentioned in my previous answer, uh, we are already investing uh, in projects through Arena and the CEFC, which will help address the barriers to uptake. And for example. For example, uh, here in the ACT, uh, Arena is investing $2.4 million uh, in a world-leading trial aimed Order. at better understanding and minimising Order. the Senators impact Wong, of electric Keneally vehicle charging on the energy grid. Order. So we're doing it here in the ACT. We're doing I'm it in South Australia. To, Senator uh, Seselja, committed... please resume your seat. I am struggling to hear him. Senator Watt, you had a lot of latitude this question time. Um, I would. Um, I appreciate that you're being so loud you might have trouble hearing me call you to order. I'm going to ask you to demonstrate some restraint for the next 13 minutes. Senator Seselja to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so in South Australia, we've committed $5 million in the budget for a grant uh, to the ACE EV to support domestic battery, electric vehicle manufacturing and a vehicle-to-grid trial. Now, this is about providing choice for Australian consumers without driving up the price of cars in Australia or creating supply issues in the electricity Order. grid. Senator Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just a bit taken back by listening to Senator Seselja's new fondness Order. of the electric vehicle. Come, come to your question, Thank Senator you. Gallagher. Thank you. Yeah, but your choices are better than Order. ours, are they? Uh, thank you. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. On 7 January, Mr Morrison promised the government would deliver 4 million vaccine doses by the end of March. Will the Morrison government deliver on this promise? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator for the question, Mr. President, one thing, the thing that we've always promised to the Australian people and indicated to the Australian people is that our vaccine rollout would be based on vaccine approval uh, and then the delivery processes that followed along behind that, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, the Prime Minister said um, earlier this week, with respect to the vaccine rollout, and, uh, Mr. President, this is. Uh, what the Prime Minister said at a press conference uh, just recently, uh, that the four million position will be something that's going to be achieved in early April as opposed to late March. Now, Mr President, that's what the Prime Minister said just recently at a press conference. Mr Order. President, acknowledging the fact, acknowledging the fact On my left. that with some of the conditions that are occurring in Europe uh, and the scaling up of manufacture of the vaccine here in Australia, that that was the process uh, and that was the expectation. So, Mr President, they are the Prime Minister's words from a press conference Senator just Keneally. recently, Mr President. And so we continue to work uh, with the TGA on the approval process. Uh, we continue to work with the vaccine companies on supply to ensure that we have uh, an available supply to roll out effectively to Australians across the country, Mr. President, and the thing that we have the, the thing that we have the benefit of, the thing that we have the benefit of, is that we are providing to Australians fully approved vaccines. We don't have to have the circumstances many other countries have been forced to do, which is to have emergency approvals for their vaccines. Australians, Mr. President, will benefit from the fact that the data that comes from the application of vaccines in other countries becomes available to the vaccine companies and then to our TGA for the formal approval of the vaccines. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Health has said that the Prime Minister's target of four million doses by the end of March, and I quote, didn't seem to be possible. When did the department first become aware it was not possible to deliver on the Prime Minister's promise made to the Australian people? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I've actually just indicated exactly the Prime Minister's position uh, and, the, and the way that we are rolling out the vaccine, Mr President. So it would have been useful, Senator Seselja, if the Senator had listened to the answer that I've just given, because we have always said to the Australian people that supply, supply of the vaccine and the rollout process will be dependent on approval. Order would be dependent on approval and supply issues from manufacturers. 
Mr. President. And we've been very frank with the Australian people. We've been very open with the Australian people. Uh, and as issues have, ar uh, have, ar have arisen, we have told the Australian people what is occurring, Mr. President. And I've just given you the quote from the Prime Minister Order, where he Senator said Gallagher. it was more likely to be early April than late March for the four million vaccines, Mr. President. Order. And, that, and, that, and that is a statement of the Prime Minister. Order. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. By what date will the Morrison government deliver on the Prime Minister's target of four million doses in April? And will Mr Morrison accept responsibility if he fails to deliver on this promise? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, it is, it is really disappointing that, that the Labor Party continue to not listen to the answers that are quite genuinely provided to them and, and continue their reckless campaign to undermine the rollout strategy that we are running, Mr. President. The recklessness of the Labor Party in trying to undermine the confidence of Australians in our vaccine strategy really should be condemned, Mr. President. We have said consistently that the rollout and availability of vaccine would be dependent on approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and we now fortunately have the Pfizer vaccine approved, and, and once it was approved, it could then be shipped, it could be tested by the TGA to, to ensure that it would do what we, it said it would do and was safe to provide to Australians. And we're now going through the process of the approval of the Pfizer of the AstraZeneca vaccine, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to work with the companies Order. and Senator the Colbert, TGA the on a safe rollout of that. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the morrison mccormack government's plan for a gas-fired recovery, including the recent heads of agreement reached with the East Coast LNG exporters. The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McMahon for her question uh, and her deep interest in all things resources, particularly in your home territory of the Northern Territory. Well, I think everybody understands uh, that cheaper and more reliable energy is going to be absolutely fundamental to the economic recovery of Australia as we uh, recover from the COVID pandemic. And it's particularly going to be very much important uh, for our job maker plan as we get Australians back into work and, uh, and back, uh, back fueling our economy. So our gas-fired recovery is, is absolutely essential uh, and will be supported by the reset of the East Coast gas market. And we'll do this by unblocking gas supply, delivering efficient transportation and empowering customers to make sure that we are providing the best possible energy source for Australia. Um, last month, the coalition announced a new heads of agreement with the three East Coast LNG exporters oper operating out of Gladstone. And this means all uncontracted gas uh, produced by LNG projects will now be offered to the domestic market uh, at internationally competitive prices before it is offered into the international market. Uh, and this agreement, alongside the Australian domestic gas supply security mechanism, will continue to put downward pressure on the prices of gas to ensure more gas is offered in the domestic market at a more affordable and competitive rate. Simply put, what we've done will push down the prices and increase as a result of increasing supply. And that means Australian businesses, Australian families will have the affordable and reliable gas uh, that they need. And it's about making sure that Australian gas works for Australians, uh, whilst supporting economic growth and backing the very, very important regional jobs that are on the back of this very important sector. More supply has brought more competition and lower prices, and it will support our manufacturing sector, while at the same time we will support Australia's pursuit of reducing emissions. Gas is absolutely critical for manufacture. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline how our government is ensuring sufficient gas supply for Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the Morrison McCormack government is delivering five strategic, uh, strategic basin plans to unlock new gas potential across Australia. We're starting with the Beedaloo Basin, which is in your home territory of the Northern Territory, as well as the Northern Bowen and Galilee basins in Queensland. 
The government uh, has announced a commitment to provide up to $50 million for the exploration of the Beetaloo Basin, plus $173 million to upgrade the roads to make sure that access is essential. Uh, so the Breedaloo Basin will bring jobs, Senator McMahon. I know that's something that's very, very important in your home territory, uh, as well as much-needed investment to, to northern Australia, but most importantly, affordable gas prices. Um, affordable gas is absolutely essential. No one could question the prosperity and the economic prosperity of this country and our manufacturing strategies will be enhanced by affordable and, uh, and accessible gas supply. The government is absolutely committed to give companies confidence to make sure that we can build on our economic Order. recovery. Senator Rustin. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise why it is so important to ensure affordable and reliable gas supplies? And any risk to affordability and reliability for Australian industry and consumers. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government's position is absolutely clear in this regard. Unlocking gas reserves is the key to Australia's economic prosperity and our continued recovery from COVID. And part of that is making sure that we provide certainty that provides the confidence to make sure that we have the essential investment in these critical resource projects to uh, about open up our economy. The you know, Labor's Environmental Action Network, championed by some of senators in this place, would seek to stop new gas projects and would actively be behave Order. to ban gas. I mean, basically, this network is Mark. responding to inner city, inner city um, greenies at the expense of everyday Australians and the regional economies that so many on this side believe are so important for our Australian economy. I mean, the member, of Hunter, the member for Hunter has labelled them fundamentalists who have no idea about supporting real workers and real jobs. And it's pretty hard to disagree with the member for Hunter when he makes those sorts of comments. We will support regional Australia and we will support a gas-led recovery. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Last night, the member for Dawson took to Facebook in defence of the member for Hughes, accusing others and the, and I quote, fake news media, end quote, of trying to censor Mr Kelly. Does the Prime Minister agree? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I haven't seen Mr. Christensen's remarks, uh, but uh, Mr. President, I'd make uh, I'd make a couple of observations. Uh, firstly, Mr. President, I would observe that uh, that this is often the case when these sorts of highly charged political debates occur. Uh, there are some who take an approach that seem to suggest that everything that's ever been uttered. Uh, needs to be retracted or withdrawn, and so let's be very clear Order. that uh, that you know, that our government stands firmly by our vaccine strategy. Our government wants to make sure that that is the number one focus of government policy delivery and of public dialogue in relation to building confidence around the vaccine strategy. As I have already told the chamber, and as Senator Colbeck has told the chamber. The Prime Minister met with Mr Kelly this morning. The Prime Minister made clear that neither he nor the government support any views that undermine the vaccine strategy, whether made by Mr Kelly or by anyone else in that regard. We want to make sure the overwhelming focus is on building public confidence to receive the vaccines that we are investing in and that we have secured for the Australian people. And this strategy is crucial and a crucial part of the nation's health and economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Australia is incredibly well prepared because of the good work done last year to make sure we have a successful order. delivery Senator, of vaccines Senator across Wong the country. On a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance, and I have been mindful of your previous rulings about glancing references, but we're at 23 seconds to go and nobody has addressed, nobody who's answering questions has addressed the question, which is whether or not the Prime Minister agrees with Mr Christensen saying that Mr Kelly is being censored. I'm listening carefully to the Minister's answer. I think he is directly addressing the subject matter. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but as long as, he, as, long as he's addressing the matter of information with respect to this vaccine. I think that's directly relevant to the question. Um, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, thanks Mr President. I made, uh, I made clear right at the outset in relation to the fact that I haven't seen Mr Christensen's particular comments, but the government makes no apologies for encouraging everybody to speak the truth, 
when it comes to vaccinations, to apply the evidence as presented by the chief medical officer, as presented by the head of the Therapeutic Goods Administration, Order, as backed Senator by William. our government through Time our health advisers. Expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, just uh, whilst question time was proceeding, Senator Canavan tweeted in defence of, of Mr Kelly, no, saying, and I quote, I think we need more Craig Kellys willing to say on popular things, because it is only by challenging ideas that we get better ideas. Does Prime Minister Morrison agree with Senator Canavan's comments in relation to Mr Kelly? And if he does not, will he make clear that Senator Canavan's comments do not represent the position of the Morrison government? Order. I'll call Senator Birmingham when I'll be able to hear him. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's always important to have people who will test and challenge views and opinions. Order. Who will test and challenge views Order. and opinions. However, Order. however, Mr. President, it is equally important in relation to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that government and those speaking to the public advocate for the facts of the matter and follow the factual advice that is presented. And our government has been consistent from this time last year and indeed slightly before it in acting and following on the health advice provided to us. Order. We have acted Senator on the health advice at each step of the way. That health advice has Senator served the nation well, and we have acted on the health advice the in relation to the vaccination strategy that's been developed, and we will continue to follow that health advice in delivering upon Order. that Senator vaccination Birmingham. strategy. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister representing the Prime Minister please explain why the Prime Minister refuses to publicly repudiate his own MPs? Is it because he doesn't want to upset the backbench, or does he believe there is political benefit for him in their spreading of misinformation? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I've stated time and time and time again during this question time now the fact that the Prime Minister has made clear that he and the government do not support any views, any views that undermine the vaccination strategy, no matter who they are made, no matter who makes them. And, Mr. President, my advice Order. to Senator everyone Keneally. in this place and to everyone across this parliament and indeed to Order. all Australians, whether you are a member of the public or a member Senator of parliament McAllister. or a member of the media, is to listen to the advice of the health experts. We employ a Chief Medical Officer of Australia for good reason. Senator Watt, we employ Senator a head of the Therapeutic Goods Administration for good reason. We have acted on their advice. Order. In Senator doing Birmingham, so, can you, we have procured Senator Birmingham, can you please million resume doses. your seat. Senator Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Senators, question time is a time of interaction, despite all interjections being disorderly. I accept that. But when I call a senator by name, it is usually because they have been constantly interjecting, and I do expect them to not continue unabated. Senator Birmingham, please continue. Mr. President, we've procured 140 million doses of a variety of vaccines to be spread across this country and distributed according to a detailed strategy. That's the government's priority. That's what we will Order. deliver Senator to keep Birmingham. Australians safe Time and secure. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. <laughs> Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Keneally, Gallagher and myself. Uh, well, doesn't this Craig Kelly problem just become worse and worse for the government? Mr Kelly, over the last few months has engaged in a deliberate campaign of misinformation to the Australian public about the most serious health challenge our country has faced in decades. For months now, Mr Kelly has used his own social media channels to communicate misinformation and falsehoods about vaccines, 
and about what he refers to as treatments, which have no basis in reality whatsoever. Mr Kelly, backed up by Mr Christensen and a number of other government members, have completely undermined the government's vaccine strategy by encouraging the Australian public to ignore real health advice from real experts and instead rely on conspiracy theorists and nut jobs circulating in, the cyber sp in cyberspace. And I hear Senator Abetz laughing along as we debate this very important issue, and in doing so, Senator Abetz betrays his support for the actions of Mr Hughes and all of the other right-wing nutjobs in this government who, complete, who continue to propagate conspiracy theories and undermine public confidence in the health response of their own government. Now, we've seen for months, as Mr Kelly and others have done this, the Prime Minister has let them off the leash, happy to let them get out there and communicate their falsehoods and their misinformation to the Australian public, uh, because Mr Morrison knows that he draws the political gain from allowing them off the leash. You won't hear Mr Morrison or Mr. Bur Senator Birmingham or any other leader of this government say the same things as Mr Kelly uh, and Mr Christensen, but they're very happy for it to go on because they know that there is a constituency for these kind of views out there, and they're happy for Mr Christensen, Mr Hughes and others to get those votes to help this government stay in power. What a dishonest uh, and lacking in integrity approach of this Prime Minister and this government to adopt, to allow members of their own government to get out and, sp and spread sp conspiracy theories and, frankly, dangerous messages to the Australian population at the very time that we need the Australian population accepting proper health advice and taking proper precautions here. So the Prime Minister and his colleagues are playing a double game here. On the one hand, they, the leaders of this government, get out there and surround themselves with public health experts and encourage people to do the right thing and listen to real experts, while at the same time they're playing footsie with the far right of the Australian community and the conspiracy theorists who follow Pete Evans and other people uh, in order to show that they are actually supporting them as well. They, you'll never get Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister, supporting what Craig Kelly is doing, but he's been more than happy to let it go on for months. And it was only after weeks of pressure from the opposition that he was finally dragged kicking and screaming into some meeting with Mr Thanks. Kelly yesterday. Now, Mr Kelly, of course, issued a back down of sorts uh, only a couple of hours ago and said that from now on he'd be a good boy, he'd listen to what the Prime Minister was saying, he'd get behind the government's approach. And I was sitting there thinking, how long is it going to take before Craig Kelly's back out there on Facebook reverting to type and spreading more conspiracy theories? But Senator Canavan has actually beaten Mr Kelly to the punch, because Senator Canavan couldn't even wait until question time was over before he had his own tweet out there circulating amongst the right-wing nutjob cyberspace, uh, supporting these conspiracy theories and backing in Craig Kelly. This has now become a test of the Prime Minister's authority over his government. He finally was able to exert some level of control over Craig Kelly in spreading misinformation, but now it's the Nationals. The now the Nationals are often racing because the Prime Minister can't control the Nationals in the same way that he can control his own backbench. So what we're going to see now in coming days is Mr Christensen, Senator Canavan and other members of the National Party engaging in exactly the same conspiracy theories and misinformation that we've seen from Mr Kelly over recent weeks. And now the question for Mr Morrison is, will he exert the same control over the National Party and rein them in from spreading mis uh, misinformation as he has attempted to do with his own party? Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Abetz. Madam Deputy President, the Labor senator that has just spoken has introduced the issue of prime ministerial leadership. Well, on this side, we have a leader behind whom we are all united, unlike the Australian Labor Party, who has the hapless leader known as Mr Albanese, but down whose neck Ms Plibersek, Mr Chalmers, Mr Miles, Mr Shorten are all breathing. The simple fact is 
the Australian people know where the government stands on this important issue of seeking to get a vaccine out as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible, for the protection of the Australian community. A very coherent, well thought out policy, and that is what actually interests the people of Australia. Now, every political party, thank goodness, has people who will speak out on issues and provide an alternate point of view. Mr Kelly is doing that in relation to this issue. Do I necessarily agree with him? No. But you know what, Madam Deputy President? The Australian Labor Party has won Mr Joel Fitzgibbon, who's got a very strong alternate point of view in relation to certain Labor Party policies, and as a result of his agitation, one Mr Butler met his demise from a certain position in the shadow cabinet. I turn to the Australian Greens, and I recall the internal bra brawls they suffered when they uh, rejoiced with uh, people such as Senator Nettle and Senator Rhiannon in their midst. That is part and parcel of the dynamics of democracy, that you will have men and women in political parties offering an alternate point of view. We in the Liberal Party are more than willing to accommodate and accept that there are people with alternate points of view who should be given in the public space the opportunity to give expression to those views, even if you vehemently disagree with them. Whereas within the Labor Party, what we are seeing more and more is their view that you have to adopt a groupthink. Nobody is allowed to have an alternate point of view or consider a different approach. We on this side are more representative of the Australian people, and I suggest that is why we sit on this side, because we are willing to accommodate and accept that different people have differing views. Now, if the Australian Labor Party were genuinely serious about their concern about the COVID response, where was the good senator and the Australian Labor Party when the ABC had Dr Norman Swan night after night contradicting the chief medical officer at the height of the pandemic. Not a whisper out of them. Dr Swan making these outrageous predictions of thousands of deaths. These predictions never came to pass. But oh, Dr Swan happens to be potentially of the left and with the ABC. So his criticism of these matters and of the government approach is to be accepted, not to be criticised. Mr Kelly, we might be able to describe as somewhat from the conservative side, and therefore he must be condemned. It is the double standard that the left always bring to these debates that exposes their shallowness and hollowness. If the Labor Party, Madam Deputy President, were consistent and would have condemned Dr Norman Swan as much as they are seeking to condemn Mr Kelly, I would say there is some integrity and consistency in their approach to this. No, this is pure political point scoring or an attempt to do so, but in doing so, I dare say all they're doing is elevating uh, Mr Kelly's profile as the member for Hughes, who is working very hard and diligently in the service of the people of Hughes and giving expression to a point of view that, in a free democracy, people ought to be allowed to give expression to. But that said, the government's policy is very clear. Later this month, or very shortly, we hope to be able to be rolling out vaccines when and as they uh, become available. We as a government are working hard, and the Prime Minister's leadership has been in contrast, absolute contrast, to that of the shambles of the Australian Labor Party under the leadership of Mr Albanese. Thank you, Senator Rebetz. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think um, you know, the senator opposite doesn't really seem to grasp the seriousness of the situation, nor the seriousness of um, members of the government going out and peddling, not something that's unpopular, but it's wrong. It's dangerous. 
This is something that the uh, members of the government have failed to grasp, and that is why it has, was always important that they uh, reined in Mr Kelly as quickly as possible and go public out there to say what Mr Kelly is saying is wrong, you shouldn't be listening to him, and we will be speaking to him. That's what the Prime Minister should have been doing, and that would have been strong leadership. But we haven't seen it. We haven't even seen it in this chamber. You know, yesterday's answers to question time, they they just they went they rambled. They were all over the garden path. And today wasn't even much better because we are talking about something that is of an extremely serious nature, and the Australian people deserve full and comprehensive answers. Now we know how essential. Um, uh, that, uh, that the vac vaccine rollout is taken up um, within the community. We know how important that is to the success of this nation in 2021 and beyond. A successful vaccine rollout will not only keep the Australian people safe and healthy, but it's also essential to our economic recovery. A successful vaccine rollout will be critical to underpinning a national recovery built on the back of more jobs and higher wages. Indeed, a successful vaccine rollout is critical to national economic confidence. That is why it is important that the public have confidence in the nation's vaccine distribution. And the very last thing we need is for the government's own members to be undermining and attacking national health uh, efforts and advice. Now, we heard today that Mr Kelly has put out a statement, so, but we've also heard we've had a breakout from Mr Christensen on Facebook last night. And why were we in question time today, after the, the Senate leader had um, given a response around Mr Kelly's uh, um, actions, Senator Canavan? I know most people probably would say, well. If it was going to be anybody, it was going to be Senator Canavan talking about, about uh, this is just about people wanting to shut down unpopular debate. It's not unpopular debate. It's dangerous language, dangerous misinformation that Mr Kelly is putting out there. This is why it is important, and this is why the Labor Party has raised it. We've all seen. Mr Kelly and his, his exchange with uh, Ms Plibersek, he is all over the shop. He is all over the shop. He will continue, in my view, he will continue to peddle this misinformation and put it out in, into the public arena, which we cannot afford to do. We need a vaccine rollout to be success, successful and taken up broadly within the community. Australia's prosperity and health depends on it. But the, you know, the mind boggles over the member for Hughes hawking pseudoscience and peddling snake oil cures. cures. It, it, you know, the members of the government's own team directly and deliberately undermining the government's own message and official public health help advice. And the government does nothing to discipline. If they haven't disciplined Mr Kelly. They haven't disciplined him. They've done nothing really to bring him to heel. Why? Why indeed? So this is a question that people ha are asking. Members of parliament are asking why. Members of the community are asking why? Why don't they bring him to heel? Now, you know, we know that the Prime Minister went, actually went out of his way to directly intervene to protect the member for Hughes before the last election. But something has to be done about Thank you, the members Brown. of the government that continue to peddle mis Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The irresponsibility that we are currently seeing from the Labor Party is just their latest example of the politicisation of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We saw when they couldn't get any traction, when they were being supportive of what they should have been, the fantastic efforts made by the Morrison government to keep Australia as one of the safest countries in the world with the most minimal economic of impacts felt. We have weathered this storm better than most other countries. But when that bipartisan support wasn't quite working out anymore, we've seen an overt politicisation in every single way they could possibly come up with. And this is just another example of that. And so rather than working to support everyday Australians and demonstrate some restraint, they're continuing to draw focus away from health advice that this government looks to. The Morrison government is focused on a safe and effective vaccine rollout. And just to confirm, it will be a free and voluntary vaccine rollout. But I do welcome today that the Prime Minister has spoken to Mr Kelly, and I look forward to everyone in this place getting behind the vaccine rollout in a positive way, that Australians will have confidence in the vaccine solution. But I have a particular interest in this debate. As most of you know, I have an absolutely gorgeous son who has autism. His autism was caused in utero, genetically, not because of any actions of the parents, and certainly not because of vaccines. So much time, effort and money has been wasted on autism because of a fraudulent belief in the work of a discredited doctor, Dr Andrew Wakefield. He is a fraud who has been struck off, who has absolutely destroyed many parents' confidence in a vaccine for their children under this belief that somehow autism is a fate worse than death, even if it was true, which we know it is not. So the tinfoil hat brigade who love to grasp to vaccines causing autism, and I can assure you it doesn't, none of them do, that they are continuing to cling to some form of conspiracy theory. We remember it was 5G that caused COVID. It was probably a few other things I've forgotten. It's been quite the year, but the 5G particularly stands out. That Bill Gates was looking just to microchip us all. I can tell you when you've got a kid with autism that runs away, the microchip is not a bad idea at times, but I digress. But the conspiracy theorists that you know, were continually trying to undermine COVID efforts, that the, it was, the virus wasn't real, it was some form of conspiracy, these are fundamentally buying into the anti-vaccine message. And we need to work not as government purely and solely, but as a parliament, as leaders of this country, to ensure that all Australians have confidence in the vaccine so that they will go out, even though it is free and voluntary, and receive the vaccine as soon as they are eligible. And the health minister, along with the prime minister, has worked incredibly hard to ensure that Australians will be protected by enough vaccines, that the TGA approval has been done to give Australians confidence in the safety and the security of the vaccines, that the rollout of them occurs in a way that adheres to the best possible health and medical advice. So fear-mongering about vaccines, whoever it's by, is wrong. But giving it additional airtime is worse. These ideas, these notions that we all know are incorrect, should be ignored. By highlighting them to Australians, it is undermining confidence, which is the last thing we should be doing. The rollout is the only way we will get our lives back to normal, that we'll start to see travel and the country open up international borders open up, that we can start to reduce the overreactions and knee-jerk reactions of premiers desperate to lock their state downs just before their, each election that they face. We need to ensure that Australians have confidence, feel safe and secure to receive the vaccine, to be part of the program and allow all Australians to return to the life they had pre-2020. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Polly. Thank you. The Prime Minister of this country, Scott Morrison, could have shut Craig Kelly down weeks 
and months ago, but he chose not to because he's a weak leader. He's a weak prime minister who knew what Mr Kelly was advocating through social media for month after month, sharing misinformation, undermining the health experts of this country at a time when Australia was facing the worst health <laughs> challenge and pandemic in 100 years. A prime minister at this time needs to step up and show leadership. That's what the Australian community expect. That's what the Australian communities need. But what did we see? No action whatsoever. In this place, this week, we've had the leader in the Senate of the government dancing around the issue instead of standing up and calling out Craig Kelly for what he is, and that is a loose cannon who plays up to these theories in relation to vaccines, and all it does is feed into the right-wing nuts of this country. No leadership by the leader in this Senate chamber. Now, social media, as we all know, is a powerful tool. So the misinformation that Craig Kelly has been disseminating is out there and will continue to be out there. And if that isn't bad enough, in this question time today, what did we see but from Senator Matt Caravan? What he's doing is encouraging people who want to share the ideas of Craig Kelly to continue to do it, because if you have those sort of debates, you're going to end up with better outcomes. Well, that is nonsense. That is clearly nonsense. How many of the backbench in this government are part of that chorus line? How many? I believe there'll be more. And if anyone in this chamber thinks for one minute that the little conversation that the Prime Minister had today after the altercation with Tanya Plebisek today in this House thinks that that's going to stop Craig Kelly, you are sadly mistaken, because I have no confidence whatsoever that this will do anything to give Mr Kelly the message that his nonsense is not needed and it is harmful to the Australian community. So, quite frankly, the Prime Minister was more concerned about keeping Craig Kelly happy than the health of the Australian people. And let's get on to the Prime Minister, who, as we all know, he's always there for the photo opportunity at any time, but he never follows through. Well, he's failed again when it comes to the rollout of vaccines to COVID-19. He promised there'd be a rollout in March. But already he's dancing and spinning his way out of that and saying, well, no, it's going to be April now. But we're at the front of the queue. Well, let's just put on the public record some facts in relation to where Australia really is when it comes to delivering the vaccines. Now, in other countries, once it's been approved for use, it's been within days that people have been jabbed with the vaccine and already getting their second dose. But we have the US, the EU, Canada and the UK all administered their first doses within a week of approval. Now in the UK, more than 9.2 million people have been vaccinated. How many in, Tas in Australia have been vaccinated? None. The TGA approved Pfizer's vaccine well over a week ago, and there is still no time frame. No time frame for when the vaccines will arrive in Australia or when they are going to be rolled out. The clock is ticking on you, Mr Morrison. The Australian people deserve so much more. Now, we know that they have used COVID-19 as the excuse for their failings economically. They're using it as an excuse for the attack on Australian workers. This government cannot even be trusted to deliver a vaccine in a timely manner 
to all Australians. And it's all right uh, for Mr. Senator Dunham there to smile at my comments, but Tasmanians deserve so much better. We have the oldest population in this country, and to have uh, thank that. Thank you, Senator Polly. Please resume your seat, Senator Dunham. A point of order. I wasn't smiling at anything Senator, Senator, Senator Polly was saying. There's nothing to smile order. about. Please what a ridiculous thing seat. to say. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Polly, Senator Polly, I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Polly, I was going to remind you as well, when you refer to others in the other place, please use their correct title. And I generally remind all senators because I'm having to pull people up more and more. It is respectful. Thank you, Senator Polly. It's not a debating point. I'm just outlining to you what the requirements are. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given uh, to my question by uh, the Leader of the Government, uh, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. And of course, I asked the Government today uh, when indeed they will respond uh, in full to the recommendations in the alarming report and review of Australia's environment laws conducted by Professor Graham Samuel. Of course, this was a review that was done under law. It was required because every 10 years we review the adequacy of our environment laws. And this report shows that the adequacy of our environment laws are woeful. They are not protecting our forests, they're not protecting our animals, they're not protecting our precious places, our beaches and coastlines. In fact, they're not protecting them, and instead they're allowing our precious parts of this country, precious parts of our wilderness, our bushland, many of our native animals, to be trashed and endangered uh, by development, by mining by forestry, by big developers. It's time that we had laws in this country that actually protect our environment and don't uh, offer an incentive for those who do the wrong thing to keep getting away with it. One of the key recommendations in this report, in recommendation number 15, is that the regional forest agreements that are currently in place that allow logging in Australia's native forests should not be exempt from our environment laws. That is a fundamental point being made here in this report that has been handed to the government and is waiting for a response. And just today, the federal court has handed down a decision in relation to logging in native forests and the validity of these regional forest agreements and have said, well, under the law as it is, this logging is able to continue. Now, many, many Australians will be shocked to hear that it is perfectly legal in this country to log in our native forests, to endanger our native animals in these native forests, that there is no environmental law in this country that protects these forests and these animals from these logging companies and from these logging projects. Isn't that unthinkable? That despite how precious our environment is, despite what little native forests we have left in this country, that it is perfectly legal under current law to trash and burn. It is quite clear in the review and the Order, report put Senator forward. Hanson Young. Time for contributions expired. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Do I have any notices of motion? I do not. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 20th of November 2020 of the Right Honourable John Douglas Anthony, ACCH a former Deputy Prime Minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Richmond, 
from 1957 to 1984. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Deputy Prime Minister Doug Anthony. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate expresses its sadness at the death on 20 December 2020 of the Right Honourable John Douglas Doug Anthony, ACCH, former Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for the Interior, Minister for Primary Industry and Minister for Trade and Resources, and former Member for Richmond. Places on record its admiration and appreciation for his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its deep, deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. The Right Honourable John Douglas Doug Anthony was an Australian icon who humbly served our nation in a life of public service. Doug Anthony was born in Merwimbulla, New South Wales, on 31 December 1929. Tales abound of Doug's early exposure to federal politics and the federal parliament as a young lad foretelling his own path of a prominent political career. His father, Hubert Lawrence Anthony, had been elected to the parliament in 1937. From the age of seven, Doug would join his father in Canberra, often staying in the Courageong Hotel, where he got to know many members of parliament and ministers of the era on a personal level. Rumour even has it that much of young Doug's time spent at the old parliament house saw him utilise the lower floor of the building for roller skating. Doug was educated at King's School in Sydney and Gatton College in Queensland before going on to become a dairy farmer until 1957, when his father, a then minister in the Menzies government, passed away. At the age of 27, Doug left the farming to contest and win his late father's seat of Richmond. The electorate of Richmond would reward the hard work and dedication shown by Doug Anthony by returning him as their local MP for a further 11 elections. Doug's parliamentary career stretched more than 26 years, 16 of them spent as a Minister of the Crown. He held responsibility for a variety of portfolios, serving as Minister for the Interior, Primary Industry, Trade and Industry overseas trade, minerals and energy, national resources and trade and resources. When the then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, first promoted Doug Anthony in 1964 to become Minister for the Interior, the youngest member at the time to be made a minister, he said, that'll keep you out of mischief. Doug Anthony assumed much responsibility for the advancement and establishment of this our nation's capital the seat of government here in Canberra. As Minister for the Interior, he played a role in the development of the Anzac Parade and the construction of the National Library and National Carillon, as well as the opening of Lake Burley Griffin as we know it today. Later in life, Doug reflected on how happy and proud he was of his connection to the city of Canberra, to which he believed no other capital in the world would compare. Today, those of us who serve in this place and the many who live in Canberra enjoy the fruits of his leadership and those who worked alongside of him. On the 2nd of February 1971, almost 50 years ago to this day, Doug Anthony, at the age of 41, became the youngest leader of the then country party. As leader, Doug took steps to modernise the party, recognising that the party had to broaden its base. This included a change of name to the National Party in 1982. In, the, in a testament to Doug's leadership style, throughout his tenure, the National Party was able to enjoy strong unity and, of course, build its reputation across many parts of Australia. Doug Anthony served the country as Deputy Prime Minister for nearly 10 years, marking the longest such tenure of anyone in the role. He was Deputy to Prime Ministers John Gorton, Billy McMahon and Malcolm Fraser, serving under Malcolm Fraser for the full period of the coalition government from 1975 to 1983. This tenure is a demonstration of Doug Anthony's commitment as a great coalitionist, setting the standards of engagement between the great National Party of Australia and the great Liberal Party of Australia that have served very many coalition governments thereafter. 
As Minister for Primary Industry, Doug regarded these years as some of his hardest, and yet through that period he was a fierce advocate for Australian farmers and regional Australia, particularly in tough meetings, for example, over European farming policies. Among his achievements in the role were upgrades to export abattoirs to maintain the beef trade, introduction of the wool reserve price scheme and the reconstruction of the dairy industry. Doug also served as Australia's 33rd minister responsible for the trade portfolio. I'm proud to have shared a passion for trade with Doug, having until recently served in the role myself as Australia's 53rd trade minister. As we reflect on Doug Anthony's achievements in the trade portfolio, it's important to note the role he played in expanding particularly our strong trading relationship with Japan. These were leading pioneers of the era in establishing and deepening those relations with nations like Japan, especially in the export of major commodities such as iron ore and coal. Doug Anthony also showed enormous leadership and insight in focusing on creating opportunities across the ASEAN countries and in the Middle East. He was the first senior Australian minister to be visited to visit the Middle East, where several important trade-related agreements followed with countries across the region. Perhaps most notably, Doug Anthony made history as the minister responsible for negotiating the Australia-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement. In 2003, Australia and New Zealand commemorated the 20th anniversary of the signing of the 1983 agreement. In a joint publication marking the occasion, former Prime Minister John Howard described the success of the CER, saying, it is a powerful testimony to the vision of both governments and of their negotiators that the CER remains one of the widest ranging and most successful free trade agreements in the world even today. That enduring success from which every Australian and New Zealander now benefits reminds us in turn how important it is to continue pursuing the goal of further liberalisation of world trade. Eighteen years on from former Prime Minister Howard's remarks about the CER and the bonds that it has established between Australia and New Zealand, it remains our most important trade agreement and the most significant pillar in terms of an example of true openness and cooperation. The beginnings of the CER can be traced to an informal discussion with New Zealand ministers in 1979, where Doug Anthony brought to the attention of the room the limited prospects for trade growth for either nation under their existing then multilateral trade negotiations or strategies. Dud will go on to speak of the success achieved by other nations which cooperated economically to take advantage of the trading potential within their region. He suggested that it was time for Australia and New Zealand to take advantage of the new global circumstances and in doing so to form a closer union of economic cooperation. The positive reception by New Zealand ministers of Doug Anthony's proposal at this meeting marked the beginnings of the formal process of the Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement. And though the agreement was finally signed off just a few weeks into the life of the Hawke government, Doug Anthony was acknowledged as the engineer of the agreement and indeed was conferred an honorary doctorate from New Zealand's University of Canterbury. Since then, the Australia-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement has become a model for trade agreements across the globe, a fact I can attest in my own undertakings of similar negotiations. Doug Anthony was Australian through and through. Perhaps few stories better illustrate this than when then Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser would take his annual summer holidays, leaving Doug in charge of the nation. Doug Anthony's choice of office was a caravan by his cottage at New Brighton on the New South Wales north coast, which caught the attention of the media. In his own words, Doug said, I'll probably be remembered for the caravan more than anything else in my political career. When the nation heard I was running the show from my caravan, it sent a message that it was Christmas. Time to relax. Everything was on hold, but also everything was being looked after. Doug retired from the federal parliament in January of 1984. He left on his own terms as father of the house with a record of accomplishments that few could match 
and returned to his dairy farm. But he remained active in public life, including campaigning for an Australian Republic at the 1999 constitutional referendum. Echoing the words of our current Prime Minister, the Right Honourable John Douglas Anthony was a quiet giant of Australian political life, a man who left an indelible and positive mark on our nation, our coalition of Liberal and National Parties, and particularly upon his beloved National Party. Doug Anthony led a long and meritorious life of public service, and we express our deepest thanks and profound sympathy to his wife, Margot, his three children, Dougal, Jane and Larry, and his nine grandchildren. I thank the Senator. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Minister for his reflection on the life of the former Deputy Prime Minister, John Douglas, Doug Anthony. I rise to contribute to this condolence motion, and I do so both in honour of Mr Anthony's service and as a proud resident of New South Wales, his home state. It is clear from the tributes that flowed following his death that Mr Anthony was held in high regard as a thoroughly decent man who exemplifies what it means to serve your community and your country. Mr Anthony demonstrated a deep commitment to public service. He was elected to the federal seat of Richmond in 1957 in a by-election after his father, who had held the seat, died suddenly. In his first speech to the parliament, Doug Anthony warned that while members of parliament should express the views upon which they were elected to office, he noted that a member should, quote, set his target at national development and security rather than personal achievement. He spent a career pursuing the former, and he certainly achieved the latter. Mr. Anthony's parliamentary career spanned nearly three decades, more than half of which involved service as a minister in government. The commitment he brought to the broader goals of the office was evident in the way he discussed his career, humbly remarking in his later years, I'm very fortunate to be where I am. I think I was making a useful contribution, and that's the satisfaction I get out of the job. Mr. Anthony appeared to have an admirable humility about his work and his role. He often performed his role as acting prime minister during the summer, as Minister Birmingham noted, in a caravan by his cottage in New Brighton on the New South Wales north coast, wearing little more than shorts and thongs. Now, during the lockdown year, many members of parliament were able to have their own experience of working from the New South Wales coast or wherever their lounge rooms happened to be. And if Zoom's any indicator, most did wear more than shorts and thongs. But it is appropriate that the linchpin of Australia's government would temporarily find itself in the bush by the sea on those summers. Mr. Anthony was a passionate advocate for regional Australia. He worked with the country party to represent the diversity of people living in regional Australia and bring their voice to Canberra. He made it clear that his responsibility was to the agriculture producers of this country. Doug Anthony was Minister for Primary Industry during an incredibly difficult period for Australian farmers, but he showed a tenacity in his work and his negotiating style that would come to define his career. He helped establish the Australian Wool Commission, which administered reserve price schemes and provided funds for marketing and research. When the price of grain crashed in 1969, he introduced wheat quotas to limit overproduction and encouraged the Australian Wheat Board to open flour mills overseas. It was during this period that Mr Anthony, like me and many other members of this place, became an advocate for an Australian Republic. During particularly tense negotiations with the British Agriculture Minister Geoffrey Rippon over European farm policies, Mr Anthony said, it was the contempt I couldn't put up with. It's always been the attitude of the colonial powers. After the loyalty we'd shown, the wars we'd fought, I thought it was a pretty shabby way to treat us. And that led him to become a campaigner, alongside my uncle Tom Keneally, for the 1999 Republican campaign. He believed in giving Australians the recognition and the respect they deserved, particularly rural Australians. As his family noted upon his passing, he was very much a man of the Tweed region and it is fitting he should depart this life from within the community he loves so much. Now, Despite being at home in the country, Mr Anthony was one of the architects of the modern and vibrant Canberra we know today. As Minister for the Interior, he helped finish the transition of government department head offices from Melbourne to Canberra. 
thank goodness, overseeing the construction across the city and injecting character into the national capital. It was Mr. Anthony who was responsible for the construction of the National Library and the opening of Lake Burley Griffin. Mr. Anthony and his wife, Margot, were well known in Canberra for providing emotional support to members of the local community who have disabilities. As devoted as he was to his community, Doug Anthony was evidently a dedicated husband, father, and family man. He married Margot in 1957. They had three children, Dougal, Jane, and Larry, and eventually, and I'm sure he was very delighted, with nine grandchildren. I was struck by the description of, Mr. of, of Margot and, Anth and Doug's marriage as a, quote, romance that never died. He was loved fiercely in return by his family, who were never lost in the shadows of the enormity of his public service. Now, many in the community will also remember Mr. Anthony for being the only Australian member of parliament, at least that I'm aware of, to have a band named after him. When Paul McDermott, Tim Ferguson, and Richard Feidler decided to form a musical comedy band called the Doug Anthony All-Stars, Mr. Anthony took it in the good humor in which it was met. My friend Tim Fer Ferguson told me, he was always a true gentleman who tolerated our antics with great patience and hopefully forgiveness. Now, while I didn't know Doug Anthony personally, when I read that his most famous saying was, if you see a head, kick it, I thought the two of us might have gotten along. My condolences are with Margot, with his children, his grandchildren, and his community on the New South Wales North Coast. May we look to his legacy of that as an honourable man and a true Australian statesman. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I rise as Leader of the Nationals in the Senate to contribute um, to the condolence debate contributions on the passing of the Right Honourable Doug Anthony and want to thank Senator Keneally and Senator Birmingham uh, for their heartfelt words and um, I think some colourful turn of phrase that really does, did capture um, Doug, um, his love of country and his love of his nation and his uh, love of his family. Our thoughts and condolences go to Margot, Dougal, Jane, Larry and their families. Uh, it's obviously a sad occasion for uh, the National Party family, as it is for many people across Australia. He was a giant of our party. He just wasn't the Deputy Prime Minister or the member for Richmond, but he very much uh, was the leader of the country party and then National Party. Part of an iconic era, really, for our party, post uh, John McEwen, um, the Fab Four, uh, Doug Anthony, Peter Nixon, Ian Sinclair and uh, Ralph Hunt uh, were a force to be reckoned with uh, on behalf of regional Australia but also uh, within the coalition. It's fitting to repeat the words of Doug himself when he spoke of the passing of another giant of the then country party, John McEwen, in November 1980. McEwen, Doug Anthony, said, was a strong man. He was at times a hard, tough, demanding man. He was a man of integrity, a man of honour, he was a powerful negotiator and a persuasive advocate. Mr President, I believe Doug Anthony may well have been describing himself as he was all that. In recent weeks, Doug has been described in many ways, a true statesman, a man of honour and integrity, a humble man, ever positive and ever connected to the Tweed region around uh, Merwillumbar, Merwillumbar in the Northern Rivers. The man from Merwillumbar did not set out to become a household name and it very nearly didn't happen. But Doug Anthony is a household name, and John McEwen played a significant role. He picked him out early uh, in this group of new young men that arrived in Parliament House as a restless young backbencher and provided him, um, promising him a ministry. And I think would have, that would have um, been a great loss to the nation had uh, Doug left early. When I was chatting to uh, his son, Larry Anthony, who's also the current National Party Federal Pe President, about uh, Doug's experience with John McEwen, uh, he recalled that there was a time Menzies considered promoting a very young Doug Anthony to the Minister of the Navy 
before McEwen actually intervened. He believed Doug was too young and would not be respected in the portfolio by the uh, chiefs of defence and that he needed time to grow into the role to become everything that McEwen knew this young man would be as a leader. And so McEwen pushed for a portfolio he thought he could thrive in as for Minister of the Interior, and that's what happened. So because at that time it goes that Doug was actually looking for opportunities beyond politics because he'd been catapulted, if you like, so early uh, into parliament following the death of his father. So we can be very, very thankful for Blackjack's mentorship. Doug Anthony was born on New Year's Eve in 1929 and after his schooling at the local secondary college, the King's School in Parramatta and Gatton College in Queensland, he became a dairy farmer. It was his deep and abiding passion. It's all he wanted to do um, was be on the farm and, and obviously to produce milk at that time. That changed in 1957 when his own father, Larry Anthony Senior, a min minister in the Menzies government died and Doug was elected to the federal seat of Richmond uh, at the by-election at just 27. His parliamentary career spanned more than 26 years, 16 of which involved service as a government minister. Doug held a variety of portfolios, serving as Minister for the Interior, Primary Industry, Trade and Industry, Overseas Trade, Minerals and Energies, National Resources and Trade and Resources, all very um, hearty uh, National Party, Country Party portfolios there. He was made Deputy Leader of the Country Party in 1966 and at aged 41 became our party's youngest leader following the retirement of John McEwen in 1971, a record that is yet to be broken. He was Deputy Prime Minister to three Liberal Prime Ministers, John Gorton, Billy McMahon and Malcolm Fraser. And during his time as Prime Minister for Primary Industries then Trade, he drove significant reform, opening up new trade opportunities for agriculture and mining. Just as our current government leadership sets out to expand trade markets amid growing Chinese tensions. It was under Doug Anthony's trade ministership and that of his predecessor, John McEwen, that laid the foundations to help make this happen. Along with fellow national Ian Sinclair, Doug Anthony, as Minister for the Interior, was one of the two last survivors of Sir Robert Menzies' last ministry. Ian Sinclair, uh, Minister for Social Services in the 10th Menzies Ministry, who replaced Doug Anthony as National Party leader, upon his retirement, said of his predecessors, and I quote, predecessor, as members of the National Party, we are proud of his leadership of the party. Peter Nixon, Ralph Hunt and all those of us who are members of the party remember him kindly for the way in which he led and kept the party together. There is no doubt that as we look back on him, those times were different. But looking at modern Australia, so much of it began in the days when Doug Anthony was Deputy Prime Minister. And so much of all of those things that we cherish today Doug had a hand in. Australia has a vibrant trade-oriented farm and mining industries today, delivering huge improvements to living standards for all Australians because Doug Anthony saw the opportunities in the 1970s and the 1980s. In The Spectator, Terry Barnes wrote, it is a cliche to say we'll never see his like again, but it certainly is so. Backed by his loyal deputy, Sinclair, Doug Anthony oversaw the transformation of the country party to the national party. He said the name change reflected Australia's changing political scene. Announcing it, he acknowledged the importance of farming to rural Australia, saying farmers' prosperity was the basis of prosperity of many rural towns and of industries and employment outside the city. But he stressed the party works for all people outside major capital cities. Former Federal Director of the Liberal Party, Brian Lochnane, described Doug Anthony as a committed coalitionist. And that was on evidence at his uh, state memorial last week in the Tweed, uh, where we saw icons of the National Party Country Party gather, uh, former state premiers, ministers, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Warren Truss, alongside our current Prime Minister um, and former Prime Minister John Howard, who spoke so eloquently of the time he served with Doug uh, in Parliament. It was the likes of Doug Anthony and his colleagues Peter Nixon and Ian Sinclair who demonstrated to both parties what would be achieved through the partnership of two very proud uh, and independent political movements. 
It has been noted amongst my national colleagues that while Doug Anthony was a committed coalitionist in front of the opposition, he was fiercely committed to the nationals' cause in joint party room and cabinets. Former Prime Minister John Howard was a minister with Doug under Malcolm Fraser. And he said Doug Anthony's contributions in cabinet discussions were always direct, understandable, uninformed and unshakable. He um, recalls a particular uh, situation and he assured me that um, it had been more than 30 years so he could talk about it. Uh, but uh, when at the memorial service last week, where um, whilst Fraser had been overseas, he'd left uh, Doug in charge. Doug had made a decision around um, parliamentary salaries and remuneration, which then the opposition seized on, uh, and it was overturned when, by the PM when he, he got back. And uh, it was a very furious and forthright Doug that um, made it very clear to the then PM that if he was left in charge, uh, he expected to be able to exercise that uh, with the full authority. So no one was ever um, under any doubt about what he thought. But he was uh, very generous and likeable. And uh, there's stories, um, one of the stories I read was very, very handsome man. Um, so you sort of, he's on the TV, you know, TV campaigning and uh, women kissing the TV uh, when he actually came on for his um, campaign messages, which you know is a great thing for um, I think his son, who was door knocking the seat of Richmond at the time, uh, to hear that he was Doug's son, and um, that's what she thought of his dad. Uh, anyway, so his affable style endeared him to his colleagues, and most importantly, the farmers and other constituents he represented. Former leader of the Nationals in the Senate, Senator Ron Boswell, described Doug Anthony as a strong, popular and decisive leader who understood the power he had within a coalition to be wielded only when necessary. Senator Boswell recounted being summoned to Doug Anthony's office immediately after delivering his own first speech in this chamber. Doug told him, Ron, you got into the Senate on Flo's petticoat tails by being the gopher boy for the Queensland National Party, but that won't cut anything down here. You'll be a one-termer unless you understand Canberra and how the system works to assist rural and regional constituents. Clearly, from his long and very, very successful career on delivering, Senator Boswell paid uh, attention to his leader's uh, words. He represented the Nationals and Queensland for over 30 years. My deputy in the Senate, Senator Canavan, tells a story um, of Doug Anthony was uh, reading through his papers on a flight to New Zealand. Uh, asking his advisers, why am I going over here? I'm checking this agenda. There's nothing on it. There's nothing to discuss. And by the time they landed, Doug had made an addition to the agenda and the Australian-New Zealand closer economic relationship was born. Never one to waste an opportunity, typical of a farmer and a great leader. He regarded the economic relationship as a major achievement. It became a blueprint for future trade agreements. He negotiated with China. He was the first senior Australian minister to negotiate the live sheep trade with the Middle East. Doug built a strong import and export relationship with the emerging industry powerhouse of Japan, uh, building on the strong work of his former mentor, John McEwen. He understood the need for strong rural and regional representation at the highest level of governments and was a fierce advocate for the opening of new trade opportunities. Whether it was in defence of the wool floor price, opposition to increasing the value of the dollar, or his defence, which I think was the only thing he and John Howard ever disagreed on, uh, or his defence of single desk selling, Doug Anthony stuck to his intent to deliver for rural Australia. He was also heavily involved in the development of Canberra. The Anthony family is synonymous with the country and National Party. Doug, his father, Hubert Lawrence Anthony, and current Nationals Federal President, Larry Anthony, all represented the Federal Division of Richmond for a combined 67 years. Doug retired from federal parliament in January 1984, returning to the farm, Sunny Meadows, which had expanded beyond the dairy uh, to include now a piggery, cotton and cereal operations. Uh, he held several corporate positions in retirement. But around this time of his retirement, that uh, trio of buskers on the streets of Canberra actually adopted his name. Upon meeting Doug via the TV show Video Hookup, Doug Anthony All-Stars member Paul McDermott said he found Doug generous, kindly and accepting. And Doug 
with his trademark country smile and tongue firmly in cheek, said, that, said of this particular meeting that it was, and I quote, an auspicious occasion. It's the first time I've met these plagiarists who've made my life miserable ever since I retired. I hope to keep it out of the public limelight. What happens? I walk down the street and people say, that's a great band of yours. <laughs> Was it those iconic pictures of the acting Prime Minister running the country over the summer holidays from a caravan at New Brighton up the New South Wales coast that made him a household name? He, was, he did say, when the nation heard I was running the show from my caravan, it sent a message it was Christmas, time to relax, everything was on hold, but also that everything was being looked after. But I think it was also a demonstration to all of us um, that of his commitment to his family in what was an incredible public life. Um, Larry also told a great story that um, Prime Minister Fraser was very keen to keep in touch with his um, deputy quite regularly, but the only way to do that was um, the public phone down the road. So, armed with like a stack of 20-cent pieces, he'd send Larry to wait in the line with the locals until it actually got uh, far enough up to get Dad up from the caravan to take the Prime Minister's call until the 20 cent pieces ran out. Uh, got very, very frustrated, shall we say, for Prime Minister Fraser, who then ended up giving the caravan a fantastic upgrade so that it could have a direct line. And what I think that said was that Doug was not for moving in January, um, so and Prime Minister paid attention and, and got the best of both worlds. So um, a, a great example for us all. In 2014, he said, I don't see the purpose in people remembering much, but I don't think he got his wish there because he's very much well remembered uh, by all of us. He was a statesman of the highest degree. Um, he was a giant of our party and he's left a lasting positive impact on modern Australia and in particular regional Australia. Our sympathies are to his family and to the wider country party. Um, decency, intelligence, humility, generosity. Uh, he and Margot retired, the love of his life, retired to the Tweed where he enjoyed listening to her play the piano uh, on the farm, to fish, often with Peter Nixon, uh, to spend time with the family, to support the arts and the wider community. A very proud countryman and someone we are also similarly very, very proud of. Vale Doug Anthony. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I too would like to echo the, the celebration of a great Australian leader in this chamber this afternoon. Uh, Doug Anthony was a leader that I don't think any other country in the world could have produced. Uh, he was quintessentially Australian, identifiably Australian. Uh, perhaps he, he might not be the type of leader we ever have see again uh, in Australia. I hope not. I hope we haven't lost. Uh, 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 his uh, down-to-earth nature, uh, his country charm uh, and, of course, uh, his larrikin spirit. Uh, Doug, uh, Doug uh, was our longest-serving uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, and uh, he led our country through great change and transition, changes and transitions that impacted the uh, then Country Party but now Nationals Party uh, greatly, uh, and he did so extremely successfully. Uh, as I said, I, he was a real larrikin, a uh, real Australian larrikin as a leader, and that comes through in the stories that have been told here this afternoon in the, in the, the beachside caravan, the, the uh, calls from the Prime Minister on the payphone that his kids were operating. Uh, and another story I'd like to tell as well here that uh, was, I think, uh, well, certainly I uh, learnt through uh, Senator Davies' father's history of the Nationals Party, uh, uh, a young MP. As a young MP, Doug Anthony at Old Parliament House was getting a little bit bored. Uh, sometimes we're here for long periods of time, sometimes we're here for, at late nights. And uh, he and some other members of Parliament decided to, uh, uh, to engage in some uh, late night uh, uh, kicking of a football, uh, although it just so happened they'd be doing that kicking in King's Hall uh, in the front of Parliament House there. You can still go and visit. It's a big expanse, but I've never really thought of kicking a football in there. I thought that might be a bit disrespectful. But uh, Doug, as a real larrikin, was kicking the football around. Unfortunately, this stray football hit one of the large portrait frames 
uh, that uh, still appear in, in our equivalent of King's Hall here. Um, and uh, this frame uh, fell to the ground. The glass inside smashed all over the floor. Uh, Doug and his uh, partners in crime quickly swept all the glass up, hung the, the frame back up as best they could, and apparently the broken frame went years without being detected uh, until finally someone realised that glass needed to be replaced. It, I'm sure they said it was like that when we got here. So um, he was a great, great leader. Uh, as I said, Doug, Doug became leader of the Country Party in, in 1971. He, he followed in, in some huge shoes of uh, John Blackjack McEwen. Uh, and prior to that time, uh, prior to his time as leader, uh, the three previous leaders, or at least there was, I think, a transition leader, but the three previous major leaders were, were Earl Page, Arthur Fadden, and John McEwen, absolute giants of, uh, of Australian politics and indeed all. Uh, members of parliament that became prime minister at some times in their careers. So Doug had a tough act to follow, a real tough act to follow. And at the same time, uh, the country party was facing enormous challenges with farming employment declining as part of the Australian economy, uh, a broader shift uh, in Australian society on a number of issues, and the trading relationship uh, pressures that uh, my colleague Senator Mackenzie was, was mentioning. And, and he, he, he tackled this issue front on, uh, and it was always only going to be the only successful way uh, was to tackle it. And at, at Doug's first press conference uh, as leader of, of the country party, he, he, he summed up quite nicely what I think became the manifesto of uh, then the Nationals Party in his term. He said, I think we service that responsibility well to look after people not just outside capital cities, not just farmers. Uh, and indeed, that does his definition lasts on in the logo now of the Nationals Party for regional Australia. Uh, perhaps there is a dividing line in, in our party's history pre Doug Anthony and post Doug Anthony. Pre Doug Anthony, the party probably was primarily focused on farming issues and, a, and, a, and was started as a farmers' party and retained that focus through its first 50 odd years of life. Uh, uh, but perhaps the second half of the National Party history, a party that celebrated 100 years last year, the second uh, 50 years has been a broader focus uh, on people who live outside regional Australia, including, of course, farmers, who by definition do live outside capital cities, but also on a broader focus on those that face challenges living away from our major centres that are, don't have access to the same services as those in capital cities and who are desperate to see our country grow uh, and develop. He also oversaw the broadening of the base of the Nationalist Party for, to, 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 to work those who work in, in mines, uh, to small business people uh, uh, and to those families in country towns. And, 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 and the way he did that was, was through making uh, good leadership decisions, especially in, in his role in different portfolios. As I mentioned, he came, when you think about when he became uh, a Deputy Prime Minister and the leader of the Country Party. It was at a time when the UK had just joined the European Commission. Uh, at the time, in the late 1960s, the UK imported 80 per cent of Australia's butter. 80 per cent of our butter went to the UK, imagine that. Uh, uh, our dairy herd after the UK joined the EC fell from 4 million to 2.4 million head in the space of just a few years. Uh, fruit exports crashed and millions of trees had to be pulled up because we lost markets for tinned fruit and vegetables. Uh, uh, it was a major ch challenge in rural Australia. Now, the groundwork had been laid in, in agreements that John McEwen had, had signed, with, with Japan especially, but it was, left, it was really Doug who, who, who took those agreements uh, and made them, the, 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 made them into the full opportunity that uh, was there for Australia. Uh, he pushed uh, the development of, of extra uh, uh, exports to the Japanese market. He also opened up and looked at new markets, signing what really was the first modern free trade agreement, not just for Australia but for the world. Uh, Bridget mentioned the story of Doug being frustrated with uh, boring uh, departmental uh, 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 written agenda items, and, I, and I, I share some sympathy as a former minister with his frustration that uh, perhaps why am I going to this meeting? It doesn't seem to be much we're saying to each other. Um, but Doug took action. He took action and decided, well, why don't we add some things to the agenda and actually make some decisions? And um, so that the, what, what came out of those discussions was the, uh, not just the first free trade agreement for Australia of, of that nature, 
but really the first in the world. When you look, there's a massive difference between the agreement we signed with Japan in 1957 that kicked off our modern trade uh, environment, signed by John McEwen. It was a letter. It was an exchange of letters, just ten or so pages. <laughs> Uh, whereas the New Zealand comprehensive, it was called the comprehensive uh, economic relationship, covered a vast sway of different areas and sectors, which served as a template uh, for the multiple free trade agreements we have today and, and have been replicated by many countries in, in NAFTA and, and other, other trade agreements around the world. He also established new trading links with the Middle East, uh, pioneered the development of that. And, and Doug was the, I think, first and certainly the, the, the last resources minister before I was the resource minister, the last resource minister from the Nationals Party. Uh, uh, and, and that's something that goes uncommented a little bit, the, the role he played uh, in, in developing our nation's resources. He oversaw the development of our uranium exports for the first time, a controversial issue uh, that he championed. Uh, uh, he also negotiated very difficult, very toughly, very strongly with uh, Japanese uh, steel, buy, steel mills who are buying our iron ore and push them for higher prices. Indeed, there's a great story where he, as acting PM, just made a decision to, uh, to, to refuse to sell to put export controls on, on, on iron ore. Um, and uh, uh, the then Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser was not too happy about that, but Doug stuck to his guns and did get better prices uh, for our iron ore because of his action. He did work productively with Liberal leaders, and, and he was a coalitionist, as Senator McKenzie said, but we shouldn't forget that he, was, he stood up very strongly for his own party's interests in discussions with the Liberal Party. He, at one point, led uh, with his Cabinet colleagues uh, uh, three walkouts in three days from Cabinet over a discussion on the exchange rate. And I think uh, his, Doug's action in, 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 in moving uh, the Nationals Party to a broader base, uh, uh, but doing so consistent with the strong leadership that has always existed uh, within the Nationals Party, helped ensure that the second half century of the Nationals Party continued to be a successful uh, one. Uh, we have been rewarded uh, politically because we have fought for regional areas by supporting the development of dams, uh, the development of new mines. Uh, uh, the protection of industries like cattle exports, live cattle exports. We have opposed taxes and regulations that would inhibit job growth and production in regional areas. And we've took up the fight just like Doug did in his time. Uh, we've done so with no airs or graces, uh, um, happily living in caravans if, if, if Doug's his want, or going back to our own families and communities and just being as much as we can close to the people and defending their rights and interests, regardless of what people might say about us down here. He's a great lesson to, to our party. Uh, he was a great leader for our country. It's a great loss for Australia, but especially for his family. He's passing, and I want to pass on my deepest condolences to his, uh, his broader family, to Margot, and especially his love of his life, and, and Vale, Doug, Doug Anthony. Senator, Mc oh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, I would like to add some short comments in this tribute to Doug Anthony. Uh, much has already been said about Mr Anthony's career and his achievements, um, both in this chamber as well as at his state memorial service in Tweed's Heads last Thursday. I first met Mr Anthony, or Doug, uh, when I was a young teenager whose main understanding of politics was it was just something my dad and his friends talked about. At the time, I had little concept of the import of the Deputy Prime Minister or the role that Doug had played in shaping our nation, particularly in the regions. And testament to the kind of man he was, Doug did not stand on ceremony with me. He did not speak down to me or make me feel inferior. He spoke to me like he spoke to everyone, as an equal. His genuine, easygoing manner, warm, broad smile and his quick sense of humour was endearing. And it was only in subsequent years, as I got to know both him and his wife Margot, as well as their son Larry, that I got to understand that the kind, warm man that I knew had actually been one of our longest serving deputy prime ministers, a champion for rural industries, and a man who had done so much to shape our modern nation. Indeed, Doug was an original futurist. He, he was a man who really saw 
potential and saw what the future might bring. Um, he made much of recognising the future mechanisation of agriculture. Um, as the Minister for the Interior, which was his for first po portfolio, he helped shape the national capital that we all stand in today. Um, it was not long after, in pol political terms, um, when he, only six years after being elected, he took on the role as Minister for Interior. And he took it on with the same level of commitment as he did everything. And he was therefore instrumental in shaping Canberra, involved in development such as the Canberra Theatre, Anzac Parade, the Mint, choosing the site for the Carillion, and he lobbied for the Captain Cook Jet Fountain, which was ultimately switched on by his successor in the portfolio, but which he was very proud of. Um, he was also fundamental in uh, starting the work and establishing the new town centres of Woden and Belconnen, which are now part of inner city Canberra, uh, as, as the success of the national capital has seen it expand. But he was also a futurist in other areas. As mentioned by Senator Canavan, he, he identified the trade opportunities in uranium, which is now a zero emissions product. Uh, so he was on the money. He was one of the first to identify the opportunities of working from home, as has been uh, mentioned. So, you know, uh, he, he would have done very well in the, later, in the COVID lockdown as he was fully prepared for that sort of a lifestyle and that sort of working environment. But, you know, uh, you should ask why was Doug so adept at such a young age, politically speaking, at representing both his rural constituency as well as taking on ministerial responsibilities and negotiating you know, bilateral trade agreements. And to understand that, you need to understand a bit about Doug's background. The Anthony family are the only political dynasty in Australia, and there are a few, but they are the only one to have seen three consecutive generations in the same House of Representatives electorate being Doug's father, Hubert, who was also known in Canberra as Larry, Doug, and his second son, Larry. Hubert was a soldier turned farmer, turned local MP, and then finally a minister, and he taught his son much. Doug's upbringing was split between visits to Canberra and the family home at Mwoolambar on the north coast. But Doug was always encouraged to be his own man and to determine, determine his own destiny. And Doug was not initially drawn into politics. As mentioned by Senator Birmingham, he first turned his attention to farming. He established his dairy and he set about with full gusto learning about primary production practices both here and abroad. He travelled extensively and learned a lot. Indeed, as outlined in the book mentioned by Senator Canavan, Politics in the Blood, um, it is revealed that after one international visit, Doug returned to be greeted by his ministerial father at the airport with media in train. His father told him to take the hat off, claiming he looked ridiculous, but Doug left his straw stetson on his head as he regaled the, the surrounding newsmen about the streamlined production methods and the extensive use of modern machinery and efficient distribution facilities in the new US. And he confidently predicted that Australian farmers would have to adapt to be able to continue to compete. Settling back into Australia, Doug found continuing interest in what he learned, and he sought out to share his experiences talking at Rotary, business chambers and farming organisations. He spoke eloquently not only about primary production, but also the mechanisation, technological advances and innovation. His easygoing approach, clear delivery uh, and amicable nature saw him in high demand, which in turn saw him further fine-tune his public speaking skills and ability to adopt and adapt new ideas. And I believe it was that early career and experience that was fundamental to building the successful politician and leader that we remember here today. 
and successful he was by any measure. He was a minister in all coalition governments from March 1964 onwards. He was a cabinet minister from October 1967 and deputy prime minister and frequently acting prime minister from February 1971 to December 72 and then again from December 75 to March 1983. And it was during the very towards the end of that time that I first met him when he uh, requested that my father take over the directorship of the National Party, promising Dad that they would make a great team. And he wanted to work with my dad. And shortly after my dad took the role, Doug promptly resigned. <laughs> so as leader of um, his elevation to the leadership mark, did mark a generational change in the party's evolution, as uh, Senator Canavan discussed. He broadened the party's platform and widened its electoral appeal, and that has helped to cement our party's ongoing relevance in Australian politics. And that is why our party has now spanned 100 years, and we are all very proud of that. As leader of the party, indeed during the Fraser Anthony years, it was often said that the Nationals wielded more influ influence than their parliamentary de numbers deserved. But that assertion ignores the fact that the success was because the Nationals brought forward good policies and that Doug could champion those policies such that they became government policy. And that is the power of cooperative coalition. In his retirement, Doug returned to his farm, Sunny Meadows, and worked just as hard for his passion projects. Together with his wife Margot, they donated some of their land for the development of new premises for the Tweed River Art Gallery. Known today as the Tweed Regional Gallery, it is now recognised as a leading regional art gallery in Australia. And turning full circle, in 1999, he again took a role that saw him help shape our national capital. He was appointed chairman of the old Parliament House Advisory Council. The role took him back to his childhood and reminded him of the days when he used to visit his father. In those days, old Parliament House was a relatively new Parliament House of 11 years old. So being there on that board and helping supervise refurbishments and determine the future for that grand old building was a job he absolutely loved, and he was fundamental to the building becoming what is, it is now, the Permanent Museum of Political History here in Canberra. He retired from the role in November 2008 and uh, spent the remainder of his time with his family, surrounded by loved ones uh, in the North Coast. So this was the kind man that I knew. And while many in Doug's position could easily have forgotten that awkward teen, uh, he did not. He always greeted me warmly, remembered my name, which for some old politicians that I knew was quite remarkable, but greeted me warmly, and he always took an interest in what I was up to through all stages of my life, no matter where our paths crossed or when. I held Doug and his family in enormous regard, and I still do. And my thoughts and prayers are with Margot, Dougal, Larry and Jane. Doug was a great MP, a great minister, a great party leader, but most importantly, he was a genuine person and a great man. Vale. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. So much has already been said of the late, great Doug Anthony. And the Anthony family has given so much to Australia. Through politics, they have entrenched themselves into the fabric of the nation and particularly rural Australia. My home state of Queensland particularly owes Doug a great debt. Doug was married to Margot and his family, Hubert, Larry, was a country party minister in the Fadden and Menzies governments. And his son, Larry, continued the tradition of public service as an elected National Party member for Richmond, New South Wales from 1996 to 2004, and his contribution to the party continues. 
right to this day in his role as president of the party. Doug was a formidable ally for people outside the capital cities, and there's no doubt regional Australia would be worse off without his fierce advocacy on their behalf. He was instrumental in securing closer trade ties with New Zealand, the Middle East, Japan and China. But what I want to touch on is the extraordinary impact that he had through just one decision for my home state of Queensland. Tourism guru Sir Frank Moore was spearheading a charge to have Queensland bid to host the 1988 World Expo. Now, World Expos had to date been financially very onerous on the host countries. They had not always been financially successful. Sometimes the land around them was left uh, in very poor condition and undeveloped. But Queensland, riding on the back of 30 years of successful uh, management and, in, and administration by the National Party government, was confident. They had turned the state from an agrarian economy into a powerhouse in mining, in industrial development, cheap electricity, cheap land, cheap water. Uh, it had developed extraordinary tourism assets. And in, early, in the early 1980s, we knew that we were ready to host a world-leading exposition. However, regional is in the eye of the beholder. And the Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, believed that it was Sydney or Melbourne that should host such an event. But both Sydney and Melbourne didn't believe that they would be able to successfully hold such an event, that they didn't want the financial and other burdens. And so the Prime Minister had refused Queensland's request to go to Paris to uh, lodge a request for us to bid to hold this event. Now, unfortunately for the Prime Minister, he had had an accident on his farm and it hurt his back. And Doug Anthony, sworn in as the acting Prime Minister, uh, was in the top job. Now, Sir Frank Moore, ever the opportunist, quickly, uh, having heard the news on the radio that morning, quickly rang the Premier of Queensland and said to him that he must immediately ring the acting Prime Minister and put to him the idea that Brisbane should be the host of this uh, exposition. Now, Joe did exactly that. And Doug Anthony, acting with the decisive and future-looking vision that we'd heard of so much this afternoon, uh, immediately granted the request and Brisbane won the bid to host the expo, which went down to be one of the most successful expos ever held and was one of the very few to turn a profit. Now, I worked at that expo and I'm proud to see that it was a turning point for Queensland. We went to, having, uh, to being a very sleepy country town that closed at lunchtime on Saturday. Uh, there was no outdoor eating. Um, we didn't have the international quality hotels and events that we now have so many of. Uh, we had international acts that hosted the river that uh, were hosted by the river stage, um, and there are many extraordinary stories of good times at, uh, at the expo. <laughs> but it did. It changed the future of Brisbane and Queensland. It turned us into a confident city capable of hosting international events and capable of developing um, further uh, along the lines that we already had. Um, the, the bustling dining, entertainment and recreation precinct of South Brisbane is a jewel in Brisbane's crown and will forever be a legacy of Doug Anthony's brave and timely decision to back Queensland and back regional Australia. Thank you. There being no further speakers, I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank senators. 
Senators, it is also with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 17th of January 2021 of John Harold Sullivan, a former member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Longman, Queensland, from 2007 to 2010. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll commence by calling the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe for tomorrow is postponed to the 25th of February. Bis General business notice of motion 956 in the name of Senator Hanson Young for today to the 4th of February. Are there any other? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Mario Smith for Tuesday, the 2nd of February till Tuesday, the 11th of May, 2021, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other matters to, before I proceed to postponements and extensions? The clerk. Oh, no, we've done that, sorry, to the discovery of formal business. Um, no other matters. I'll proceed in the following order. Could I commence with matter number 963? Senator Patrick is not here. Uh, number 964 in the names of Senators O'Neill and Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I inform, the, I inform the chamber that all Labor senators, Senators Hughes, uh, also Senators Hughes, Henderson, Askew, Davy, Brockman, and Senators Griff and Patrick, and all Green senators will also sponsor the motion. And I ask that general business notice of motion number 964 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator. I Urquhart. move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, are you in a position to move your motion number 963? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 963 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Patrick. Mm. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, South Australia is at the forefront of the government's plan and $75 billion investment to ensure Australia has the maritime capabilities needed to defend Australia. The Osborne Naval Shipbuilding Hub grew by 300 jobs in 2020 to 2,800 jobs today and will continue to grow to 5,000 jobs by 2025. Likewise, at Henderson, uh, there are more than 1,300 jobs with more growth to occur with future build programs. This is giving Australian industry confidence and certainty in our shipbuilding plans. As part of our investment, the government is carefully considering the needs of our submarine capability, including on the future location of full-cycle docking activities for the Collins-class submarines. As we've made clear, a decision on this will be made after careful consideration of all the relevant information and advice on the, uh, and on the basis of what is in the national interest. Senator Patrick. I, I, I was remiss before. I just asked that Senator Gallagher, Gallagher, Alex Gallagher's name be uh, included as a co-sponsor to Thank this you, motion. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The question is that motion number 963 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 966 in the name of Senators Thorpe and Waters? Senator Seward. Oh. A to another motion and come back to that one, please. Okay, we'll come to that at the end then. We'll move to one's. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, could I come to your matter number 961? I set general business notice of motion number 961 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To uh, make a short statement, please. The leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Australia uh, has a track record of meeting and beating our international commitments. We've beaten our 2030, uh, sorry, 2020 target by 459 million tonnes, and we're on track to meet and beat our 2030 target. Australians are also deploying renewable energy at 10 times the global per person average. Uh, these are achievements Australians can and should be proud of. But climate change is a global problem requiring global action. Uh, and that's why Australia is committed to the Paris Agreement and uh, to investing in the new and emerging technologies that will make net zero emissions achievable. Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. One Nation opposes this motion. Once again, the Greens are pretending Australia has a carbon budget when it does not. Not content with pretending that climate change authority thought bubbles are actual legislation, now Senator Wish Wilson is giving the Senate the benefit of his advice on reducing a trace gas that is necessary for all life on Earth. Carbon budgets are scientific nonsense, and let me give you an example. The Drax power station in the, US, in the UK was recently converted from burning coal 
to burning trees. One would think the, tree, the Greens would be horrified at this destruction of forests, but no, this was a green energy initiative. Apparently in carbon budgets, carbon dioxide from coal is bad, but carbon dioxide from chopping down and burning trees is good. What? Mr President, I agree with Senator Wish Wilson that government policy should be underpinned by verified science. That's why an Office of Scientific Integrity and Quality Assurance would help the government shape policy based on science, not the Greens' parallel universe. Senator Gallagher. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, the Labor won't be supporting this motion. We do support strong action on climate change to create jobs, reduce emissions and improve affordability and reliability. As the Greens know, science-based targets should be determined by a transparent government-led process that respects the views of experts and the community. The Morrison government has refused to initiate such a process because it's hostage to the climate deniers in its rank, and Labor is the only party of government that will take the science of climate change seriously. Question is motion number 961 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 961 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. Um, Senators Thorpe and Waters, before I move to the more complex motions that I think we might be splitting, are we in a position to deal with matter 966? I'll give you a moment to get back to your seat. Thank you. Senator Waters. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. You're in Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 966 be taken as a formal motion. So any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the government's first priority is to keep Australians safe. Violent, violence against women and children can never be excused or justified. For those who need help, it is available. Since 2013, the government has invested over $1 billion to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. This includes $150 million the Commonwealth Government committed for the COVID-19 Domestic and Family Violence Support Package and the $340 million for the Fourth Action Plan. The decision to legislate coercive control sits with the states and territories, and we welcome the work being undertaken by the New South Wales Attorney-General to investigate the options for legislative reform on behalf of his state and territory colleagues. The question is that motion number 966 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi, could I ask you to deal with matter number 962? Um, thank you, Mr. President. I inform the chamber that Senator Keneally will also sp sponsor the motion, and I ask the general business notice of motion number 962 be taken as a formal motion. Thank you. Senator Dunham. Oh, sorry. Are you going to ask that it be moved first? Oh, sorry, quite right. Um, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. Senator, Senator Dunham, my apologies. Uh, the government would like to split how this question is going to be put and um, would seek that part A sub paragraphs 1, 2, uh, 4 and 5, along with part B, be put separately to part A sub uh, paragraph 3. And in doing so, can I seek leave to make a short statement? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The government strongly condemns all forms of extremism and white supremacy. There, are, there is no place in our community for any individual or group who seeks to promote disharmony. Australia is one of the most successful multicultural nations in the world. We are proud to welcome people from all backgrounds and we give everyone a fair go, regardless of where they come from. It's disappointing that the Greens are seeking to misrepresent the Deputy Prime Minister who has made it clear that he condemns all forms of violent protests. The government supports the right of any Australian to protest. However, these protests must be peaceful and must be lawful. When protests involve the loss of life and damage to property,
This is to be condemned, no matter the circumstances. As such, the government requests, as I've already outlined, that the questions be split. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Farouk. His motion describes Australia as being made up of First Nations people and migrants. Senator, I am not a migrant. I was born in Australia. Countless millions of Australians were born in Australia. They're not migrants either. Their parents and grandparents and great grandparents were born in Australia. They're not migrants. Here is yet another deliberate example of truth denied by a Greens member. Senator Faruqi demonstrates how out of touch, touch with reality she and her party are with Real Australia. As she attempts to divide our people on racial lines, I am opposed to all extremism. Senator Faruqi had a great Order. opportunity to receive cross-party support had she simply condemned all extremism, both left and right. We will not be supporting the motion. The question is, Order. Order. The question is that all parts of this motion, other than clause A, Roman numeral three, all parts of the motion, other than that, order. Sen Look, Senator Hanson Young, dealing with if people um, are respected when they move and speak to motions, this chamber works a lot more easily. I, you don't need to mutter as I'm making a ruling. The question is that all as parts of this motion, other than clause A, Roman numeral three, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now that clause A, Roman numeral three, also be agreed to as part of the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that Clause A, Roman numeral 3 of Motion 962 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we have one motion remaining. Please remain in the chamber. The question is now number 965 in the name of Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 965 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator oh, Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. That the question be split, and if we could put part A separate from part B and C, and in doing so, make a sh seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We strongly support the sentiments expressed in paragraphs B and C of this motion. Australia's priority is to suppress the virus and deliver the vaccine. As the member for Hughes said in a statement today, this morning I had a meeting with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister reinforced the importance of ensuring public confidence in the government's vaccine strategy. I agreed to support the government's vaccine rollout, which has been endorsed by medical experts. I have always sought to support the success of our nation's public health response during the pandemic. I believe that the spread of misinformation can damage the success of our public health response during the pandemic. Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is, is leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. One Nation opposes this motion. Senator Watt is on thin ice talking about mistruths. Only yesterday, Senator Watt said on Twitter that resource workers could rely on Labor. Just two hours later in the Senate, just two hours later in the Senate, he voted against a new coal-fired power station in the Hunter. Senator Watt might be happy to throw beleaguered MP Joel Fitzgibbons under a bus in New South Wales, yet the Senator threw resource workers in our own state under a bus when he and Labor voted against a coal plant for Collinsville in North Queensland. The truth is, resource workers cannot rely on Labor. That's why Labor is now misdirecting to deflect attention away from selling out the old Labor Party's heartland, the real Labor Party's former base. Before I put the motion, I'm going to remind all senators that the privilege of making a one-minute statement on behalf of one's party colleagues is a privilege granted by the unanimous consent of the entire Senate. It is a courtesy that is granted to explain a party's position on a motion that is being put without debate. It is not considered to be an opportunity to debate other matters or indeed to substantially debate the issue itself. Any single senator can deny leave, and I am not obliged to name the senator that denies leave. 
I remind senators this section is one based on courtesy rather than the standing orders. I will now put the motion. I, as requested, um, I've been asked to put Math Clause A separately, so I'll put that first. Those in support of Clause A of the motion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will now put Parts B and C together. Those of that opinion in support of those two clauses say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Um, I will give senators a moment to return their seat to their seats before we proceed to the first speech of Senator Small. I'll ask senators to take their seats. They're going to remain in the chamber. Senators, pursuant to order, I will now call Senator Small to make his first speech, and I ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. More than 10 years ago, I was on shift as a volunteer ambulance officer in a suburb of Bunbury when my partner and I were dispatched to transfer a palliative cancer patient from home to the hospital. It wasn't tasked as a medical emergency, but little did I know that one of the more profound experiences of my life was about to unfold. Arriving at the house, we discovered that the patient was from a large Italian migrant family. We'll call him Giuseppe. He was in a bedroom by himself, so lumbering down a corridor with heavy bags of medical equipment. I was shocked to enter the darkened room and discover a mere shadow of a man lying on the bed. It always pays to stay quite chipper as an ambo, so no matter how confronting the scene, so I breezily introduced myself and informed Giuseppe that we were going to whiz him across the bed onto our stretcher, pop him up to the hospital. At which point this emaciated figure in front of me simply said, no, you won't. Trying to hide my surprise, I inquired as to how Giuseppe fancied getting to the hospital if it wasn't with our help. Son, he said, I came to this country before you were born. I built this house myself and spent 25 years raising my family here, so I will walk out of here one more time. All of the relatives in earshot burst into tears, my partner started misting up, and I have to confess that I struggled not to start the waterworks myself as this incredibly frail figure slowly hauled himself out of bed and dragged himself down the corridor using only the wall for support over what seemed an agonising eternity. Giuseppe collapsed on the front porch, having walked out of his house for the last time. I relay this story to the Senate for a simple reason, and that is that it, this story in aggregate has made our nation what it is. We are here today standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us, those who weren't afraid to work hard, take risks, care for their families, embrace their communities, and who were resilient in the face of adversities that my generation can barely comprehend. We're all shaped by our experiences, and each of us has a story. We bring only our perspectives and values to this place, all with a desire to do right by the Australian people we represent. I come to this chamber acutely aware that behind the simple slogans of modern politics is the lived experience of many, including many migrants who collectively 
have made us the most successful multiracial migrant nation on earth. I am, of course, standing here tonight in the place of a migrant, the incomparable Matthias Cormann. Matthias came to the Senate remarking that this is a country where, if you put your shoulder to the wheel, work hard, embrace the people and the values, and become an integral part of the community. In short, if you have a go, there is no limit to what you can achieve. Matthias, in taking the baton, I hope to make these big shoes you've left go a long way yet. It is impossible to rise in the Senate tonight without mention of the incredible people who have shared the journey of my life so far, each of them contributing in part to making me the person that I am. It would be an impossible task to do these amazing humans justice by simply listing them out, and indeed we'd be here all night. Suffice to say, then, you all know who you are, and I hope that you know how deeply I value you. The Australia that I see is an ever stronger, prouder and more prosperous nation, and I will strive for that through an unwavering commitment to allow ordinary Australians to be rewarded for their efforts, face lower taxes and experience the benefits of free trade, a healthy federation and the personal freedoms and responsibilities that we hold dear. In realising such a vision, I hold one thing to be self-evident, that to change the Australia of tomorrow, we must first understand the Australia of today and accept the Australia of yesterday, as it is, as it was and not as we might have wanted it. To illustrate this necessity, consider a tale of two towns in Western Australia's goldfields, the towns of Leinster and Leonora. Some four hours' drive north of Kalgoorlie is the town of Leinster, where I spent time growing up as a child. It has a permanent population of approximately 700 people who call an ambulance 35 times a year, mainly for medical emergencies. Leonora is just over an hour's drive from Leinster, also has a population of 700, but with a high proportion of Aboriginal Australians. They call an ambulance more than 300 times a year, with two-thirds of trauma calls relating to assault and domestic violence. This tale of two towns is all the more tragic because pushing tokenistic policies does nothing to alter the lived experience in disadvantaged communities. This is the gap to close, the soft bigotry of low expectations writ large in the human misery that unfolds every day in our nation. The more that we obsess over symbolism as a way to alter the past, the less that is said about changing lives in Australia today and the more deafening the silence about affording all Australians greater opportunity tomorrow. Reconciliation must afford opportunity but not special privilege. It must afford equality but not preference. This objectivity is confronting and yet essential if we are to make progress as a nation, affording reward for effort and a genuine safety net for those who, through no fault of their own, find themselves upon hard times. One of the greatest opportunities for my home state, and indeed our nation, lies in challenging long-standing norms around unemployment and the participation rate. These aren't just statistics, no matter how good the trend over time. Because in reality, the numbers represent an aggregated deprivation of self-worth, happiness and health. It is something that I commit to pursuing with vigour, as every job is life-changing for the incumbent. Matters of employment are of great personal interest to me, not only as a compassionate person who believes in the dignity of meaningful work, but also as a small business owner who has direct experience of hiring hard-working Australians and seeing firsthand the social and economic benefits that work can provide. The false caricature of an aristocratic employer rapaciously exploiting the downtrodden, the vulnerable and the weak in a relentless pursuit of ill-gotten gains is, frankly, centuries out of date. Such a view denies a fundamental premise of modern Australia in that most Aussies are fair-minded and hard-working, whether they be employees or employers. Like millions of other Australians, I had a dream of building my own small business, which has grown to employ more than 30, <coughs> excuse me, 30 people, including a number who were registered with the Disability Services Agency. So I know 
what it is when we speak of the best form of welfare being a job. And I'm particularly proud that each of the individuals who joined us wanted a go, got a go and stayed the course. One of my former employees has even gone on to start his own small business. What great Australian stories these are. Indeed, almost one in two employees in Australia work in a small business of less than 20, meaning most employers are tradies, restaurateurs, retailers or farmers, working cheek by jowl, day after day, starting early, staying late, sacrificing and investing. These are the employment relationships that have built modern Australia. Employers in the modern economy have their interests best served by an engaged, agile, free-thinking and committed employees. Those same employees in turn benefit from the superior business performance of an organisation that has the flexibility to change, adapt, trade and prosper. The idea that we need more government red tape between an employer and employee too often stops employers hiring at all. Simplicity, certainty and flexibility are the watchwords of a reformed industrial and employment relations framework that creates opportunity for all Australians. Every dollar that we take off a person or a business reduces the incentive to strive for all. And we must remember that the taxpayer is not an imaginary money tree. Taxpayers are real people that have gone by different names over time. Forgotten people, Howard Battlers, Quiet Australians or even Bob and Nancy Stringback. Whenever we speak of subsidy, commission, plan or initiative in this place, we must have the courage to look them in the eye and explain that we are taking more of their money that they have earned for themselves and their families. These hard-working Australians don't live on Twitter, don't always read the paper, almost certainly aren't members of a political party and would never march through the streets of a city with superglue or snorkels. But they do value honesty in political leadership and will quietly nod their heads in a lounge room when a politician actually talks some sense. From this day forth, I will strive to be that sort of representative for the people of Western Australia. In this new age of social media, cancel culture, woke revolution and whatever else is trending this minute, Nobody seems inclined to remind Australians that, as our forebears learned, we simply cannot turn to government to solve all of our problems. Government shouldn't compete with an efficient and wealth-creating private sector because it isn't fair that a business should have to compete against a government entity that faces no pressure to be profitable and no risk of bankruptcy whilst backed by your tax dollar. So government must enable private enterprise, not shackle it. For it is business, small and large, that pays wages and generates wealth in this country. Fundamentally, that's why it's imperative that the government create the right conditions for businesses to grow, employ and prosper, and why we must enhance personal responsibility, reward for effort and the incentive to strive in the Australian economy. Through having travelled extensively and worked in and with many countries around the world, I have seen the full political spectrum of public economic control and its impacts on the lived experience under those regimes. This has given me a deep appreciation of why the Australian economy is as successful as it is. My professional career was devoted to the energy industry and from that I am very cognisant of the fact that energy affects all aspects of life. Households know too well the apprehension of opening a power bill after a hot summer. But less widely understood is the impact of energy prices on business, businesses that exist today and businesses that can exist tomorrow. Australia is blessed with both abundant reserves of cheap, efficient, low emissions energy from conventional sources and the opportunity to diversify our economy to export new energies to the world. The economic imperative for cheap, reliable energy to households and industry is timeless. But the way in which we meet that imperative is a live discussion. Governments of all stripes face uh, temptation to pick winners in this high-stakes game, but we must be strident in avoiding the distortion of direct interference in energy markets. In setting policy frameworks that allow supply competition, consumer choice and employment flexibility, 
I see private capital efficiently solving the continuing needs for energy at home and creating whole new industries to export to the world. In learning from the way my home state has both fostered the resources and energy sectors and combining it with appropriate policy leadership focused on Australia's national interest, government can create the foundation from which our success as a nation will reach new heights with unprecedented value creation and employment. So the answer to these problems is not more government, but less. The answer is not more bureaucracy, but less. The answer is not more taxation, but less. We will be successful in delivering good government only if we appeal to the pride of Australians, not by appealing to their wallets. We should promise only the dignity of hard work, not the spoils of work, hard work done by others. Every time the bells ring in this place, there lies the possibility that opportunity and incentive can be extinguished by weight of regulation, restriction or red and green tape, and we are the only guardians against that. Having bold policy ambition is easy, but delivering meaningful change is a different matter altogether. Elected representatives often speak of the honour and privilege that comes with doing people's work. Just as any freedom is accompanied with responsibility in equal measure, I believe that the privilege of representation comes with a duty to deliver outcomes. So I will, never, I will strive never to mistake activity for progress and never conflate well-intentioned words in here with the grim reality after dark in Leonora. So in standing ready to push my boat away from the shore and set sail into the uncharted waters of my parliamentary journey, I am very mindful of the oft-quoted reflection that in my dying embers I shall forever regret. When I'm right, nobody remembers, and when I'm wrong, nobody forgets. To represent Western Australia in this place is a deep honour. I hope always to do so in a way that embodies those characteristics for which Western Australians are best known. Tenacity, practicality, ingenuity and, dare I say it, a slight irreverence. This chamber is a deliberative body and one charged with important work. Yet even in this era, I think, I think there is still room for a bit of the humour that has long characterised the Australian temperament and is still the quality for which our best-remembered parliamentarians on all sides are most often recalled. So like Giuseppe, when I walk out of this place for the last time, I want it to be standing tall with a deep sense of pride and the satisfaction that in some way our nation is all the better for my contribution here. I thank the Senate. And congratulations. And I appreciate the restraint of senators not exercising the normal custom of congratulating Senator Small individually, given the restrictions in place. Congratulations, Senator Small. I inform the Senate. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator Lyons. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency. One, expressing support for the many multicultural and First Nations Australians who are vilified and threatened by far-right extremists and who deserve to feel safe in their communities. And two, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and Minister for Home Affairs, Mr Dutton, taking action to combat the spread of far-right extremism and destructive conspiracy theories both within their party and in the broader community. Yours sincerely, Sue Lyons, Deputy President. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr President. It has been said that generals too often prepare to fight the last war instead of the next one. Now, that might be unfair to generals, but it is certainly fair comment on the attitude of the Morrison government 
in regard to protecting Australia's national security, maintaining public safety and sustaining Australia's multicultural pluralist democracy. As we know from the evidence at the Senate estimates of ASIO Director General Mr Mike Burgess, the activities of far-right white supremacist movements is increasing in this country. The agency now spends up to 40 per cent of its time keeping far-right groups under surveillance. Mr Burgess told the hearing, and I want to quote him at some length, right-wing extremists are more organised, sophisticated, ideologically and active than in recent years. While I've been actively monitoring the threat of some time, we are now reprioritising to focus additional resources on the evolving threat. Many of these groups and individuals have seized upon COVID-19, believing it reinforces the narrative and conspiracies at the core of the ideologies. They see the pandemics as proof of the failure of globalisation, of multiculturalism and democracy, and confirmation of a societal collapse and a race war that are inevitable. And that was uh, presented to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Estimates Committee on the 20th of October last year. The Director General's comments should be added uh, the the, uh, the observations in the hearing by the AFP Deputy Commissioner, Ian McCartney, who noted that right-wing extremists had become more widespread in Australia than Islamic-inspired extremism. Mr Carty said Islamic extremism, and I quote, predominantly and historically been centred in Sydney and Melbourne, and to a lesser extent in Brisbane. But what we see within right-wing extremism, particularly in effect of the power on the internet in terms of those sites, is that apparently it's been spread throughout Australia. These comments are to be considered the assessments of the two most senior public servants who are directly concerned with Australia's internal security. They acknowledge that far-right extremism is growing and has spread virulently through the internet. Now, that should not be surprising. It's consistent with what we know about the growth of neo-fascist and white supremacist movements in other liberal democracies. But the response of the Morrison government to all this has mostly been a deafening silence. I don't expect this government should comment directly on specific intelligence investigations, but surely the government should insist publicly, clearly and emphatically that it is committed to upholding the values of Australia's pluralist democracy. It should reassert the, the ethnic and religious minorities who are threatened by far-right extremists that their safety will be protected in this country, and they should share that the rights and liberties are available to all Australians, irrespective of their background, irrespective of their religious beliefs. How different to the past decades when the fears of jihadist terrorism has sparked a legislative frenzy. From 2014 to 2020, some 31 items of national security legislation have been passed by this parliament. Powers of the security have increased the security agencies, including powers of detention, surveillance, have increased uh, been, uh, opportunities to actually deprive people of their citizenship. But don't misunderstand me. The Labor Party has backed those measures. We accepted the necessity to improve some of these measures with amendments. But what I'm drawing attention to is that the zeal with which successive coalition governments have pursued these threats, these, the zeal is in stark contrast to the stony silence that largely continues to be the government's response to the warnings of our security agencies about the far right. Now, it took media reports of a neo-Nazi training camp in the Garampians in Victoria during the Australia Day weekend to get any acknowledgement by the government of what actually was happening there. The Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, condemned what could no longer be ignored. But what's the Prime Minister said about the matter? It's not only the warnings of the security agencies that the government should have heeded, it's the growth of the far right has been evident throughout the West internationally, 
And I'm referring here, of course, we've seen the situation with regard to the Christchurch mosque massacre in March last year, in which the per perpetrator was an Australian who may well have committed those same atrocities here. Look at what happened in Norway in 2011, where 69 young political activists from the Norwegian Labor Party were gunned down—69 young people at a summer camp. The events in Washington just in this January inspired by the most senior members of that administration. We've been led by far-right people driven by the sort of internet-propagated fantasies that Deputy Commissioner McCartney drew attention to that operate in this country. These events and those behind them have had a disturbing history. We've seen them date back to the end of the Cold War. The West, and of course, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a presentation of a triumph of liberal democracy, a triumph which, which was short-lived. Because reactionary nationalism, incited by far-right populists, has proved to be far more potent than liberalism. You look at the situation in Russia, you look at the situation in Hungary, where liberal democracy has been all but extinguished. The Orban government in Hungary has under mind the country's independent judiciary and free media. It's been whipped up by a xenophobia about immigrants and ancient hatreds of minorities. We're seeing similar trends in Poland. We're seeing the re-emergence of SS remembrance and glorification in Eastern Europe. Far-right extremism is not confined to Eastern Europe. We've seen it in France and Germany and Italy. We see it in Brexit, the referendum in the United Kingdom. We see it in Donald Trump's presentation and, and, and mobilisation in the United States. These are dark times, far from the expectations of the neoliberal triumphalism of the early 1990s. Now, look, I urge colleagues, particularly those conservative colleagues, to look at the historic lessons that are, can be drawn from this. In recent works by uh, Ivan Krastev and Stephen Holmes in books such as The Light That Failed, The Reckoning, are object lessons in the dangers of ignoring this. The Morrison government should have learnt from this historic experience, from contemporary examples, because all too often members of this government have been playing with the far right in this country. And I'll leave the details to my colleague, uh, Senator Ayres. What happens when ideologues exploit the fears of people in a manner to undermine the legitimacy and, of course, the authority of democratic institutions? Is there any wonder that there has been a reduction in trust? in the political institutions in this country. People have been encouraged to blame minorities for the exclusion from the opportunities that a fair society can offer them. It's only a short step to blaming the system itself. This is how fascism starts. The Morrison government needs to acknowledge what is happening. It needs to ignore the cranks and conspiracy theorists on its own backbench. And it needs to ensure that Australia remains a free, fair and democratic society and that we defend those principles of democracy that are so important to the future prosperity of this nation. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Quite often I rise in this place and, Madam Acting Deputy President, the person sitting in your spot sometimes mistakenly refers to me as Senator Carr. And typically, in response to that, I say, well, I'm not insulted by that because I do have a high regard for Senator Carr, and I've learned a lot from Senator Carr serving with him on a number of committees established in this place. However, today, I must say I am completely at odds with his characterisation of my party. 
And I think the most disappointing thing about this resolution, and I note that it is not Senator Carr's resolution, it comes from Senator Lyons, is in part two it refers to the spread of far-right extremism and destructive conspiracy theories, and I quote, both within their own party and in the broader community, end quote. And those are the words that really disappoint me, because I believe if we are to be successful in defeating extremism in this country, those of us who consider anti-Semitism, fascism, uh, extremism of all types to be vile and unacceptable in our society, we need to come together. We need to come together. And we should seek in our rhetoric in this place to bring each other together rather than to throw stones at each other. And I am going to talk about anti-Semitism in this context. I am going to talk about anti-Semitism in this context. And I know Senator Carr is a passionate opponent of anti-Semitism in all of its forms in our community. But I just want to use that particular vile type of extremism as an example, as an example to demonstrate that extremism is not wholly the domain of the far right. It occurs in the left as well. So if those people coming into this place want to be sanctimonious and throw stones at this side of the chamber, they better be prepared to hear the sound of shattering glass. So let me quote to you from the Executive Council of Australian Jury, Anti-Semitism in Australian Report 2018. And I'm not going to specifically name the members of the left who are referred to in this report. I'm not going to refer to the members of the left. I don't want to make it personal, but I'm just going to quote the number of case studies. So the first one, a New South Wales Labor Upper House MP and opposition whip at the time of this report. He refused entry to a leader of the New South Wales Jewish community at the launch of the Labor Union Multicultural Action Committee on 13 August 2018. The Labor Union Multicultural Action Committee itself did not invite any representatives of the Jewish community to the launch, but representatives from other ethnic communities and organisations were invited. More than 10 other ethnic community organisations expressed outrage at the discrimination and exclusion of the Jewish leadership and community." End quote. That's example number one from the left, Senator Carr. I now refer to example number two, again from the left. And this was a Labor member of parliament between the years 2007 to 2016. Senator Carr may well be able to uh, identify them, I suspect, as may Senator Stirl. And this person was the Labor candidate for the 2019 federal election in the WA seat of Curtin before they had to withdraw their candidacy. And let me quote to you the vile statement, the vile misinformation expressed by this person, a candidate for the Federal Labor Party. And I quote, one case I remember vividly, a pregnant refugee woman ordered at a checkpoint in Gaza to drink a bottle of bleach. It burnt out all her throat and insides. Fortunately, her baby was saved. Another refugee was forced to put her baby through the x-ray machine." End quote. A vile lie and misrepresentation and misinformation from an endorsed Labor candidate who thankfully, thankfully did not pursue her nomination and did not stand for election. And in response to this misinformation, this vile information from the left, a journalist by the name of James Campbell responded, considering the long history of slanders of the Jewish people, it's really quite an achievement to be an innovator. After all, this is a people that has been accused over the centuries of sacrificing Christian children to obtain blood for Passover bread and nursing a plan for global domination." End quote. Let's go to example number three, a Labor candidate in the Northern Territory at the last election who put up on Facebook something entitled Rothschild Zionism. The Labor Senate candidate for the Northern Territory posted anti-Semitic conspiracy theories on Facebook. These came to light during the election campaign. He posted an image in October 2016 of Jacob Rothschild. Both items were in support of David Icke, 
an absolutely vile human being and his conspiracy theory that the Rothschild family secretly run the world by controlling the media, governments and global finance. Ick is also known for his anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that the world is run by a secret society of Jewish shape-shifting lizards. This was a Labor candidate at the last federal election. A Labor candidate at the last federal election. And before Senator Faruqi contributes to this debate, let me say I've got examples of Green candidates and Green members of parliament who also, also appear in these reports. And of course, that Labor candidate endorsed Labor candidate was forced to resign as the Labor candidate in April 2019. A person who I greatly admire in relation to combat, combating anti-Semitism is a lady by the name of Deborah Lipstadt. She was the person who took that vile Holocaust denier, David Irving, to court and won. She actually won when he brought a defamation case. And let me quote to you from her great book, which I recommend to all those people in this chamber. It's called Anti-Semitism Here and Now. And I quote from page 67. I'll close by referring to a comment I made at the outset of this exchange. When I expressed the hope that my answers would leave both those on the right and the left, on the right and the left, discomforted. That discomfort should be caused by an acknowledgement on everyone's part, everyone's part, Madam Acting Deputy President, that extremism and anti-Semitism are found not only among people on the other side of the political spectrum, as long as we are blind to it in our midst, our fight against it will be futile." End quote. That is the great Deborah Lipstadt from her book Anti-Semitism Here and Now. And finally, I quote also from the 2020 report of the Executive Council of the Australian Jury, and they say, and I quote from page 101 of their report, there is a distinct overlap between sections of the far right and far left when it comes to Jews and or Israel. Nazi-style Jew-hating comments have frequently been posted on anti-Israel or pro-Palestinian social media pages of ostensibly left-wing organisations and elicit supportive posted comments." End quote. So it greatly concerns me, Madam Acting Deputy President, that in this place there are those who seek to make political, short-term political issues out of these matters. We must unite as a community, as a country, against vile extremism, whether or not it's from the left or the right. This should not be a political matter in this chamber. We should unite as a country and provide a united front and support to all groups in our society, whether or not they are our Indigenous Australians, people who are multi-generation Australians or our newest migrants. Certainly my community in Queensland expects me to do that, and I request them to judge my performance in that, this regard. On what I say in this place every single day, I have the honour of serving here. As our premise, pre, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said, at his National Press Club address on Monday. I know Australia is the most successful multicultural country in the world. And one of the reasons for that is because of the Senator Cars who will get up and speak, will speak passionately against anti-Semitism. One of the reasons for that is the Ron Boswells from my own state of Queensland, who for many years spoke out against far right. We need to be united, united against extremism in our country. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the matter of urgency for the Chamber. And as senators would know, this is an issue that is front of my mind as the Green spokesperson for anti-racism and as the only Muslim senator in this place. First, I think the aspect of this urgency motion most critical, which I thank Senator Lyons for bringing on, relates to the Prime Minister and Mr. Dutton taking action to combat far-right extremism within their own party. 
In my first speech to the Senate back in August 2018, I said the existence of racism, sexism, and other discrimination is not new, but what has changed is its legitimization, normalization, and encouragement in the media and in politics. Political leaders, in addition to their old habit of racist dog whistling, are now comfortable outright fanning the flames of racial conflict. Reflecting on those words two and a half years later, it deeply disturbs me how this process of normalization I spoke about has not reversed or corrected itself, but in fact worsened. Far-right politics are more mainstream than ever. The government has shown zero interest in dealing with this existential threat to our diverse community. It was good to see significant pressure placed on the Prime Minister over the last couple of days to condemn and distance himself from the dangerous COVID conspiracy theorizing of the member for Hughes, Craig Kelly. But similar pressure should also be put on him to condemn the numerous government MPs who have made a habit of peddling far-right hate politics. There is no excuse for the toxic hate that is being spread. It is dangerous. It kills people. It harms communities. Just before Parliament rose last year, I asked questions and spoke in this chamber about the Christchurch mosque attacks, Royal Commission report, which had just been released in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And during my contributions, in which I spoke specifically about how the terrorist who killed 51 Muslims was found to have held an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. I said that any denial or obfuscation of this simple fact is an insult to the targets. During my remarks, multiple government senators shouted back at me, including, and I remember this very distinctly, he was a communist, someone said. This really rattled me. If your response to the devastating murder of 51 innocent people is to default to a conspiratorial deflection about the terrorist being anything but a fascist, then we may as well pack up, give up, and head home. This isn't theoretical for us. This isn't a meaningless political game. These are our lives. When you don't take this seriously, when you dismiss it, with nonsensical, offensive deflections. The message that sends it to me and other Muslims is this. We don't care about you. We don't care about your community. We choose to either say in twisted denial or actively sympathetic to far-right politics. When I called out the Deputy Prime Minister last month for shamefully comparing the white supremacist uprising at the US Capitol with Black Lives Matter, and his use of the far-right slogan, All Lives Matter, my office was once again bombarded by messages of hate, including over social media, email, and multiple very toxic and vile phone calls. We know why Mr. McCormack used the slogan and made that comparison. He reckons there's a constituency out there for him. He thinks he can use it to electoral advantage. This is a sign of complete moral bankruptcy. You lot over there, together with your Prime Minister, won't say a word to condemn him or to pull him up because you are salivating after those voters that the far-right Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party has taken away from you. Shame on you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There can be no doubt uh, that in our country, far-right extremism is a real and growing problem. Uh, there are some out there who want to pretend that this is just an irrelevancy, it's really not an issue, people are silly to be getting upset about it, but it is a real and growing problem. Uh, as Senator Faruqi has said, unfortunately, an Australian was the perpetrator of the Christchurch Church massacre in New Zealand not too long ago. Uh, we see neo-Nazi rallies and gatherings uh, in our own country all too often and with growing crowds, increasingly organised over social media. Uh, as Senator Carr has stated, ASIO, in evidence to Senate Estimates Committees, 
uh, has advised that about 40 per cent of their work now is involved in dealing with far-right extremism, and that rate is growing. Now, this growth of far-right extremism, very sadly, is heavily targeted at some of the most vulnerable communities in our country. Our First Nations people, migrants, Muslims, anyone who doesn't sit fit a certain stereotype propagated by these far-right groups. And of course, while those vulnerable groups bear the brunt of this far-right extremism, in a way that I think many people can't possibly understand if they haven't experienced it themselves, this real and growing form of extremism in our country is a risk to all of us. It is a genuine risk to lives and it is a risk to Australia's values, our support for democracy, our support for a fair go for everyone in our country and, a, and, and our support for making sure that everyone is looked after in our country. And that's why we need to take this seriously. That's why all of us in this parliament, regardless of our party, regardless of where we come from, that's why all of us need to treat it seriously and tackle it. And it is extremely disappointing uh, that we see over and over again this government not take this risk, risk seriously. Uh, now, for some time now, we've seen what are described as rogue backbenchers of this government, in particular people like Mr Kelly and Mr Christensen, flirting day and night with extreme right groups and pushing their views, usually sourced from the United States right-wing groups, pushing those views into the Australian population through their heavily subscribed social media channels. Uh, and over and over again, we have seen the Prime Minister and other senior ministers of this government fail to take action and rein them in. Uh, and it's even worse when it reaches the level of the Deputy Prime Minister of this country, who most recently uh, used, not just echoed, but used an infamous far-right slogan from the United States, All Lives Matter. He tried to treat it as a joke. Uh, he tried to say it wasn't serious. He tried to say it was just a statement of the obvious. But he very well knows, as does every member of this government, that that is a far-right slogan used for a reason, to enrage and stir up that form of extremism that we are seeing increasingly in the US and in our own country. So it is a problem that from backbenchers to the second highest office in the land, we are seeing members of this government propagate these views, support them, or at the very least fail to rein them in. Now, the response that is usually given and probably will be given in this debate when members of the opposition and others point out the seriousness of this is that everyone's got a right to an, an opinion, there's a right to free speech, and we should defend that. Well, members opposite need to remember that there has never in this country been an unrestricted right to free speech. With, with speech comes responsibility. We have always had limitations on free speech, whether it be defamation laws, whether it be restricting people from spreading terrorist ideology, whether it be about companies not being able to mislead consumers. With speech comes responsibility, and it's about time this government took that seriously and took the growing risk of far-right extremism seriously too. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. So just please let me be incredibly clear here. All forms of hatred and division are unacceptable, whatever the ideology. We all should be proud that Australia is one of, if not the most, successful multicultural countries in the world. We're proud to welcome people from all backgrounds. We give everyone a fair go, regardless of where they're from. And as Australians and as a government, when racism does occur, we call it out. We condemn it. And the Morrison government is absolutely committed 
to protecting our nation from all threats, whether they be from the extreme right or the extreme left. We make no distinction where there are threats to the Australian community. Keeping Australians safe is our government's highest priority, be it through COVID or terrorist threats. Our laws and arrangements are agnostic. We focus on the threat, the criminality, not the motivation and not the ideology. In fact, just last December, the Minister for Home Affairs referred an inquiry to the PJCIS into extremist movements and radicalism in Australia. And in doing so, the Minister has asked the committee to give particular consideration to the motivations and capacity for violence of extremist groups, including far-right extremist groups, and to consider changes that could assist the Commonwealth's ter terrorist organisation listing laws to ensure that they provide a barrier to those who may seek to promote an ideological extreme in, in Australia. But the committee will look further than that. They have also been tasked with inquiring into the influence of extremist groups that fall short of the legislative thresholds for prescription as a terrorist organisation, any steps that can be taken to address hate speech. And Senator Watt might want to stay for this because I agree, free speech does not mean speech is free from consequence, and I don't think anyone denies that. Thresholds to regulate the use of symbols and insignia associated with terrorism and extremism. The committee is due to report by 30 April this year. But our commitment to pro properly fund the fight against extremism is further proof of our total lack of tolerance for any and all forms of extremism. This budget includes $63 million of social cohesion measures to bring Australians together, $37.3 million to promote Australian values, identity and social cohesion, and counter-malign information online, $17.7 million to enhance engagement with multicultural communities, $7.9 million to establish a research program to inform initiatives to strengthen social cohesion. In the last budget, the government provided an additional $571.4 million over five years to security agencies to keep Australians safe. ASIO's funding is at the highest level it's ever been in its more than 70 years of history. And the AFP has received an additional $300 million over four years to enhance its ability to respond to emerging threats. The Department of Home Affairs has had more than 10,000 engagements with key multicultural groups. It, that is a 51.9 per cent increase nationally. And throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has ensured that ads have been placed in selected media outlets, online, in print and on radio, reinforcing our clear position that racism is unacceptable. We've translated those into 16 languages, with support online in 63 languages other than, Australia, other than English. We know our values. I think we all in this place try to espouse those values, values that respect freedom and dignity of the individual, freedom of religion, commitment to the rule of law, which means that all people are subject to the law and should obey it. Our parliamentary democracy, whereby our laws are determined by parliaments elected by the people, those laws being paramount and overriding any other consistent, inconsistent religious or secular laws. Australia is truly the greatest multicultural country in the world. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. In February last year, the Director General of ASIO did not mince his words. He said in Australia, the extreme right wing threat is real and it is growing. In suburbs around Australia, small cells regularly meet to salute Nazi flags, inspect weapons, train in combat, and share their hateful ideology. These groups, he said, are more organised and security conscious than in previous years. What will it take for the government to take the threat as seriously as the Director-General of ASIO does? 
Many Australians have responded to the stress and anxiety of the global pandemic by trying to find an explanation other than science. Rich veins of misinformation have powered transnational conspiracy theories such as QAnon, the anti-vaccination movement, 5G protesters and the anti-lockdown movement. These movements are a vector of radicalisation. They share a direct, deliberate connection with the worldview of the far right, racism, anti-Semitism and white supremacy. Umberto, um, Umberto Eco said, at the root of fascist psychology lies an obsession with conspiracies. This has always been the history of fascism. It is a political movement that takes vulnerable people and makes them capable of violence. In recent days, there's been attention paid to Mr Kelly in his role in promoting exactly these kind of conspiracies. However, in addition, the member for Dawson has a number of deliberate and not accidental links to far-right extremism. He spoke famously at a Reclaim Australia rally in Mackay in 2015. In 2017, Mr Christensen appeared on a podcast called The Convict Report, produced by a white nationalist group called The Dingoes. Mr Christensen wasn't concerned at the podcast's history of extraordinarily anti-Semitic and racist propaganda. At the time, he told BuzzFeed, I know these dingo guys are a bit wild. So I have to say I don't agree with all their views. And yet he endorsed their anti-Semitism by saying that, get up, we all know it's George Soros funded. It's in the whole big worldwide movement of leftist organisations. Anti-Semitism deserves special condemnation. Invoking Soros, like the Rothschilds, is an old tactic of fascists and anti-Semites, a code for blaming Jews for the problems of ordinary people. We've seen the historical consequences of these beliefs. They must be condemned. They must be stamped out. In December of that year, one of the hosts of that podcast, Clifford Jennings, joined the New South Wales National Party. He would go on to lead the efforts by white supremacist groups to infiltrate the National Party, recruiting from an explicitly fascist Facebook group called the New Guard, Mr Jennings attempted to seize senior positions in the New South Wales branch of the Young Nationals. Within a year of Christensen appearing on a far-right podcast, the same far-right figures were active members of his political party. Mr Christensen has maintained connections to extreme right-wing media. In September of this year, he appeared on a 90-minute stream with far-right YouTuber Dia Beltran a prominent QAnon conspiracy theorist who also interviews Blair Cottrell, Neil Erickson and, how could we forget, Fraser, it's all right to be white, Anning. I know, he said on that show, I know someone who was very unfairly maligned in the Young Nationals when all of that happened, and that person was in no way, shape or form a Nazi. And then he went on to say, there was a claim that these people were neo-Nazis and I can tell you it was a lot of rubbish. He also told Beltran, you'd make a great member of parliament. You might just have to scrub some of the YouTube interviews that you've done. In December, Christian Sid appeared on another alt-right podcast, the Wilmsfront podcast of the Unshackled Network. The guy who hosts that hosts other absolutely anti-Semitic racist shows. Uh, so now that Mr Christian is campaigning for free speech to be protected on social media platforms, it's worth asking whose speech he actually wants to protect. Is it Avi Yamini, who once described himself as the world's proudest Jewish Nazi? Is it the New Guard Facebook group? Or is it the number of alt-right meme pages that Mr Christiansen himself follows on his personal Facebook page? Last year, Gizmodo published a full list of Facebook pages followed by Mr Christensen. These pages include one that's entitled Reject Degeneracy, Embrace Tradition, Many Enemies, Much Honour, which is a Mussolini quote, another one called The Art of the True Right, 
the Occidental Sentinel, the New Nationalist. These pages publish anti-Semitic and fascist propaganda, and it appears that they are supported by Mr Christensen. They deserve and he deserves the condemnation of this parliament. The National Party has a particular responsibility in this area. Radicalisation can occur anywhere, but the man who committed the Christchurch massacre grew up in Grafton in northern New South Wales, and he was radicalised in Grafton, reading the same fascist social media pages as Mr Christensen. New Zealand's Royal Commission into the Christchurch massacre notes that he would likely have performed this attack in Australia if not for our stringent gun laws. In March last year, a 23-year-old man was arrested in Nowra and charged with preparing or planning terrorist attacks. He was attempting to build an IED. In December, an 18-year-old man was arrested in Albury on terrorism-related charges. He had expressed neo-Nazi and anti-Semitic beliefs on social media and wanted to be involved in a mass casualty event. And in this year, in January, about 30 neo-Nazis celebrated Australia Day in Victoria's Grampian Mountains. They terrorised decent Australians in a country town, sung white power chants, posted stickers around town and even burned a cross. The people who claim to represent regional Australia have a responsibility to act and be clear not to play footsies with fascists or minimise the danger. The far right is a threat to Australian democracy, just like it is to American democracy. And I know that there are members and senators on the other side who take these threats and these issues just as seriously. They deserve leadership that takes them seriously as well. The Liberal Party must act on Mr Kelly. The National Party must act on Mr Christensen. The Prime Minister must act on both. Mr Christensen was always a disgrace. His association with far-right figures is a threat to public safety, promotes radicalisation, damages our social fabric and damages our global reputation. The Prime Minister must condemn unequivocally Mr Kelly for his advocacy of far-right conspiracy theories which make Australia less safe and undermine the campaign to protect us from COVID-19. He must condemn Mr Christensen for his support for fascist, racist and anti-Semitic ideas. He must remove him from Mr Christensen's leadership role as chair of the Joint Select Committee on Trade, Investment and Growth. He is a disgrace, a figure of fun for some, but his decline from disgrace to dangerous means he should be condemned by the parliament he should be disavowed by the Prime Minister and disendorsed by the Queensland LNP. I've listened carefully to the responses of uh, people on the other side in the government. It should not make the mistake of false equivalences. We should not make the mistake of equivocating the right of Australian politics with the far right. That is an incorrect thing to do. I will never do it, but what that requires on your side is leadership. What that requires is leadership. That requires acting on extremists. That requires dealing with them. That requires providing leadership to young people, vulnerable people, that the claptrap, the dangerous conspiracy theories that are propagated by these people, including Mr Christensen and Mr Kelly, should be condemned loudly everywhere by everybody in the government, including the Prime Minister, in order to stop radicalisation and to stop the rise of the far right. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I just wish those opposite would pay as much attention to the writing of their motions, their grammar and how they're constructed, uh, as they do to, those, as to the attention they pay those in the other place. I draw the uh, chamber's attention to the nonsensical nature of, of this motion from Senator Lyons and reading it uh, when I was asked to speak on it, I was shaking my head. In particular, Part B, which just doesn't seem to make any sense. Senator, is Senator Lyons meaning that the Morrison government is taking action? She means we're not. 
I'm completely unsure from her, her, her motion. But here we are. We, uh, we, we talk on it anyway because it's far too often that the Labor Party come into this chamber with nonsensical motions. And each time they do it, it just highlights the issues the Labor Party have faced since the Hawke and Keating governments. They clearly cannot clarify their own position. What do those opposites stand for? I really struggle to know. There is a reason that the Labor Party are stuck, stuck in opposition, and this motion is a clear example of that problem. They can't articulate a message, and they can't get the basics right. Once you start getting the basics right, then you can start thinking about the bigger picture, maybe like who your leader is. But until then, I suggest you stop thinking about and talking about yourselves and who's going to be the next leader of the opposition and focus on reading your motions before you table them for debate. So for those Australians listening and watching to today's debate, unsure of what the motion is trying to say, I'll try to clarify for you. The fact is that the Morrison government is taking action to combat the spread of far-right extremism and destructive conspiracy theories. I do think it is fair and right to say that I speak on this motion today as multiculturalism is an area that I'm deeply involved with and passionate about. Over the past 18 months since I've been in this place, I've sought to create closer ties across all communities in Australia and in particular with many multicultural communities. I've done this through, uh, I host a quarterly roundtable with the Consular Corps in Victoria to hear of the diaspora's problems, the problems they're facing, the challenges especially they've had during COVID and what we as a government can do to assist them. Uh, at the start of the COVID pandemic, there was experiences of racism in my home state. And I used this place to call out that racism and to encourage greater dialogue. During a speech I gave in here, I said, it troubles me that I could spend this entire time list listing instance instances of racism in my home state that have occurred over the recent time. My heart breaks when I put myself in the shoes of those facing those attacks to imagine what they would be feeling and what they are going through. It's unfathomable, yet it has become a reality for some. On the back of that speech, I wrote and had published opinion pieces in major newspapers in Singapore and Malaysia. I worked closely with some of the consul generals in Victoria, particularly those of China, Malaysia and Indonesia about the racism that was experienced. But we see um, extremism in many, many forms. And I hope that it's accepted by this place that over the past 18 months or so that I've been in the Senate, I've shown my commitment to calling out bigotry, vilification and extremism wherever I see it. But extremism isn't just an issue when it comes to the right wing of politics. And it isn't just an issue when it comes to the left wing. Extremism is dangerous in all, it, in all its forms. And in one of the committees I was on, we were calling out the, the danger of extremism of the animal welfare sector. So it has many, many forms. More troublingly, extremism erodes our public social cohesion. In November last year, the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, that's the Department of Home Affairs that Minister Dutton named in the motion, is the Minister for, Michael Pozzolo gave a speech to the Institute of Public Administration Australia entitled On Unity, the Elements of Social Cohesion. And I would recommend to all my colleagues in this place to take the time to read, watch or listen to this speech. It is incredibly powerful stuff. In this speech, he out outlines how much Australia is actually a socially cohesive nation and community. He argues that throughout 2020, as a nation, we showed this cohesion through our actions during the bushfires and through the pandemic. And I think everyone in here would agree with me that that's actually what happened. Unfortunately, there are people that want to divide us separate us and tell us that extremism, whether from the right or from the left, is growing substantively. That is, a community that is, as a community, we are less cohesive and more divided than ever before. And I couldn't disagree with this more. 
As Mr Pozzolo said in his speech, and I quote, today societies generally are more socially cohesive and economically stable as compared with Europe in the 1920s and 30s. Then we saw fracturing at the heart of European civilization and the rise of fascism and Nazism. The latter was the most monstrous tyranny that has ever darkened this world. It abused the notion of a united Germany and twisted it into an evil dictatorship which generated its malign power from oppression at large and the specific targeted the brutalisation of fellow Germans and others in the most horrendous case of the final solution were deemed not to be human and only fit for unspeakable horror of the gas chambers. We must never forget, we are not today remotely even close to that state of affairs. And as the partner of a Jewish woman, I know and live with the history of what extremism can do to a society. That is, Madam Acting Deputy President, real division, real breakdown of social cohesiveness. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, this does not mean that we don't take increases of extremism seriously. We do. And just this week, Mr Pozzolo, to quote him again, warned that the threat posed by violent right-wing extremists is no different to that by Islamist terrorists. Those opposite have correctly said that right-wing extremism is on the rise. There is no doubting that. But we do have to remember that this is starting from a very, very low base. That does not mean, however, that we do not investigate, track and try and break up any extremist groups before they do harm. We should also not over-exaggerate the risks and cause unneeded harm for ourselves. The Morrison government is absolutely committed to protecting our nation from all threats. And over the years, we have shown our commitment to do just that. As a government, we make no distinction in targeting threats to the Australian community. Our laws are agnostic. They focus on threat and criminality, irrespective of motivation or ideology. Australians from all walks of life should have confidence that Australia's counter-terrorism arrangements are working well to protect the community from all violent extremism. To ensure this, the Morrison government in the 2019-20 budget provided an additional $571 million over five years to our security agencies to keep Australians safe. Funding for ASIOs is the highest it's been in, in, more than it, in its more than 70-year history, and the AFP has received an additional $300 million over four years to enhance its ability to respond to emerging threats. This is not just words, but it instead it is real action and real support from the Morrison government, enabling our, society agents, our security agencies to continue to do the fantastic job they are doing in protecting us. And I just want to take a moment, Madam Acting Deputy President, to thank all the hardworking and dedicated members of our national security agencies. You all do exceptional work. Madam Acting Deputy President, there is no doubt we are a lucky country, but that doesn't just come by chance. It comes from our continued hard work, our shared values and democratic stability. We are the greatest multicultural society in the world and we should be proud of that. All people in Australia, whether you arrived here recently or your family have walked these lands since time immemorial, should never have to accept aggressive acts towards them. And I utterly condemn all forms of extremism, racism and behaviours against people in Australia. All Australians are currently facing the common challenge of COVID-19 and only together can we get through that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on this motion and I thank Senator Lyons for putting it before this chamber. It's very disturbing uh, to hear the comments that uh, people are making in this chamber. Uh, this is absolutely critical right now in this country because it's getting worse and there is a deep division in this country that we are meant to be uniting as people who represent our constituents and the people of Australia. 
it's deeply saddening that we have a government who are so connected to the far right, to the fascists, to the Nazis. It's deeply disturbing. I have been at the receiving end of these racists, these violent perpetrators that don't like anybody else but themselves and the whiteness that they bring. When I was 14 and I started my first job, I rocked up to work one day and I had Coon written across the window in Gertrude Street, Fitzroy. When I had my first child in Lake Centrance, the skate park had a sign uh, graffitied across it that said, all Coons must die. We had the KKK in Painesville in Victoria. The far right are a threat to everybody in this country. They represent hate, they represent violence, and they don't want to unite this country. They're not part of this country's identity, and nor should they be. And I'm just so surprised that so many people on the other side, and we're going to have the other senator come up after me and, and blurt out the racist rhetoric that um, they always do, but it's got to stop. We have children watching. Our children have to be safe. There's children being beaten up in the schoolyards because of racism. Children are not born racist. They learn it. And they're learning it in their homes. And they're learning it from their government. When are we going to truly mature as a nation? When? Stop racism, because racism kills people in this country. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. This is an urgency motion by Senator Lyons. I'm proud to be speaking for the overwhelming majority of Australians who know that being Australian means being part of probably the greatest democracy of the world. But one of the ugliest challenges that's raised its head in recent years is the hypocrisy, lies and rewriting of reality by extremists from the left. Extremists who seek to rewrite our history, lie about our present, deceive our youth and go to any length that seems to shame our great democracy. I've said many times in this place that I am against all extremism. I oppose right-wing extremists and I oppose left-wing extremists. And this motion before us reflects some of the worst thinking of left-wing extremism. Senator Lyons ignores the 200 years of nation building, ignores the spirit that bonds us and instead recreates reality to drive a stake of division into the heart of our nation and our people by preaching white privilege. Like so many left-wing extremists, she denies truth for political gain and notoriety. There can be few more stunning examples of, of hypocrisy than the bitter, vitriolic attack by the senator against Australia Day in an ad she paid for on social media recently. Senator Lyons instead calls for Australia Day to be a day of mourning. She could not possibly be more out of step with the overwhelming majority of Australians. If Senator Lyons really believes in white privilege, she'll obviously be happy to immediately hand over her position as Deputy President to Senator Dodson or Senator McCarthy. Senator Lyons' vitriol does Indigenous Australians no service at all. She hides behind the shameful cloak of shallowness, hypocrisy and lies that typify the worst elements of extremism on both sides. It ignores any truth, tolerates no discussion or debate, is dismissive of reason and deserves the widest condemnation from all sides. I will not be supporting this motion. The question now is, the motion, is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. 
I think the noes have it. Division required. A division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lyons be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell off the ayes. Senator Smith tell off the noes.
does. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. I thank senators. Um, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. It gives senators a moment to leave the chamber. Oh, sorry, Senator Smith is seeking the call. Sorry. Senator Smith. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I seek leave, if I may, to, leave, to move a motion relating to leave of absence for a senator. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Payne for today on account of ministerial matters. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The documents appear on page four of today's order of business. Is anyone seeking the call to take note? You are Senator Henderson, unless there's a, your number. Which number, Senator Henderson? If um. Oh, sorry. Is that a government document or a committee report, Senator Henderson? A committee report. I'll just do government documents I, first, I can, and then sorry. come to that in case anyone is seeking the call. Anyone, Senator Chikoni, on that on government documents? Isn't it, are we just tabling consideration on committee reports at this stage? Where are we? No, we're doing government documents on okay, today's page you. four of today's red, and then we'll go straight to committee reports. But unless anyone's seeking the call, I will now go to committee reports. So I'll, well, I've got a list here. Um, I'll call the opposition. Senator Chikoni, are you moving the scrutiny of bills? Uh, I am. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, President. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest No. 2 of 2021. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report No. 1 of 2021, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I am very pleased to table the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights' first scrutiny report of 2021. As usual, this report contains a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. In this report, the committee considered 19 new bills and 191 new legislative instruments. The committee is seeking further information in relation to three new bills and has concluded its examination of three bills and six legislative instruments. For example, the committee is seeking further information in relation to the Australian Immunisation Register Amendment Reporting Bill 2020. This bill seeks to introduce a requirement for vaccination providers to report information to the Australian Immunisation Register relating to vaccinations administered both inside and outside of Australia. The committee notes that this is a very important measure to enable the government to track and trace every COVID-19 vaccine administered. By enhancing the government's ability to monitor COVID-19 and other vaccine preventable diseases, the committee considers that this measure promotes the right to health. The committee also notes that requiring vaccination providers to provide personal information about individuals who receive vaccinations would appear to limit the right to privacy. It is important to note that this right may be permissibly limited where it is shown to be reasonable, necessary and proportionate. In order to form a concluded view, the committee is seeking further information regarding the proportionality of this measure. The committee is also seeking further information in relation to the Migration and Citizenship Legislation Amendment Strengthening Information Provisions Bill 2020. This bill seeks to introduce a framework to protect the disclosure of confidential information provided by intelligence and law enforcement agencies where the information is used for certain migration or citizenship decisions. By restricting a person's access to information relevant to the decision which affects them, the bill engages and limits the right to a fair hearing and the prohibition against expulsion of aliens without due process. The committee considers that the bill pursues the legitimate objective of upholding law enforcement and intelligence capabilities, but in order to form a concluded view, is seeking further information about the proportionality of this measure. 
Finally, I am pleased to highlight that this committee's analysis continues to have a demonstrable and positive effect, impact both in the use of the committee's reports in parliamentary debates and in other committee inquiries and on legislative development. This has recently been apparent with the passage of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020, which proposed a range of amendments to ASIO's compulsory questioning powers. The committee undertook a comprehensive analysis of the proposed measure in its scrutiny reports 7 and 9 of 2020. While noting that the powers sought to achieve the legitimate objective of protecting national security, the committee also made several recommendations that the bill be amended to assist the proportionality of specific measures with respect to human rights. I'm pleased to note that many of those recommendations are now reflected in the Act and revised Statement of Compatibility. For example, the bill sought to extend the compulsory questioning regime to children aged 14 years and over. The committee recommended that safeguards with respect to the conduct of any such questioning be strengthened, noting the special rights which apply to children under international human rights law. In particular, the committee recommended that in deciding whether to issue a questioning warrant in relation to a child, the Attorney-General must consider their best interests as a primary consideration. I am therefore pleased to note that the bill was amended to this effect and the statement of compatibility accompanying the bill was revised in line with the committee's comments. This is a very good example of the work that this technical scrutiny committee can do in assessing legislation for compatibility with human rights. I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis and with these comments I commend the report to the chamber. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Mr. President, thank you. I've been advised that I can uh, make this statement at, at the start of any new section in the, of the order of the day. I withdraw general business. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. I'm just going to put this motion. I thought okay. you were speaking to this. I will come, I'll come to you next. I'll put the motion moved by Senator Henderson. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw general business. Notice of motion number 820 standing in my name. Okay. Um, Take it from the clerk. That's fine. It sometimes um, catches me by surprise too. Thank you. Um, there being no other committee reports to present, I will move to are there any ministerial statements? There are no ministerial statements, so I'll call committee memberships. I have received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Uh, Senator Colbeck. I seek leave to make a motion to membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Aged Care Legislation Amendment, Serious Incident Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill 2020 and the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A uh, bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Export Control Act 2020 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek to leave the seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Colbeck. Move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Colbeck. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Colbeck. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
contrary, no, ayes have it. Thank you, Rachel. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill 2020 for concurrence. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 and for related purposes. Senator Colbeck. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Colbeck. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, Mandatory Credit Reporting and Other Me Measures Bill 2019. There are no others. I will call the clerk to call on business. The clerk. Government Business Orders of Day Number Four: Customs Amendment, Product Specific Rule, Modernisation Bill 2019, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator. Do you want to call the court? Um, the quorum not present, I believe, clerk. Ring the bells. Laura. Congratulations. I haven't seen you since. Quorum present. Thank you, Senators. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Here we have the coalition essentially handing the pen over to intergovernmental organisations and telling them write our own laws. That's what we're voting on today. Those rules get up updated by the World Customs Organisation every five years. We can't even predict what's going to happen tomorrow. We couldn't predict COVID coming on, and yet we're letting somebody else, another organisation outside this country, update, our, uh, update customs in five years. What we're debating right now is whether our, our Aussie laws should be written for us every five years. The minister likes to say that these changes are just technical. They're just administrative, apparently, apparently. But don't worry. They're not, they're not our technical or administrative problem. They're somebody else now. They're the World Customs Organisation. That's their problem now. It's been taken out of our hands. So let's not worry about that. I have to ask what you're paying me for to do up here. I'll be honest. Well, let me tell you, whenever a minister says they're only making technical amendments, you had better sit up. You better start paying attention. And I'll tell you what, if a red alert isn't going off above your head, then you are not paying attention. Because a lot of the time those changes aren't small at all. And a lot of the time they come back to bite us. Because we think it's okay, should be right, mate. 
She'll be right, mate. The fact is, what the government really wants is not to have to worry about the Senate anymore. Maybe they'd prefer if we weren't here at all. And if any of us in the Senate have a problem with any of the changes that are being made, well, you know what? That's too bad. That's too bad. Don't worry about it because apparently the World Customs Organisation, they've got it all under control. They've got the technical stuff. They obviously know better than what the senators do here in Australia, and they're better at administrative stuff than what we are. That's great. That's great. Once again, what are we getting paid for? And if any of us in the Senate... Um, so you know what? What's this bill? What is this about this bill? Well, I'll tell you what it is, Australians. We've been we've been asked to take on trust that there'll be no changes that affect the operation, size, or the scope of these free trade agreements. Now, I've seen these free trade agreements in and out of here for eight years. I've seen the chapter. Uh, that's not doing us real well, is it? I don't know if these free trade agreements stand for much these days. But don't worry, though, it doesn't matter because everything we're passing it over to the World Customs Organisation, so don't worry about it now. We're good. We're good. We're being told that the only thing that, automatic, that automatically updating these regulations does is save public servants from having to get through more paperwork. Oh dear, God help those public servants. God help it if they would put in a day's work. Wouldn't that be a shocker? This is my question. What if that's not right? What if that's not right? Who's going to fix that in a, down, the year, down five years down the track? What if something slips up? What do you think is going to happen then? Because it's taken out of our control. The Senate has no control. Australia's lost control of the situation. No control here, but don't worry, there's nothing to see because apparently there are only small little technical administrative moves. Oh, scary. The bill would mean there's nothing for us to do, nothing at all. Our free trade rules would change without any debate and without our parliamentary consent. Once again, we are not making, now we're not making these decisions on our own home soil. We are letting somebody else do that for us. Why don't you just pass it in parliament over and get it over and done with? The, go the government is asking us to exchange proper parliamentary scrutiny for a basic committee review. That's what we're up to now. I'm not comfortable with that. And any Australian out there should not be comfortable with that either. We all know that government stacked committees come out with government friendly results. That's how this stuff happens up here. That's how it goes down up here. And God forbid the unintended consequences that it has. Well, we've seen that going on for years. What's even worse, though, don't worry about what's going on up here because we're not controlling this now. She's gone. She's all gone. She's over. Well, customers' organisation, come on in. Either way, a committee can't vote down regulatory changes that shouldn't be made. That's not what a committee is for. A committee is for writing reports. It can't replace a proper debate on the Senate floor. I can tell you, I can tell you uh, right now that um, to allow this bill to take away the Senate's right and responsibility uh, is extremely, extremely concerning that we have got to this. I, I just don't know if this is just lazy, but God forbid there'll be some of you, many of you that probably won't be around every time this happens in five years' time. I hope, I only hope that you can sleep for night time and this doesn't come back to bite this country. But I suppose it won't matter because you'll be sitting there on your pensions and your nice super. Uh, that's fabulous. I just don't understand why you would do that, why you would even take the slightest risk. Why would you take the slightest risk to pass some sort of administrative, administrative changes and technical changes over to somebody else that is outside of this country? What is the purpose? What, would someone give you a donation or something? Did I miss something? I'm just a little confused. What, what, why would you even think about doing that? Isn't there much bigger things on the agenda? We've just gone through COVID and you're worrying about, we are sitting here, we're sitting here worrying about some administrative moves that need to be made and some technical moves, passing it over, passing it over to some world customs organisation. Who does that? Nothing else more important to worry about? That's why it bothers me. It's been, you know, the small, I, I just don't understand this. I'm missing something. 
which is a real shame because no doubt it'll come out and I'll find out what it is. And then I'll be bringing this down in the next few months to say, I'll tell you why they did this. It's just a shame I haven't been able to do that today. Anyway, I can tell you now, there is no way, absolutely no way, do I trust any move that has been made, let alone trusting any technical or any administrative movements or anything else over to a World Customs Organisation and leaving that outside of Australia to do that. There is just no way. No way. I'll worry about the nation first and put that first. And I'll tell you what, this will come back to bite. So I can tell you now, I will never ever vote to hand over Parliament's power to a World Customs, or Customs Organisation. Not ever. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, I'd like to thank all honourable members for their contributions to this debate on the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill 2019. The bill will amend the Customs Act to simplify the way in which the product specific rules of origin annexes in six of Australia's free trade agreements are implemented domestically. The Customs Act will refer directly to the annexes, enabling future changes to the annexes to be recognised in the Customs Act. This will remove the need to prescribe the product specific rules of origin in regulations and to amend them uh, where annexes are updated. And it's my understanding that these regulations have never been disallowed. And in fact, this chamber, this parliament, has passed already over the last two years uh, four bills, passed them into law, containing the same automatic incorporation mechanism uh, for PSRs. The changes to the Customs Acts proposed by the bill are technical in nature, and they do, they do not change the benefits available under any of the FTAs. These amendments, however, will streamline the implementation of updates to FTAs that relate to goods help facilitate smoother trade between Australia and our FTA partners and reduce the administrative burden on importers. Further, and I think very significantly, it is expected that the size of the regulations for the six affected FTAs will be significantly reduced from over 3,000 pages to about 90 pages. 3,000 pages to 90 pages, lowering the cost of administering the FTAs and removing unnecessary red tape. Now, in the debate on this bill here today uh, in the chamber, we've had uh, many uh, what I would call red herrings uh, and a lot of shadow boxing going on from those opposite about what is and isn't included in this bill. Uh, we've heard about uh, th this is unprecedented, that we haven't done this before, that it's about foreign workers, that it's about anti-dumping. Well, I can confirm for this chamber and for you, Senator Lambie, that this is about none of that. In fact, this bill streamlines the technical processes of updating product-specific rules of origin, as I've said, for six of Australia's current 15 FTA agreements for Thailand, Malaysia, the United States, Korea, Chile and New Zealand. And what this actually does is it aligns these six FTAs with the practice that has already been adopted for all nine of Australia's other FTAs. This chamber and in fact, the opposition and those opposite have previously uh, voted for exactly the same bill for these other free trade agreements as we are considering here today. So the first bill of this kind in 2018 passed with the support of the opposition, and this applied to FTAs for China, Japan, ASEAN, New Zealand and Singapore. And again, I reiterate, this bill only affects the final technical step in this process. Now, the question is, and comes from some of the debate from those opposite, is has the parliament passed other FTAs? Has this parliament, has this chamber, passed other FTAs with the same modernised, updated practice? And yes, we have. The parliament has adopted the modernisation approach that is exactly identical to that contained in this bill uh, for FTAs for Peru, for Hong Kong, for Indonesia, in PESA Plus for the Pacific Island countries and for the CPTPP. This parliament and those opposite passed this already. And they're talking about you know, a consistency and a fair go for workers, but where is the fairness or the consistency in their position that they've taken here today? And despite what those opposite have said, this bill does not introduce a new process for amending Australia's FTAs. 
This bill is the second of its kind to be considered by this chamber. So therefore, that is not the case. So for all of those reasons, uh, Mr. President, I very strongly commend this bill to the chamber. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Are there amendments for this bill? There are. Oh, I'll call the clerk first and await a deputy chair. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill um, the question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Keneally. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Acting President. Uh, there, are, uh, there are amendments that have been circulated in my name to the uh, Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill. I will be brief in speaking to these amendments. I did ventilate Labor's uh, reason for moving these amendments in my second reading speech. Uh, but as several speakers have noted here in this debate, the effect of this legislation would be to take what is currently a disallowable instrument by the parliament and to make that decision about rules of orig origin and product specific rules a decision of some bureaucrat it would take away the oversight of this parliament and we and we are talking about free trade it must be fair trade and the community must have confidence that its parliament and its representatives have the opportunity to ensure that it is fair trade, not once every five years, maybe, not possibly through an inquiry that you might get up through a committee, but in fact have the ongoing right to ensure that the free trade agreements and the rules that govern them remain the province of this chamber, this parliament, to disallow if necessary. That the effect of Labor's amendment here today is to reinsert the parliament's right to disallow certain rules under this legislation. As Senator Lambie just said in her speech, you know, any time the government says they're just making some technical changes, and this government in particular says they're just making some technical changes, and we really shouldn't worry ourselves about it, and it all is streamlined, and it's all so much better, we need to be alert to the fact that they are taking away the oversight of this parliament. And the effect of the amendment that has been circulated is to reinsert that oversight by members of this parliament. So I ask members, particularly those who have expressed a view that the parliament should retain that oversight function, to support the amendment. Um, Senator Keneally, just to clarify, are you seeking leave to move all of those amendments together? Thank you. Is leave granted for that? Leave is granted. Are there any other questions on the amendments as, um, that Senator Keneally has moved? Senator Roberts? Questions, but not on, on the amendment. Senator Keneally has moved. You can still ask them, Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. My questions are brief. There are a number of them. Minister, is it true that in 2018, nine of Australia's 15 free trade agreements were amended by the Customs Amendment bracket Product Specific Rules Modernisation Act 2018, and that this bill simply modifies the remaining six free trade agreements? I call the minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I can confirm that, that that is the case. Senator Roberts. Here, Minister, uh, based upon the comments of Senator Carr and Senator Ayres, because we listened to them and we went back and did, did some more research. Did the 2018 bill pass with the support of the opposition? I call the minister. Uh, thank you very much for that question. And yes, I can confirm that it did pass. The identical bill passed with the support of Labor, and in fact, uh, Senator Carr himself spoke 
in support of this same legislation two years ago for other free trade agreements. And in fact, I think his words were that it was a simple administrative process. Senator Roberts. Did the 2018 bill even go to a division in the Senate? The Minister. Uh, my understanding is no, it did not. Senator Roberts. Minister, was this same harmonisation system incorporated directly into our free trade agreements with Indonesia, Peru and Hong Kong? And were those also passed by the opposition? The Minister. Uh, yes, I can confirm that Labor did support these exact same amendments in those bills that you've just listed. Senator Roberts. Minister, is this same provision in the upcoming TPP 11, now called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership? The Minister. Uh, yes, I believe it is. Senator Roberts. Has the ALP and the Greens given any indication of whether this same harmonisation should be removed from that agreement? Minister. Minister? Yep. Could, I just get, could I just get some clarification of the question again, and I'll just confirm with, with the officials here. Senator Roberts, could you please request, sure. uh, repeat your question? Is, the same, is this same provision in the upcoming TPP 11 now called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership? So I misheard you. They're actually separate agreements. Senator Roberts. AL, thank you. Has the ALP and Greens given any indication? Minister, is it, if a change to a harmonised CIS item was a, has a detrimental economic outcome for Australia, does that change or is there parliamentary scrutiny of that change? Minister. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, resident in that, but despite the assertions of those opposite uh, here in the chamber today, there of course still is parliamentary scrutiny uh, of, of, these, uh, of, this, of this bill through J. Scott. That has not changed. And again, this, this bill is exactly the same that this chamber passed in 2018. Senator Roberts. Is it possible in any way for a change to the harmonised register to allow for a product to be dumped in Australia or in any way cost Australian jobs? The Minister. Uh, no, Senator. I can say unequivocally the answer is no. This has no impact on anti-dumping. This is not an anti-dumping piece of legislation. Senator Roberts. Is there any point to Labor's amendment? The Minister? Uh, I'm not quite sure a personal opinion uh, is probably appropriate for me to answer. However, what I can say is that two years ago the Labor Party, including Senator Carr, strongly supported these exact same measures for these FTAs subject to this bill as they did two years ago for those other countries' FTAs. So it is hard to see that there is anything else but playing some very base politics in this today, because they were supported two years ago. Senator Roberts. Thank you. This is my final question. Uh, in 2018, apparently Senator Carr spoke on the bill, the first version, the first bill, and in, in his comments said that it should be non-contra according to Hansard. So I want to make it clear, my earlier comments despite Senator Ayres and Senator Carr's comments, we went back and did our research. And this is what we have come up with. And, and, uh, Chair. Continue, Senator Roberts. I'm Thank just you. conferring with the clerk on something. So we have done our research. We asked a number of people, crossbenchers and the government, and we've done our research. I want to make it very clear that One Nation opposes free trade agreements because we don't believe they're fair trade. I'm pleased to see Senator Keneally now using our label, we want fair trade. Having said that and made that very clear this morning, and now again I say that we will support this because all this does, it doesn't change any material impact on this, all it does is reduce the burden to companies and employers and jobs in this country and it reduces the bureaucracy and the cost to the taxpayers. That is why we are supporting this. We will continue to oppose free trade agreements, but we will make whatever we have better in any way we can. Minister. Uh, well, look, thank you, uh, Senator Robert. Um, in fact, I've got the comments from Senator Carr, 
Uh, again, completely contradictory to what he said two years ago. This is what Senator Carr said two years ago about the identical bill for the other set of free trade agreements. So, in the Senate debate on the 2018 bill, Senator Carr argued the bill should have been introduced as non-controversial legislation, give it its minor administrative effect. And in fact, he said this. These are minor amendments ensuring consistency between our legislation and the various texts of the agreements. So I will leave it to other members of this chamber to make uh, their conclusions about uh, his position now. Uh, Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy Madam Chair. Um, when, you, uh, when you come up with these great ideas that you're going to do this and pass the powers over to someone else, I'm actually, it actually blows me away why one nation's got stuck into it. It absolutely blows me away they're falling for this crap. Who would have, who would have guessed? One nation. Who would have guessed? Okay, what unintended consequences did we, did were on your whiteboard when you did this? Minister? Um, Senator Lambie, I'm not really sure the nature of your question. Can you just clarify exactly what you're asking? Are you telling Senator me? Lambie. Sorry. When you tell him, thank you, Chair. Uh, can, are you telling me that when you decided to do this, you had everything was all positive? You didn't have one thing that you thought, "Oh, maybe that could happen." Unintended consequences. I just want to know this because there'll be unintended consequences. So I just want you to put this down on paper so I've got it. The minister, Senator Lambie, it, the answer is very clear: is this is not a new measure. We did this two years ago with the support of the opposition, who said it was uncontroversial, it was a simple administrative matter. And this bill here today is doing the exact same thing for another tranche of Australia's free trade agreements, to bring them into alignment with the ones that we, again, in this chamber agreed to in 2018. Senator Lambie. Chair, can I take a point of order, please? Four times I've stood now, and you've seen me, and you haven't Sorry. acknowledged me or given me the call. I was clearly on my feet before Senator Lambie. Apologies, Senator Wish Wilson. I did see Senator Lambie first, so and I had given her the call, so I will give it to her uh, again. And I urge you to be very quick next time, Senator Lambie. You want to get up? You want? Senator Lambie, I've given you the call. Okay. Okay. Uh, what power? Uh, what power the Australian Senate has? Uh, what power does the Australian Senate have to overrule changes to the harmonised com commodity description and coding system? What power? The minister. Well, thank you, Senator Lambie, for that question. Uh, I've got two. There's two parts to my answer. The first one is my advice is that uh, these regulations have never been disallowed in this chamber, which is why I understand those opposite and the government two years ago agreed that this was an administrative uh, uh, pr pr process. But in terms of the parliament's ability to scrutinise future changes to FDAs, does this make any change? No, it does not. The bill removes the need to replicate technical changes to the PSR schedule of an FPA in a separate regulation, establishing the rules of origin for that FTA. That is, the step that creates a disallowable instrument would no longer occur. Uh, J. Scott will continue to provide parliamentary scrutiny of future technical changes to the PSR of a uh, relevant FTA through its treaty, standard treaty review processes. Senator Carr. Yes. Uh, well, since my name has been brought into this in such uh, a manner tonight by the obviously Dorothy Dix questions that have been provided by the government to One Nation, I think it's appropriate that I should respond. As to the claims that they've researched, the idea of one nation doing research, I think, is a part of the humour, the, the comedy routine that is actually undertaken from time to time by the senators claiming to represent the more reactionary elements of the nationalist movement in this country. Uh, I'd like to deal specifically with the claims that are being made about the. This um, is an amendment. This is. Um, Senator Carr, Senator Roberts is on his feet with a point of order. Order. Senator Carr has made an improper statement because we did, as I said, research with crossbench senators and we did not write Dorothy Dix's. Senator Roberts, I'm not sure that's a point of order. I'll give the call back uh, to Senator Carr. Uh, Madam De Acting President, the uh, situation here is very simple. And I think a lesson that all senators should take note of. If the facts change, what do you do? You change your mind. That's been the custom and practice of good political uh, operators for a time immemorial. 
And it's all very well for you to quote from the hand side. I'm quite capable of changing my mind if I have the facts. The facts are these. We now have a situation in this parliament where we pass some late like 2,000 bills a year. 50 per cent of them are carried with measures that contain instruments for delegated legislation. 50 per cent. And of those in recent times, 20 per cent of all the legislation we've been carrying has a non-disallowable instrument built into it. So that we are ourselves taking away our rights to examine legislation. Now, I've been on the front bench of this parliament for some 23 years. And in this parliament, I've had the privilege of actually serving on other committees. And as a consequence of that, I've had the opportunity to look at the detail in which this legislation and this legislative practice has grown. Grown instrumentally by governments of all descriptions, where we've turned over our responsibilities to the public service. And we should not allow that to continue. That's the fundamental principle that this amendment proposes, that we address our responsibilities. If there's a problem, we have the chance to fix it. And no more complicated than that. Senator Roberts, you great expert on international trade, no more complicated than our capacity to say, sorry, Mr Bureaucrat, you've got it wrong. Now, what I can also tell you in those 23 years of my service on the front bench is repeatedly I understood how free trade agreements could be abused, particularly the rules of origin and the capacity of various companies and various countries to shift goods around the globe. These measures we should not be allowed to be shifted off to some minor consideration by a parliamentary committee without the resources, by members of parliament without the resources, to actually deal with these questions properly. J. Scott is not an appropriate vehicle for parliamentary scrutiny. It is a joke. It is a joke to suggest that anything other than a rubber stamp measure is going to be applied. Our job, our job as members of parliament, is to ensure the protection of the interests of the Australian people. We have been abrogating that responsibility by allowing so much of the legislation that goes through this parliament, and I might say, I'll hazard a guess, Senator Roberts, unread. Unread. And we find the circumstances when we examine the facts, 50 per cent of it is allowing delegated legislation to be sent off by unelected, faceless bureaucrats. And 20 per cent of that, we have denied ourselves the chance to say no. No, that's not right. Now, this amendment simply says that the proposal this government is trying to impose on us now to take away the right that is there now should not be taken away. You say, oh, it's never been used. Well, that's an excuse to take it away. How ridiculous. That's the sort of mentality that One Nation comes up with, isn't it? Like your detailed research. You've got to get it from a ministerial office. You've got to get approval from a ministerial office before you'll come to some consensus with the government. And you call yourself senators. What a joke. Uh, thank you, Senator Carr. Minister? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting uh, Chair. Uh, look, can I just say in relation to that what can only be called as a rhetorical flourish from Senator Carr, Order, as, in a, a, Senator as in a spectacular black, being, backflip? It, Senator Reynolds, it, um, Minister, it being 7.20 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports. I therefore propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn, and we move to the adjournment debate. Senator Rennick. It is well known that in his farewell speech, the great American President Dwight Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex. 
Today, of course, it's just not the military-industrial complex that we need to be wary of, but also many other industrial complexes, whether it be superannuation, universities, renewables or the bureaucracy itself. But what is often overlooked is his warning about a scientific technological elite, and I quote, Today, the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. The prospect of domination of the nation scholars by federal employment project allocations and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of the statesman to mould, to balance and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society." End of quote. The key words here are within the principles of our democratic systems. Our democratic systems depend on accountability and transparency. It is my view that these elements have been severely undermined by unelected bureaucrats, many of whom uh, could, be, could be considered as belonging to a scientific technical, technological elite and who are neither accountable nor transparent. This erosion of democracy has been justified on the grounds of independence, that somehow bureaucrats are independent as opposed to politicians who are not. Nothing could be further from the truth. Ultimately, bureaucrats will be the servant of whatever system hires them and they will perpetrate it in order to protect their own self-interest or perpetrate their ideologies rather than serve the interests of the people. In many ways, this is to be expected. It is not inhuman to put self-interest first. For governments to be effective, the decision-making process must be transparent and the decision-maker must be held to account. This is not the case with independent statutory authorities. These bodies have become a law unto them, to themselves. They are not accountable to the people and their decision-making process is not transparent. The bureaucracy is the government. Politicians turn up and debate ideological points before going back to, to liaise with the community. But we are only here 19 weeks a year, of which only four weeks are given to estimates. Ministers will spend more time in Canberra with their departments, but it is, it is extremely difficult to drill into the detail when there are so many demands placed upon them. However, it is imperative that the minister, as part of an elected government, has the final say in the running of the government and not the bureaucrat. There are too many examples of the bureaucracy being in charge of the decision-making process or setting a narrative that is completely false. Whether it be the RBA controlling interest rates, could you imagine if the ATO set tax rates or the CS set the tax rates, or as in just recently the CSIRO releasing a cost-gen report without oversight of the assumptions from the minister's office? It is their elected representatives and their ministers who must be responsible for the decision-making process, and not those who hide behind the curtain of an anonymity. Politicians have a responsibility to scrutinise bureaucrats. It is their job. At Senator School, we were taught that our role was to inquire, debate and legislate. Yet there is a movement being uh, peddled among those opposite us and the media that you are not allowed to question the experts. Uh, in the late John Le Carre's novel, The Russia House, the dissident Russian scientist codenamed Gothi sums up experts thus. I do not like experts. They are our jailers. I despise experts more than anyone on earth. Experts are addicts. They solve nothing. They are servants of whatever system hires them. They perpetrate it. When we are tortured, we shall be tortured by experts. When we are hanged, experts will hang us. When the world is destroyed, it will be destroyed not by its madmen, but by, but by the sanity of its experts and the superior ignorance of bureaucrats. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Polly. 
We live in extraordinary times, a time when the world is crying out for leadership over politics, leadership over fear. Good economic policy will deliver us out of this pandemic, out of these difficult economic times. We will only get good economic policy out of a first-rate leadership at all levels of government. The Liberals have spent the last decade painting Labor's approach in the recovery of the GFC as wasteful spending. And yet, ironically, the last seven years of a federal Liberal government has saddled Australia with an astronomical debt, with a national debt galloping like the Melbourne Cup thoroughbred towards $1 trillion. Former Treasurer Peter Costello argues that the government isn't operating at sustainable levels and future generations are doomed under this government because they have placed debt that will never be paid down on their shoulders. Treasury is forecasting Australia's net debt position will be $703.2 billion for 2021, meaning a net debt to GDP ratio of 36.1 per cent, increasing to $966.2 billion by 2023-24, to a net debt to GDP ratio of 43.8 per cent. The economic outlook appears grim under this directionless government. The Morrison government needs a real plan to stimulate demand and increase domestic employment. This government cannot keep deferring responsibility to the Reserve Bank of Australia. During the GFC, Labor employed this mechanism responsibly through increasing public spending via direct investment in public infrastructure to increase the supply of jobs. Regardless of Labor's critics, it worked. School halls and classrooms were built, teachers, students and parents were thankful for it and led to a boom in construction jobs. We got the balance right. But balance is not something that this government employs, let alone understands. In contrast, the Morrison government has pushed hard on tax cuts, arguing that if business and individuals keep more money they, they earn, more money will be spent. However, Tax cuts only work if money is spent within the community and not saved or invested. What more can be done then? This is a watershed moment in our history where we can engage in structural reform and ensure a better future for Australia. Let's bring back manufacturing to our great country. But the solution the Liberals have proposed so far are deeply flawed and fail the rules of Basic Economics 101. Scott Morrison has deliberately excluded 928,000 people aged 35 and over from hiring subsidies. And then there is the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Job Economic Recovery Bill 2020, which aims to casualise our workforce and to cut workers' pay. This doesn't treat a large working cohort with any respect, let alone basic economic intelligence. Furthermore, the Morrison government has also not considered investing in public housing. Unlike the Andrews Labor government in Victoria, public housing, housing more than pays for itself. For every, dollar, every one dollar million of residential building construction output, it has a multiplying effect of $2.9 million throughout the industry and broader economy. This stimulus would also boost the post-crisis economic recovery and reduce homelessness. Scott Morrison needs to commit to creating incentives to bring manufacturing back to Australia by including all Australian workers, regardless of their age. 2020 highlighted the importance of having supply chain resilience by reassuring manufacturing Assuring manufacturing, it would mean that high-skilled manufacturing jobs will be created within Australia to boost our economic and strengthen our resilience amidst international crisis. The Morrison government is spending big but relying too heavily on the RBA, failing to recalibrate the investment in reskilling the nation, and no adoption of an energy policy means that there is no guarantee that this spending will eventuate through to good outcomes 
economic outcomes. A responsible government needs to employ a targeted approach to spending which collectively lifts Australia out of recession and guarantees prosperity into the future. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. February is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Ovarian cancer is the eighth most common cancer in Australia, and there's no detection test for it. And tragically, almost half of the 1,560 Australians diagnosed with ovarian cancer each year die within five years. Ovarian cancer predominantly affects women. However, it also affects non-binary people, trans men, and some people with variations of sex characteristics. In their 2011 report addressing sexual orientation and sex and or gender identity discrimination, the Australian Human Rights Commission noted concerns about medical professionals overlooking trans and intersex people for conditions that are generally understood to affect either men or women exclusively, such as ovarian cancer and prostate cancer. So this ovarian cancer month Awareness Month, I want to advocate on behalf of all people with ovaries for more education and resources to find a cure for this awful disease. A group of white men are gathered around a burning cross. They can be heard chanting, white power. Some raise their hands in a Nazi salute. This isn't a chilling relic of the past, nor is it a scene from a video posted on a dark corner of the internet. This is a real-life gathering of about 40 neo-Nazi extremists in broad daylight in our own backyard just weeks ago. And the gathering of these neo-Nazi extremists in the Grampians on Gunditjmara country over Invasion Day weekend on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day should be a wake-up call to us all. Last year, ASIO advised the parliament that right-wing violent extremism occupies around 30 to 40 per cent of ASIO's current caseload in counter-terrorism work. And while it's good that security services are investigating these threats, there appears to be zero political appetite to invest in new initiatives to address the growth of right-wing extremism. And the Prime Minister is nowhere to be seen when it comes to calling out white supremacism and anti-Semitism. Where are the press conferences, the scare campaigns, the damning words for these extremist groups, Mr Morrison? Is being white a get-out-of-jail-free card to avoid being labelled as a terrorist? You should be outraged. You should be scared. Scared not, not only of what these people are capable of, but what their actions and opinions say about the state of our country. And ironically, just days after this group of neo-Nazis gathered in regional Victoria, the Prime Minister claimed that Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on earth at an event on the 26th of January. Being a successful multicultural nation takes more than multicultural parades and festivities, more than platitudes, more than words, Prime Minister. It requires action. The emerging neo-Nazi movement that's taking a foothold right around the world, encouraged by leaders like Donald Trump, is very present right here in Australia. And this hateful tide has been growing as it's been encouraged, inflamed, fed and nurtured through the politics of hate. I mean, politicians in this place have said that settling Muslims was a mistake. They've said that people can't go out into the streets at night for fear of African gang violence. And the leader of a political party wore a burqa into the Senate to mock a community of faith. And when ASIO warned us last year of the increasing threat from right-wing extremist groups, Peter Dutton responded with the need to deal with left-wing loonies. We only need to look at the attempted insurrection at the US Capitol on the 6th of January to know what happens when a country's leaders outright or tacitly endorse far-right fringe groups, when these abhorrent ideas are given the oxygen and the sunlight needed to grow and spread. All of us in this case need to he heed the calls of what ASIO and groups like Yard yelling at racist dogs and Jews against fascism have been telling us for years. Nazis are not a thing of the past. They are here in this country, and it's up to our leaders to call them out. 
Anti-fascist protesters and activists are campaigning in the streets and shining a light on those that seek to do us all harm. Now it's time for our leaders to step up. It's up to our leaders, like you, Prime Minister, to stamp out these threats before it's too late, noting that for those that lost their lives in Christchurch, it already is. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr President. And, uh, I just want to put a couple of remarks on the, on the table about the Australia Day Honours List. And 844 Australians were recognised this uh, Australia Day. And announcing the, the list, the Governor-General said, on behalf of all Australians, I congratulate everyone recognised in the Australia Day Honours List. The individuals we celebrate today come from all parts of our great nation and have served the community in almost every way conceivable. They're diverse and unique, but they have some very common characteristics, including selflessness, commitment and dedication. Recipients have not put their hand up to be recognised. Most would consider the, the achievements that they have been recognised for to be ordinary or just what they do. Therein is the great strength of our system. Recipients in the Order of, Australian, uh, Order of Australia have been nominated by their peers, considered by an independent process and today recognised by the nation. The sum of these contributions speaks to our nation's greatest strengths, our people. Now, I, I just want to put that on the, on the record, and I know there's been a lot of debate about the day, and I don't want to go anywhere near that, but I do want to single out one recipient of an Australian Day Award, a Mr Kim Leslie Callaghan, and he has been awarded the Medal of Order of Australia. And it's for service to local government and the community of Elliston. Chair of an, uh, from 2014 to 18 of the District Council of Elliston, establishment of the Wirigu Reconciliation Monument 2018, Deputy Chairman 2014, elected member since 2010, served on the, uh, the Medical Board, the Midwest Advisory Council for five years, established the uh, Elliston Men's Care Shed. And, and many, many other achievements. And these are people who work in vast corners of Australia selflessly and dedicate their entire activities to community health, wellbeing and involvement. Now, one of the great achievements of Mr Callaghan was the Elliston Walking Trail, 14 kilometres along a stunning coastline. A stunning coastline, a, a, a tourist icon, if you like. And it was not without some difficulties to get that project to finality. And along the way, along the way, and despite uh, much uh, discussion and disconcernment, uh, he managed to establish a reconciliation monument, which actually recognised an awful uh, massacre in 1849, 1859, uh, where a group of uh, what was considered natives in those days were driven off the cliff. And I attended the opening of that with uh, Senator Pat Dodson. And I'm sure that Senator Pat Dodson will have concurred with me that that was one of the most uh, uh, memorable occasions in my time as a senator. It is a really stunning, remarkable monument which changes with the light as, as it would. You know, it's a marble statue. Uh, the council workers look after it in a most diligent way. It's revered and respected. And Kim, uh, who coincidentally I had known in a previous incarnation of work, um, he was a, a TW delegate at Armagar and a self-funded retiree, went to the Elliston uh, area. He lives at Chiringa, not far from Elliston, and self-funded retiree over there and found himself a bit of time on his hands and put it to very, very good use. An, an enormous contributor in that area. And, and really, I think that is the real key to the Australia Day Awards. These are people that don't seek recognition, and Kim doesn't know I'm speaking about him today. He will know tomorrow, but he doesn't know today, and I'm sure he'd be a, you know, he'd enjoy a quiet beer after uh, the contribution tonight. But I just wanted it on the record here. These people are what makes the fabric of Australia tick. Selfless people who do more than they need to do who reach out to people, who look for opportunities to heal, who look for opportunities to, to build recognition and build reconciliation. And none of that work was easy on, uh, 
Mr Callaghan. None of that work was easy on him. But myself and Senator Dodson were there to witness that glorious weekend where that community came together, celebrated the, uh, the memorial, where the dusty feet mob from Port Augusta, Port Augusta came down, sang and danced in that area and brought a tear to most people's eyes. So well done, Kim. Keep up the good work. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I rise tonight to speak about the global shark fin trade and the inhumane practice of shark finning. For some years now, I have spoken out about shark finning, its inherent cruelty, and the need for Australia to reject um, this terrible practice in every way we can. Shark finning involves cutting off a shark's fins, often while it is still alive, then throwing it back into the sea where it is left to die painfully. This is a horrendous and a barbaric practice. The shark suffers hugely, usually dying from blood loss, suffocation, or targeted by another predator. Between 70 and 100 million sharks are killed every year for their fins. Many of these sharks represent species that are already endangered, and this needless cruelty is putting the animals at risk of extinction. The trade has terrible impacts on shark populations globally, um, and just last week a study published in Nature found not only that the global population of shark and rays has crashed by more than 70% in the last 50 years, but pointed specifically to overfishing as the driving cause. In countries where shark fin soup is popular, governments as well as businesses such as hotels and restaurants have in recent years decided to restrict the sale of certain types of shark fin. Others have taken shark fin off the menu. People's traditions and expectations are changing. Shark finning is banned in Australian government-managed fisheries, and there are a plethora of state and territory laws that have the effect of banning shark finning, usually by requiring all sharks to be landed with their fins still intact. WA is the holdout on this front, where a loophole is effectively allowing shark finning to continue in all its fisheries. However, shark fin remains on the menu across the country and continues to be consumed in many restaurants. There are reports from time to time that include illegal finning which goes on. In 2015, while I was a state MP in the New South Wales Parliament, I introduced a bill to ban the commercial preparation or sale of shark fin for the purposes of consumption. Um, the Let's Take Shark Fin Off the Menu campaign in support of my bill, raised the profile of this matter in New South Wales and has led more and more people to take action and recognise the need for Australia to say no to shark finning once and for all. On this point, I particularly want to acknowledge the conservationists and activists who have been so vocal on this issue and want to see some real change. And it is my pleasure to advise the Senate tonight that I am working on a bill that would ban the import and export of shark fin to and from Australia. I'm doing this work with my colleague, Senator Peter Bush Wilson, who is a passionate advocate for our oceans and marine environment. Perhaps to the surprise of many, the Australian shark fin trade is alive and well. According to the data made available to my office, over the period uh, between 2012 to 2019, at least 240,000 kilograms of shark fin was imported into Australia. Notably, over the same period, at least 30,000 kilograms of shark fins were exported from Australia. Collectively, these numbers represent millions of sharks that have been killed for this cruel trade, and their fins either leave Australia or enter Australia. Perhaps just as horrific as the cruelty is the fact that if you asked a person on the street, they would probably have no idea that Australia is a partner in such animal brutality. There is no good reason for Australia to continue to participate in this cruel and inhumane trade. Around the world, countries are rejecting the shark fin trade and saying no to this animal cruelty. In 2019, Canada made international headlines when it became the first G20 country to ban the import and export of shark fin. There are also trade bans in places across numerous American states. And I look forward to bringing this debate to the Senate through a private member's bill later this year. We have a real opportunity here to reject animal cruelty. 
reject the needless slaughter of our precious marine life and affirm our commitment to biodiversity and a healthy planet. Senator MacDonald. The last 12 months since the COVID-19 pandemic arrived on our shores has thrown into sharp relief what is necessary to Australia and Australians. A hard-working, efficient transport industry and supply chains well stocked shelves with food grown by our Australian farmers. So it is shocking that last month Coles Supermarkets has used its significant market position and its monthly magazine to encourage people to eat less meat, allegedly on the basis of dietary and environmental grounds. While it is truly astounding that Coles would ignore solid science around meat's place in a balanced diet, it is even more concerning that the advice was offered in part on sustainability grounds. And after an outcry from meat industry groups, Coles has removed the advice from its website the least it could do after misrepresenting the reality of sustainable Australian farming practices and the work of Australian farming families. Australian Dietary Guidelines are titled Eat for Health, Australian Dietary Guidelines providing the scientific evidence for healthier Australian diets. It is a fact that many Australians are in fact not eating enough red meat. Too often these days, ideology and wokeness overrides facts. It was as recently as the 22nd of January that Beef Central journalist James Nason wrote, 2021 is shaping as another severe beef bashing year from many quarters, despite the significant body of evidence debunking the case against beef on climate and health grounds. And for Coles to cast aspersions on the sustainability of Australia's meat industry is a prime example of virtue signalling that has no place in advice on a healthy diet. Any dietary advice must be made on the basis of benefits to human health, not on what anti-farming pr propaganda vegans, eco-warriors and animal activists flood social media with every day. Only recently we have seen supermarkets try to encourage more meat sales by promoting RSPCA-approved chicken hormone-free beef, dolphin-free tuna, free-range pork and eggs. So this is recent about-face is baffling. Why send contradictory and, frankly, misleading messages to consumers? Why would such an influential voice like Coles cast doubt on Australian produce when there is so much evidence to counter the shrill untruths peddled by activists? Australia has among the toughest animal welfare standards in the world. Our meat growers are conscientious, efficient and, yes, sustainable. For them to be anything but that would be unacceptable. And these people have listened to community sentiment around raising animals and they have responded. Any farmer who fails to meet community and industry expectations just won't cut it. Coles and other big supermarkets and restaurants must recognise this and defend, and defend the very people who are proud to put the word Australian on what they send to market. And as the convener of the Parliamentary Friends of Red Meat Group, I stand with those Australians who work tirelessly to grow the food that ends up in our restaurants, in our butcheries, our barbecues and, of course, supermarkets like Coles. But I cannot stand by silent while I see such terrible mistruths peddled against an industry that is world's best world-leading in the product that we grow, in the way that we grow it, and it is deemed a necessary part of a, a human beneficial diet uh, by the guidelines. The food uh, in that group have traditionally been seen as protein-rich. They provide a wide variety of other nutrients that may be more important in the typical high-protein Australian diet. Important nutrients include iodine, iron, zinc, other minerals, vitamins, especially B12, and essential fatty acids, including omega-3, long-chain polyunsaturated saturated fatty acid. All Indigenous Australian fish contain omega-3s. Grass-fed meats, poultry and some eggs are also sources of these essential fatty acids. Evidence of the health benefits of lean meat and alternatives is consistently recognised in international dietary guidelines. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Last Thursday, I attended the opening of the Duck River Meadows Dairy and Cheese Factory in Smithton, in the far northwest of Tasmania. Back in 2012, an announcement by the then Labor Regional Development Minister Simon Crean and the Tasmanian Premier Lara Giddings started the journey of future investments in the dairy industry in this region of Tasmania, paving the way for the opportunity for the new dairy and cheese factory. By funding the Trade College to the tune of $4.25 million and a further $1.5 million to extend power along Harkus Road, allowing beef farms to convert to dairy farms. Today on this site stands a new robotic dairy and cheese factory, a dream of Gennaro and Roslyn. Along the walls of the cheese factory's public viewing area, there are a number of information posters telling visitors the stories of dairy, cheese and butter making from around the Circular Head region from the 1840s to today, and highlighting the vision of Milan Vinilic, who in 1955 set up the Lactos factory in Burnie now the owner of the famous King Island brand cheese. One of these posters is introducing the cheesemakers at La, La Cantara, and I'd like to read their stories outlined in the poster. It says, the journey in Australia started in November 2009 when they arrived in Brisbane to study English as a second language. In 2020, uh, 2010, their lives took an unexpected turn due to the political situation back in Venezuela. A protection visa was granted in October 2011. Gennaro and Roslyn have both trained as veterinarians in their home country, and this facilitated the process of finding their first job in country Queensland as farmhands on a beef cattle property. Their passion for dairying started with their next position in northern New South Wales in 2012. After gaining dairying experience over the next few years, they then moved to the beautiful northwest of Tasmania in July 2016. After two years at Arthur, Arthur River Park, they settled in Edith Creek as share farmers. They put a great effort into farming and took pride for what they were able to achieve. In April 2020, they were awarded this prestigious 2020 Fonterra Dairy Fair, uh, Share Farmer of the Year. Over these years, they have been making some Venezuelan-style cheese at home, all considerably basic and without much technical knowledge. They had identified several incredible opportunities in the industry, and one was that they were in the prime dairying area of Tasmania. And what better way to celebrate this than turning that milk into beautiful local cheese? Gennaro enrolled in a formal course at the New Zealand Cheese School, where the Australian cheese maker Neil Willman taught him the fundamentals of cheese making. Later in 2019, they founded La Cantera Cheeses. Its name translates to a stainless steel milk can in Spanish, and it essentially represents their origins and the traditional aspects of the dairy industry. That's what was written on the, on the uh, poster in the thing. We had a look at some displays of cheese. A couple of them were new ones that they were trying. They were rolled in coffee. There was a couple that they'd injected some whisky in, so I'm very keen to try that when it's ready. Um, but they certainly are bringing some entrepreneurial um, types of initiatives into the cheesemaking industry in the small corner of the northwest of Tassie. And I sincerely wish both Gennaro and Roslyn the very best in their exciting new venture. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again at 9.30am tomorrow.